story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent.
What do you say to a man with a bomb? That's close enough. Smoke, honey? No. What are you trying to prove? You know what I want. We're not going to let your brother out of jail. You got till nine o'clock to change your mind. You got 22 minutes. We go, you're going with us, Connie. Don't take much of a brain to figure that. What makes you think you can get away with it? I want my brother out of jail. He's only got a couple of months to go. He'll get out when he serves his time. Yeah, that's where you're wrong, cop. He gets out at nine o'clock this morning. All right. Come on, Connie. Get your hand out of that box. Put the box on the table. You think I'm bluffing, don't you? I'm going to let you get within five feet before I make a liar out of you. Okay, Carney, I guess you mean it. You can take two more steps and find out for sure. Suppose we did let him out. We'd just pick him up again. You along with him. If you could find us. Now, let's get this straight. If we let your brother out, how do we know you'll keep your promise? What promise? I haven't made any promise. You get Elwood over here first, then we'll talk about it. And if we don't let him out, you say you'll pull the trigger on that bomb. What are you going to prove by that? It's 839. You got 21 minutes to go. Now, come on. Give me an answer. Why do you want to kill a lot of innocent people? Don't try to con me. I cleared everybody out of this building 45 minutes ago. They cleaned out the whole block. Don't you think it's about time you sent somebody over to get Elwood? What's to stop us from leaving? Just let you sit there and touch off that thing. Don't try to kid me. You'd let me sit here and blow up $10 million with the taxpayers' money? No. You're going to let Elwood out. You wait till the last minute to do it, but you let him out. I'm still not convinced Connie can back up what he says. Then why didn't you take that box away from him? Yeah. We've located Connie's apartment. There's a detail out there checking it now. Pacelli and Morse. You got any ideas at all? Anything we could try? That's why I called you in. None of us have gotten any further along than you did just now. Well, how about us stopping Connie first? Yeah? I'm not top man on the pistol range, but I could wing him. And he falls and his reflex action pulls the trigger on the bomb? No, the gun's not the answer. There's just one thing I want to know for sure. Yeah, Friday. Will it go off or won't it? We all want to know. Either way, we've got to get that box away from us. Brown Piggy. Yeah. He did? Yeah. No, stay there. I'll call you. Shelly. What'd he say? They found 28 sticks of dynamite in Carney's apartment. We knew now Carney wasn't kidding. We could see into the bomb through the glass window in one end. There was dynamite inside. There was dynamite in Carney's room. We didn't know if he had the nerve to pull the trigger. We couldn't be sure if it'd go off when he did. But with only minutes remaining, nobody wanted to take the chance. From here on in, all of us agreed that Vernon Carney sat in the next room, holding in his two hands a force powerful enough to destroy us all. I looked at my watch. It was 16 and a half minutes to nine. How do we get it away from him? Well, I got an idea. It might work. Let's have it. Well, Carney's sitting in the next office between two windows. Both of them are open. If we could get a man in through one of those windows, we might get Connie from behind. How are you going to get him? Well, whoever gets to the window could slug him. What do you do then? Well, somebody grabs the box. Crime Lab can tell us what to do with it. How do you get a man through the window? We're on the 11th floor. Well, there's some kind of a ledge runs around each story, isn't it? Wide enough for a man to walk on? I don't know. Let's have a look. That's pretty narrow, Joe. It's a good 18 inches. Could be done. No, Joe. Too risky. Strong wind out there, too, George. Tear a man run off the building. Yeah, I guess you're right. There still might be a way. How about a ladder? Eleven floors, Skipper? There might be a way. The fire department will know that. I'll get Battalion Chief Erickson. Is Lee Jones still in the building? No, he's over at the crime lab. I'll get him up here, too. I don't know, Friday. Maybe it'll work. It's got to. All right, now look. 
It's going to take a couple of minutes to set this up. We've got to know what Connie's doing every second. Well, how about the dictograph in there? Adjoining offices should be connected with this one. Good. See if you can get it on without him seeing you. Get the receiver off the hook and leave it off. Right. You know, if it isn't off the hook, we won't be able to hear a thing in here. Right. Come on, then. This is Dad Brown, Police Department. Give me Erickson, Battalion Chief. Where's my brother? Still in his cell. Get with it, cop. You're long on talk and short on time. Get on with over here. Your brother doesn't want any part of this. We get him on the phone, I'll tell you the same thing. I promised, Al. I told him I'd get him out. He didn't think I could do it, but I'm doing it. I'll make you a bet, Carney. We'll get your brother on the phone. He won't walk out of here with you. All right. Get him on the phone. Where are you going? Phone's over there. You have to use the dictograph. You have to have an okay from the chief. I was still present. the phone. No operators. The building's been cleared. You know it. Yeah, I almost forgot. Okay, you can use the dictograph. This Friday, Chief. Carney wants to talk to his brother. Yeah, I know you'll have to send somebody over. What? Just a minute. 5801. Yeah. Right. Take a couple of minutes to set it up. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you. It's been a couple of months since I've seen him. We've always been together, me and Al, most of the time. Let's go and see if we can't hurry that call, huh, Joe? It's a good idea, boy. It's 16 minutes to 9. Hey, cop. Yeah. Forgot to hang up the dictograph, didn't you? I put the receiver back on the dictograph. Ben and I had failed to make good on the first step of the plan. We went back into the office next door. Chief Sam Erickson of the fire department and Lieutenant Lee Jones from the crime lab were already there. We can't run a ladder up from the street. Too high, Chief? Best we've got is a 100-foot aerial. You figure 12 foot to this story, that'll take you up 96 feet, eight floors, and we've got the latest equipment. What's that idea you had, Lee? Sam, can you get hold of the Pompier in a hurry? Sure, we've got a lot of scaling ladders, but you've got nothing up there to hook them on. You figure on dropping down from the floor above, is that right? That's right, and I figure Pompier would do it. Sure, we could make it faster the wind is still up there, but you've got a foot and a half ledge in the way. Now, what you want is a lifeline. Lower a man down on a rope, is that it? Lifeline, yeah. It's quick and it's quiet. Can you rig it so one of my men can do it? Sure. What's the risk? None, if you work it right. We'll strap on a life belt. Two of my men will drop him down. What do you think, Lee? That's it. What do we do with that bomb when we get it, Lee? I figure that box Connie is holding is about a foot square. Now, here's what I'll do. I'll get you a bucket with a foot and a half mouth. It'll be full of water. I'll have it right outside the door to that office. When you get that box, place it in the water, and we'll get the bucket out of the building as fast as we can. Once we get the thing underwater, we're in the clear, huh? I can't promise you that, but it's the safest way to handle it under circumstances. All right, that's it. Sam, you want to take care of your end? Yeah, right away. Lee? I got a detail to give me a hand down on the street. When we get the bomb, we'll take it to a safe area and decommission it. All right, work as fast as you can. No choice. Friday. Can you handle that bomb? I can try. I'll take the rope. All right, that's the routine. And carry this with you, Romero. When you come down on that rope, you got one chance to make good. Slug him and make it count. There's no second try. Right. And Joe, yeah. when you grab that box, you got to get it away from Carney before you can squeeze the trigger and then get it right down to the street. The elevator. Can you operate it? It's pretty simple. I can double check it. Good now. Right. You better get Carney's brother for him on the phone. He seemed anxious. I'll call him. Get going. Right. Dad Brown, emergency. Let me talk to Fitzgerald. I checked with the elevator operator and then he was sent out of the building. Thirteen minutes to nine. The two volunteers from the fire department were standing by on the floor above. Lee Jones and Erickson were on their way up in the freight elevator with the necessary equipment. The phone call from the city jail was ready to be put through. Ben and I went in to tell Carney. You got Elwood with you? 
We told you we'd get him on the phone for you. The call will be through in a minute. A minute's a long time, cop. You only get 12 of them left. Elwood's going to talk you out of this. Oh, sure. Sure, everybody's going to talk me out of this. First was them other two cops, that little porky guy and that other monkey. Then it's you and this Dixie Doe here. Now it's Elwood. Oh, come off it, will you? Get my brother over here. It's your brother, Connie. I'll get it for you. Stay put, you. Just going to get the phone for you. I'll take care of the phone. We'll just disconnect it. You get this straight, you dumb cops. I'm through with your rotten, stinking line. Don't you think I know what you've been doing next door? Now, you listen to me. I want Elwood here, and I want him now. Now, you get him here before I blow you all to pieces. Who threw that phone out in the hall? I did. You want me to go out and pick it up? Connie, that's not going to get you anywhere. You're the big boss around here. Maybe. Are you, aren't you? I answered you. All right, big boy, I've got a piece of advice for you. You take your rookie cops here and you get it through their heads. I mean what I say. I want my brother over here in this room and you've got just nine minutes to get it done. Now you tell them that, will you? All right, Connie. It's your show. We've got to work fast now. Jones, everything set with you? All set. The car's waiting down in the street. Erickson, your men ready? Upstairs, waiting. And we all know what to do. I'll need somebody to give me a hand with Carney when he falls. I'll be in there with you, Friday. One thing you ought to know. What's that? Strong wind outside, about 20 mile an hour right now. That gonna loss us up? No, but it's gonna increase the sway. You gotta allow for it. How do you mean? Wind's coming from the south. We'll lower you just to the right of the window. If I figure it right, the wind will do the rest. Bigger risk? We don't control the weather. Drag it upstairs. Lee, no use you sticking around. I'll give Friday a hand. No, it's my job. Gotta keep you alive and decommission the bomb. Bum Joe. See you downstairs. What's the time? We got eight minutes left. Scared, Friday? Yeah. That makes it even. Come on. Dad Brown and I went back into the room with Vernon Carney. Ben was going to make a try from the window on Carney's right. Somehow we had to try and keep his attention on us and away from that window. If anything went wrong and Carney got out of position, the plan would fail. If Chief Erickson didn't estimate the force of the wind correctly, the plan would fail. I looked at my watch. It was eight minutes to nine. Anything we can say to make you change your mind, Connie? I've asked you a hundred times, now I'm ordering you. You're gonna get to a phone and have somebody send out word over here right now. I'm through waiting, now move. You ripped out the phone, Connie. Well then find another one. I told you I'm sick of your two-bit stalling. We have until nine o'clock to make up our mind about this. You had until nine, but you didn't do what I told you. Now I'm cutting you short. You got just one minute to get a phone in this room or I can hear you call the jail and have him send Elwood over here. You said nine, Connie. All right, Joe. I'll give him what he wants. Bring in the phone from the next room. Your brother's a prisoner. He's in custody. We can't place his life in jeopardy. You leave that up to L. We'll have to take it over here. Court won't reach. Sad Brown Egan. We want Elwood Carney over here at the city hall, room 1104. His brother wants to see him. If he wants to come, get him over here. Leave it up to him. Yeah, you can use the first elevator. And tell him to hurry. Yeah. Tell him to hurry. That's the only smart thing you've done all day. Now, why don't you go next door and try to figure out another angle? We'll wait for your brother, too. That's right. We're all going to sit here and wait for Elwood. If you don't show, you're going to see me pull the plug. Now sit down. Right where you are, sit.
to shut the windows. I don't want to catch me cold. I can turn up the heat. Which they put you. What's that? What's going on? Nothing, Connie. Just the wind. Shut up, you. There's someone out there. I can see your feet. Stupid cops. Pull him up. Get him out of there. That was a pull up. You bet I did. You didn't think I'd miss a trick like that, did you? Now that one's locked, now we'll get the other one. Is your brother, Carney? Yeah. Hi, Al. You're crazy, Vern, you're crazy. There's a million cops outside. People all over town heard about this. They're holding back the crowd. You'll never make it, either one of you. I got him this far, didn't I? We'll make it. Vern, you think we could do it? You. you. Get a car for us ready down in front of the building, a fast one. Move. Do what he tells you, Joe. You're not fooling, are you, Vern? Will that thing really blow? Four miles high. I'll never let you pull it. We're getting out. What happened? You spot me? Yeah, it's got to go fast now. We had to bring Carney's brother over from the jail. Are we still on time, Lemon? We got four minutes left. How about the ledge? You think you can do it? Try. Here's your gun. Oh, yeah. And the sap. Yeah. Got it. How are you going to do it? I'll try to catch him just above the right arm at the base of the neck. That should paralyze his right arm, give you a chance to get that box away from him. We use the same plan? Right. Oh, Ben, wait a minute. Yeah? The window on his right, he locked it. You'll have to crawl around and get in through the one on his left. You got it? Yeah, I got you. All right.
February 15th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was examined by five different psychiatrists appointed by the Superior Court and found to be mentally incompetent. Elwood Carney served the balance of his sentence with no time off for good behavior. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. It's a big one. Homes, buildings, churches, jails, the suburbs, the downtown. There's more of it. Orchards and movie studios. The old and the new. A million cars, two million people. Most of them work for a living, some of them steal. When they do, my job gets tougher. I'm a cop. It was Monday, October 23rd. We were working the day watch out of narcotics detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Kearney. My name's Friday. It happened in the early morning. The pharmacy, All Saints Hospital, was robbed of its entire store of narcotics, $10,000 worth. In a matter of hours, the thief could spread his haul of dope from one end of the city to the other. We didn't know who he was, we didn't know where he was, but we had to get him. Yes? Police officer, sister. We'd like to see Sister Mary Benedict. I'm she. Mother Superior sent us down to see you, sister. We're investigating the narcotics robbery. Oh, yes. There have been quite a few policemen here in the past hour. I believe it was the fingerprint men who just left. Just a minute, I have their card. Yes, Layton Fingerprints Division. Still all in the boys from Layton Print? Yes, that's right. Sergeant Harlan Stahl. Well, sister, we're the investigating officers assigned to the case. This is Sergeant Romero, and my name's Friday. Are you a lieutenant? No, I'm a sergeant. Now, I wonder if you could start right from the beginning and tell us what you know about the narcotics burglary. Well, after mass, I went to breakfast, and then I came downstairs to open up the pharmacy. You keep the pharmacy locked overnight? Yes, always. We always assign an intern on night duty. He has a key in case there are any medicines needed during the night. He's authorized to issue what may be needed upon the doctor's request. Uh, who else has a key to the pharmacy, sister? There are just three keys. Mother Superior has one on her desk. We have one for the intern on duty. And uh, I have one here on my chain. I see. Would you like to go on, please? When I got down here this morning and started to unlock the door, I found it ajar. There were no lights on. I snapped on that wall switch. That one there. That's when I saw Mr. Lyons. That's the intern? Yes. He was unconscious on the floor. I could see that his head had been cut. He was bleeding profusely. Well, what'd you do then? I called Mother Superior. She came right down. Dr. Spencer was summoned. He came in and started administering aid to Mr. Lyons here on the floor. That's when you first found out the narcotics were missing? No, not just at the moment. Both Mother Superior and myself were quite worried about Mr. Lyons' condition. It was really Mother Superior who first noticed that the narcotics safe had been tampered with. Would you like to go on, please? Upon checking the safe, we found that our entire store of narcotics had been taken. Everything. That's the narcotics safe over here, is it? Yes, that's it. Don't touch that, Mr. Friday. No? No, never. Nothing is to be touched until the police have completed their investigation. Clues. Well, we're the police, sister. Do you have all the clues you need? Well, I wouldn't know, but the men from Layton Fingerprints have dusted everything here, so it's perfectly all right to touch things now. That would be Mr. Holland Stall and Miss Men? Yes, that's right. I didn't know. Well, he understands you have the inventory list. Yes, I have it right here on my desk. We keep a running inventory, so that's the exact amount of what is missing. Yes, ma'am. Cocaine and morphine. No bird's eye, Joe. Big haul, huh? Looks like about 10,000 worth. 
We'd like to have a copy of this inventory, sister. Would you take the carbon, please? I'd like to keep the original for my monthly files. Sure. Thank you. Outside of this intern line, there's nobody else saw who it was. No, Mother Superior and I interrogated everyone. We made a thorough investigation on our own. I took notes. Is that so? Yes, that's the way Father Brown does it. Father Brown? Yes, he's an expert detective. Brown? You wouldn't mean Thad Brown? No, Father Brown. Father Brown? I didn't know you had your own detective. Oh, he's not a regular detective. He's more like Mother Superior and myself. Is that right? Yes, he's in England. Solves some very difficult cases. Wait, I'll show you. You see, here it is. Fine Water and Song. Another exciting Father Brown mystery by G.K. Chesterton. Oh, uh, mm-hmm. I have all but one of the Father Brown stories. Mother Superior has it. I get it after she finishes it. What's the condition of the intern, sister, have you heard? He's resting comfortably. Dr. Spencer said he'd be all right. Had to have nine stitches taken in his scalp. Mm, we'd like to talk to him as soon as we can. I'm sure that'll be all right. I don't need to tell you that we all think this is a terrible thing. Yes, sister, it is. All those narcotics, whoever took them will distribute them, won't they? Well, that's our guess, sister. The stuff will be sold to addicts. What makes a dope addict? How did they get started? Why did they do it? I don't know, sister. They give you a lot of reasons. None of them good. None of them good. And for a few moments of what? Tonight they have it, and tomorrow nothing. It's about the size of it, sister. The stars are setting, and the caravan starts for the dawn of nothing. The Bible. No, Omar Khayyam. We went upstairs and talked with intern James Lyons. Since he was attacked from behind, he didn't see the man who slugged him. He could tell us nothing. The entire hospital staff was screened thoroughly. They could add nothing to what we already knew. Somewhere in the city of Los Angeles was the answer. As in all narcotics cases, speed is the prime factor. Whoever held those narcotics wouldn't waste any time diluting or cutting it and making it ready for quick sale. Our job was to stop them. 7.05 a.m., we checked in with Sergeant Stahl at Leighton Prince. The safe was clean, not a print on it. Not a foreign print anywhere in the room. Couldn't be cleaner. Yeah. You didn't get anything on your end, huh? No, nothing. Gentlemen. Captain. They picked one up. Who is he? Junker by the name of Fabe Kellogg. He's really seeing Steve, but he's coming out of it. What's the story on him? Wallace and Hunt picked him up downtown L.A. Thought at first he was a 390, but they couldn't raise him. Where have they got him now? Squadron. Let's go talk to him. Check your letters, Paul. Where'd they pick him up, excuse me? Sitting in a parked car fourth and Broadway. Wallers figured he must be geared up, so they rolled up his sleeve to look for spike marks. They found him. Anything on him? For two vials of Ammon's seat beside him. Prescription stuff. Hey, have you got that list of serial numbers from the hospital? Right here. Good. Fine, come on. All right, Ted. Wallers, yeah, up. Here's the list of serial numbers on that hospital heist. Do you want to check it against the vials you found in this car? Yeah, I got them right over here. Okay, come on. How you feeling, babe? All right. This is Friday in Romero Narcotics Division. I see him. You want to tell us about it? Nothing to tell. Living kind of high, aren't you? No more than usual. That's not the way I get it. You're scoring good prescription stuff. Birthday present from a friend. Who is it? I want to keep his friendship. Who's your connection, babe? I don't know. You know that morphine we picked out of your car is hot? Isn't all of it? The hospital pharmacy was knocked over this morning. If the numbers on those vials of yours match up, you're in a real jam. No numbers on them. You might as well tell us where you got it. It isn't going to be a long wait, Kellogg. As soon as we get a check on those serial numbers, you can play hero all afternoon. That'll be on the 12th floor of the county jail, babe. You won't have to stay there long either. The minute you put one foot in that courtroom, the judge will throw everything he's got at you. For two bottles of drugstore stuff? Burglary, Kellogg, $10,000. This is good, but two bottles ain't worth that much. You feel pretty good now, but you'll get a yen on. You won't help me. You never do. When's the last time you helped us? I helped you guys a lot. Don't you remember the Frank Smith plan? No. You're kidding. Isn't it St. Louis? Seeing Steve. Yeah. Don't kid me along. This is Kansas City. Or is it St. Louis? You're in Los Angeles, babe. Los Angeles, California. 
Don't kid me along. Marty Clenard wouldn't do that to me. Who's Clenard? 11th and Baltimore. Hangs out down near the Continental Hotel. That's in Kansas City. Marty Clenard, tough cop, gave me a floater out of town. That's why I came here to St. Louis. You're in Los Angeles, babe. Got it? Los Angeles. Now, I know you told me. See you in a minute, Captain. Yeah. Joe. Stay with him, Romero. Right. Well, that's it. Checks out, huh? Yeah, someone cut through the serial number stamps on him, but you can still make them out. Two vials of morphine we found in Kellogg's car from the hospital pharmacy. Yeah, thanks. Let's try it again, Joe. All right. All right, now, babe, cut out the jokes. Those two vials you had came from the hospital numbers checkout. No numbers on those vials. How do you know? You probably never even looked at them. Oh, yeah, I looked. No numbers on them. We found them all right. I don't see how you could read them. I couldn't. Why not? Somebody scratched them off. Who, oh, babe? You wouldn't know. Try us. How much heat do I have to stand if I take it alone? Plenty. There was an intern slugged on that job. Hurt pretty bad. He's going to tag you for assault, too. Once more, what's the count? Goes like this, babe. First degree burglary, five years to life. Assault with a deadly weapon, one to ten. Violation of a state narcotics act, up to six years. Now you can add, they'll lose you up there. You can get a real yen on by that time. There's no buzzing up at Q. I can't go that route. Where'd you get the stuff? I'd rather be a Fagan and spend 50 years at the joint. All right, you convinced us. Where'd you get it? Anybody turned Fagan before they spend 50 years at Q? No, I can't go that route. Where'd you get it, babe? Some joy popper. Who? I gave him 500 bucks. Clean me. Who? Caught me passing himself off as a croaker. I could spot a guy been hitting speed balls a mile away. He was no croaker. What was his name? He was scoring good somewhere. All that Cecil and Mary. Now I know where he got it. What was his name, babe? He's a bit player in pictures. Learned Castle. Where is he? Yuma, Arizona, on location. How could he be on location when you bought that stuff from him this morning? He hopped a plane this morning. He was on his way. Runner Castle. Picture actor, that right? You got it. All right, run it down. 9.14 a.m. We checked the name Leonard Castle through R&I. He had no previous criminal record. We checked the phone book for local casting. Dunbar, 38211. Hello, this is Sergeant Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. We're checking on a man by the name of Leonard Castle. Is he registered with you? Yes, ma'am. Leonard Castle. Uh-huh, thank you. Checking it now. Uh-huh. Is he working now, do you know? I see. Uh, just a minute, please. What was that again? 1626, all right. Thank you very much. Get an address? Yeah. He's there now. Local casting gave us the information that Leonard Castle was currently working on a picture at Sound Stages Incorporated. They also gave us his home address. Sergeants Long and Hunt from Narcotics went on immediate stakeout at Castle's home. Ben and I drove out to the studio and checked in at the main gate. It was 9.28 a.m. We showed them our identification. We were issued a pass to Sound Stage 4. There's Stage 1. Stage 4 should be right down there. Yeah. It's a good sized lot. Sure is. I think Kellogg knew what he's talking about. I don't know. We'll know in a couple of minutes. Unusual a joy popper pulling a job like this. Well, they all got to start somewhere. Yeah, sure. Good way to get around the movie lot. Yeah. Stage four. Yeah. You better hold it up a minute. They're shooting. Oh, yeah. Kind of cold, isn't it? Yeah, my wife told me I should wear a top coat today. I wouldn't believe it. Oh, there you are. I don't care. Come on, yeah.
say, fella. Yeah? Could you tell us where we could find Leonard Castle? Sure. Hey, Dan, call Len Castle. Will you? These fellas want to see him. Okay. Leonard Castle. Leonard Castle. He'll be here in a minute. Thank you. Call me, Dan. Yes, the gentleman want to see you. Oh, thanks. You want to see me? Yeah, is your name Leonard Castle? That's all right. Police officers? Or someplace yeah. where we could talk? Well, is this all right? I got to stick close. It might be in the next shot. Do you know a fellow by the name of Babe Kellogg? No. He says he knows you. No, I never heard of him. You sure? Put us on a bell clip. All right, hold the work. Simmer down, everybody. Quiet. Real fast. Oh, we'll have to hold it a minute. They're lining up a shot. Whoa, whoa, that's got it. Baxter, go with this junior off over here. Okay, Let me have a nicky dink right here. Carry my left, will you, Steve? Say, uh, Harry. Yeah? And Mr. Mulhall, cross us over to the table. You can help me out a bit. Will you uh, bring this one down about two points on the dimmer? It's done. Don, you got it? Got it. Right. All ready, Henry. All right, let's try it. Bob, watch that mic shadow. We're here to get on the wall. Am I out now? That's fine. We're clear. Okay, Henry. Let's make one. Turn them over. We're rolling. Scene, Scene 33, take 10. Action. Hello? All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right in. Look what I found, Lieutenant. A piece of glass from that broken window, eh? That's right, and it's plastered with fingerprints. Yeah, we got our man. Stop. All right, boy, let's watch this door up here on the barn door, will you please? You never heard of Babe Kellogg, huh? That's right. Where were you at 5.30 this morning, Castle? In bed. We've got men out at your place checking. What's it all about? Somebody robbed the pharmacy at All Saints Hospital this morning, slugged the intern, and made off with over $10,000 worth of high-grade narcotics. We find out you were in bed at 5.30, you're clear. Yeah, well, I was. Anybody to back up that alibi? Landlady, I guess she'd know. What time she generally get up? I don't know. Why? Well, she couldn't very well back you up. She was still asleep. She's usually up early. But you said you didn't know what time she gets up. Well, I'm mad I don't usually know. But you knew this morning. No. And you don't know Babe Kellogg. All right, let's simmer down, everybody. Let's keep it quiet. Yeah. Quiet. Yours. Okay. What do you read on that, Junior, Harry? A little less than 100. Make it a little hotter. Make it a little hotter, Jack. Whoa, that's it. Turn them over. We're rolling. See? Scene 33, take 11. Action. Hello? All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right in. That's what I found, Lieutenant. Broken window, eh? That's right. And it's plastered with prints. Yeah, we got our man. Cut. Henry. He's a tough director, but he's a good one. Want a cigarette? Thank you. How long have you been doing this kind of work, Castle? Oh, six, seven years. What pictures you been in? I don't think you'd have noticed. Mostly small parts. What kind of parts you got in this picture? I play a cop. What would you like to do? What in this picture? No, I mean, what's your ambition? You gonna stay in pictures? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to get a few bigger parts if I could. Pretty tough to try to sell yourself to a producer if he can't see you on film. Mm -hmm. Money's pretty good, though, isn't it? Depends. Different deal in each picture you do. You have an agent? No. I did have, but he wasn't doing anything for me. I let him go. I'm not represented now. Pretty hard to build any kind of a name without an agent, isn't it? Depends. You can keep up a good front, nice car. It's all that counts in this town. You really believe that, do you? Don't you? I don't know much about it. I'm not an actor. You said you didn't know Babe Kellogg at all, didn't you? I don't know him. You said you saw your landlady at 5.30 this morning. No, I didn't say that. Do you have a car? No, I don't. But you told us you had a car. No, I didn't tell you that, did I? Well, you said something about keeping up a good front, nice car. Isn't that what you said? Oh. Sure, I have a car. I don't know what I was thinking about. I have a car. Uh -huh. I thought you said you had a car. 
Well, this picture I can drive you crazy. I don't want him saying half the time. And maybe you made a mistake about Babe Kellogg. Do you know him? No, I'm sure about that. I don't know any Babe Carson. Kellogg. Kellogg, yeah, well, I don't know him. Do you mind showing us your wallet? I'm for you. want to see my identification? Can we see the wallet, please? All right. All right, hold it down. Right. Quiet. No, you hold it. Open it up. Turn him over. Speed. Scene 33, take 12. Action. Hello? All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right in. Look what I found, Lieutenant. Piece of broken window, huh? That's right, and it's plastered with fingerprints. Yeah, we got our man. Cut. All right, let's see how much money you got in your wallet, Castle. No, you hold it. Just count it for us. There it is. How about the rest of it? Oh. Yeah, I didn't see it. Count it. It's just a couple hundred. Count it. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, well, I can see four fifties right there on top. That's 200, isn't it? Didn't know I had this much. Two more tens and a five. It's five hundred and twenty-five dollars, Cass. Yeah. You're doing pretty well on this picture, aren't you? It's not all picture money. All right. You can put your wallet away. Yeah, thanks. If you didn't make the money on the picture, where'd you get it? I played a little cards last night. You played pretty late? Yeah, pretty late. Well, weren't you tired this morning? No. Not even when you got up at 5.30? Did I say I got up at 5.30? Now, you listen, Castle. You don't know what you said, but one thing's sure, you're lying to us. You know Babe Kellogg? You know him well enough to sell him two vials of high-grade morphine. You're wrong about that. All right, then. You set us straight. Kellogg says he paid you $500 for the stuff. You got over $500 in your wallet. That's more than you need for lunch money. Now, it could be a coincidence. You set us straight. You're wrong. Where'd you get that money? Turn him! Turn him! We're rolling. Speed. Scene 33, take 13. Action. Hello? All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right in. Look what I found, Lieutenant. Broken window, eh? That's right. It's plastered with fingerprints. Yeah, we got our man. Cut. Where'd you get the money, Castle? I told you, I played cards. It won't do. You got the keys to your car? I can't leave. We'll get you excused. We want to look at your car. I don't do that. All right, then. Do you know Babe Kellogg? I don't know. Turn him! The rolling. Speed. Scene 33, take 14. Action. Hello? All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right in. Look what I found, Lieutenant. Piece of broken window, eh? That's right. And it's plastered with fingerprints. Yeah, we got our man. Cut. Print the last one only. Hold it for a lily. Do you know Babe Kellogg? Do you know him? Yeah. I know him. You robbed that hospital this morning, didn't you? I needed it. I needed the money I had to have, but I owed money. I was going to take my car. I was broke. What else could I do? I was sick once. I stayed at All Saints. I knew where they kept their drugs, and I knew if I could get them, I could make some fast money. I didn't mean to hit the kid. I couldn't let him see me. He didn't have to be there, did he? He didn't have to be there. I sold old Bay that stuff. The rest of it is in the car, under the seat. I needed the money. I was broke. I was broke. You want to take him, Ben? I'll check him out with the company. Come on, Castle. That was a fine reading. I'm directing this picture. Are you the boy's agent? No, sir. Never heard him read better. Funny thing, though. Yeah? In front of the camera, he goes to the dogs. On 
January 28th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 91, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Suspect was tried and convicted of first-degree burglary, one count, and violation of the State Narcotics Act, one count. Alfred Babe Kellogg was convicted of violation of the State Narcotics Act, one count. He is now serving his term in the state penitentiary. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Every 24 hours, a little bit of everything happens. Two million people make a lot of history in one day. They write it all down and file it away. Some of it's important, some of it isn't. Business, industry, government, you buy a three cent stamp or an oil well. They keep records on all of it. Progress, money, success, and failure. Complete history of every day. Some of it's public, some of it's personal. It's all written down. In my job, we catalog trouble. I'm a cop. It was Wednesday, October 6th. It was sultry in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 10.45 a.m. when we got to the Ortega Hotel. A 30-year-old man had disappeared suddenly. We'd uncovered evidence of foul play. The list of suspects was narrowed down to one man, the last person to see the victim alive. We traced the suspect for months. The break finally came. We found him. Taking his time, isn't it? Yeah, you want to try it again? Yeah, all right. Police officers, your name Henry Ross? Perfuto. Get it, Ed. Watch it, Ed. And behind your back, both of them. Son of a What is this, you guys really cops? No fooling are you, cops. I thought you were faking. I showed you my card at the door. Yeah, I thought you were faking. That's the truth. There's a couple of guys out to muss me up, and I thought you were them. Your name Henry Ross? Sure, that's right. No, I thought you were one of those moochers I had a fight with in the bar the other night. He said he was going to get a pal and come back and take care of me. Yeah? Well, sure, I got no reason to fight cops. Didn't do my room any good. The landlady's going to scream. All right, you want to finish up dressing? I want to talk to you downtown. What's it about, officer? Missing person. We'll brief you when we get downtown. All right with me. Would you take these cuffs off, please? Kind of hard to dress with them. All right. Bend over. I don't know why you have to slap cuffs on me. I didn't know you were cops. Mind if we check through your things, Ross? Huh? Why? You mind? Well, go ahead if you want. I got nothing to hide. If you spoke up at the door, there wouldn't have been this fight. I thought you were that mooch in the bar and his friend. Thought you were looking for trouble. All right, mister, you about ready to go? Oh, I'd like to brush my teeth first, if you don't mind. Got a mouth full of cotton this morning. Where do you keep your toothbrush? Well, over here, I'll get it. Never mind. All right. You should turn on the water tap? You can make out. Nothing, Joe. Pretty clean. Of course I'm clean. How about some toothpaste? What'd you expect? Anybody can make a mistake. I didn't know you were cops. Henry Ellsworth Ross. That's your full name? Hmm? Yeah, that's right. Well, hardly ever used the Ellsworth. <laughs> Lousy name, huh? Well, what's the picture of all this, officer? We told you. Missing person. We'd like to talk to you about it. I don't think I can help you. Nobody I know is missing. How about Paul Davis? Davis? Yeah, I knew it, Davis. 
Don't know if his name was Paul, though. Have been gone a long time, this guy, Davis? Yeah, that's right. Was something wrong, you think? Yeah, we figure murder. After going over his room thoroughly, we took Henry Ellsworth Ross back to the city hall to the interrogation room. He was a longshoreman by trade. Among his friends and acquaintances, he was known as a heavy drinker and a man with a violent temper. Ed and I questioned him for half an hour. We got nowhere. I'll tell you the truth, I just don't know what you're getting at. I think I knew a guy named Davis, and that's about as far as it goes. You sure that's all you have to tell us? Of course I'm sure. Well, look, I got a right to a lawyer if you're gonna stand there and throw a lot of charges at me. We're not throwing charges at you, Henry. We got a missing persons case. I'd like to have you cooperate. That's about it. Well, yeah, I'd like to, but I can't. Paul Davis. Just a name to me. <laughs> Maybe I know him. I don't know. You got that report there, Ed? Yeah. That's it. Thank you. According to his wife, Paul Davis left Los Angeles by auto a little over four months ago. He was driving up to Oakdale, California to take a job with the dairy company. He never got there. He's been missing ever since. And what's the pitch? Well, all we've been able to find is Davis's car. 36 Ford Coupe. 7 Tom 7972. Was sold a month ago up in Lodi, California, but Davis didn't sell it. A man by the name of Carter signed the pink slip at the time of sale. Henry Carter. Sorry, it doesn't mean anything to me. Well, this Carter made it look like Paul Davis had signed the Ford over to him. We checked it out. Davis' signature was forged. And that's so. It's supposed to have something to do with me? Did you ever use the name Henry Carter? Of course not. Ross, that's the only name I go by. You never had your name changed? No. You never used an alias? I told you no. I wonder if you'd mind taking a look at this here. Well, what's it got to do with me? That's the pink slip to Paul Davis' car, Henry. Now, these signatures on the back, transfer of ownership, you recognize either one of them? Paul Davis and Henry H. Carter. Well, just names to me. Well, am I supposed to recognize something? Should, yeah. Why? The signatures, they're both in your handwriting. How about it, Henry? How about what? I don't know what you're talking about. You're trying to give me the treatment? What's it all about? We're trying to locate Paul Davis. I'm not even sure I know the guy. Now, look, I think you better level, Henry. Our handwriting man checked both the signatures. It's your writing. Well, maybe better get a new handwriting man. I never saw that slip. I never wrote those signatures. Anybody can copy handwriting. I got something else for you here. I'd like to have you check it over, Ross, see if you can identify it. Well, what is it? It's a letter. Take a look at it. Mean anything to you? <laughs> no, nothing. Hope you're not going to tell me that's my handwriting. That's what the report says. Uh, that's crazy. I never wrote like that in my life. All the writing characteristics match up, same as the signatures on the pink slip. All right, maybe they are the same. I didn't write one, though. I never wrote like that in my life. Okay, I'll show you. No, that's all right, Henry. Ed, you want to pull the package from R&I? Yeah, okay. Well, I don't sabby one bit of this, Sergeant, to uh, lay it out for me, huh? You can see the name there at the bottom of the letter, not signed Henry Carter, same as the pink slip. That doesn't mean anything to me. That letter was sent to the wife of Paul Davis about nine weeks ago. That says there that Davis supposedly was too busy to write his wife. So he had this Henry Carter send a letter. He also writes that Davis sold his car to Carter. Somebody trying to cover up, huh? Yeah, we think so. We think it's Henry Carter. This guy Davis been gone four months? That's right. You said you thought Davis was murdered. How come? Just an idea. Eight men have disappeared from around here in the last 14 months, just like Davis. Six more up in the San Joaquin Valley, same way. They took off alone on auto trips. Never seen again, not a trace of them. There you go, Joe. Yeah, thanks. We've got your record here, Henry, from Baton Rouge. We sent to Sheriff Clemens for it. Well, after we have to drag all that out again, it's past. No, just one thing we had to check out, Henry. Now, you told us that you never used an alias, is that right? Well, all right, I have. Well, I didn't know what you were getting at. I didn't think it was any use in dragging out dirty laundry again. I asked you if you ever used the name Henry Carter. Yeah, okay, so I used him. It. It's a common name. A lot of Henry Carters are out. We only know one who fits your description. Well, I'm clean, you know that. Smoke, Henry? No. Joe? Thanks. Yeah, let me have one, huh? Sure.
Henry, we rode this thing for four months all over the state, and I'll tell you what we got. We'll let you make up your own mind. It's not my writing. On June 4th, Paul Davis left Los Angeles in his car, headed up for Oakdale. Late in the afternoon, he stopped for gas at a service station just beyond San Fernando. The attendant says a man was with Davis. You fit that man's description, Henry. Yeah? I've seen monks like that in court. They get on the stand, I can't even remember their name. A couple others. You and Davis stopped for a hamburger just outside of Gorman. There's a man there, he remembers you too. You stopped again in Bakersfield, picked up a quart of oil for the car. You and Davis had a Coke. That's the last time he was seen alive. That makes me a killer, huh? A month after that, the pink slip of Davis's car came through DMV up in Sacramento. That was for the transfer of ownership from Davis to Henry Carter, both in your handwriting. A couple of weeks later, Mrs. Davis got that letter. A month ago, Davis's car was sold to a dealer up in Lodi. Huh? We found a dealer, Ross, showed him your mug shot. He says you sold him the car. That all? No, that's just the main part. There's more. We've been on the road a lot. We followed you from here to Sacramento and back, Henry. Every stop, every detour. Took us a long time. Yeah, I guess it did. What do you say, Ross? Nothing. All right. Any way you want it, Henry. Yeah, I guess you worked hard on it, huh? All over the state. That's right. Must be pretty hot up in the valley. Summertime. Dusty, huh? We made out. But I've never been up in the valley in summer. Too hot for me. We got people who saw you up there. Yeah, what's it prove? Ten people, some handwriting samples. You can't build a case on that. You know that, don't you? We're gonna try. You think I murdered Davis? You, Sergeant? Yeah. You think I murdered those other guys, too, huh? Oh, what was it, 10 or 12 of them? We're asking about Davis. You think I killed him? Well, tell me the truth, do you? You think I murdered Davis? Yeah, I think you did, Henry. Uh-huh. And you know as well as I do, there's only one way to prove it. Yeah. Find his body. <laughs> 1.15 p.m. Ed and I took Henry Ross out and fed him some lunch. Then we took him back to the city hall to the interrogation room where we continued to question him. He was relaxed and he talked a great deal about everything but the disappearance of Paul Davis. He didn't seem anxious to get away. He made no demands for an attorney to represent him. He told us about different homicide cases that he'd read up on. He asked us about the 12 men who disappeared in the past months in the same manner Paul Davis had. Was there any trace of them at all? Did we have any leads? We finally got around to asking him if he'd submit to a lie detector test. He seemed taken by the idea and agreed to it almost immediately. We made up a list of key questions. Ed called Sergeant Berger and made arrangements for the test. At 5 p.m., we took the suspect to the third floor of the old city jail where Sergeant Berger gave him the polygraph test. When it was over, we brought him back to the interrogation room. The questioning continued. Ross kept talking. We let him talk. 8 p.m., he was still going strong. You remember the Wilson case back in 34, don't you, Sergeant? Woman killed her whole family. Big case. You remember it? Yeah. Pretty tragic. Not a hobby of yours, Henry, collecting murder stories? No, I just read them. I remember them. Guess I can remember every murder case in the past 15 years. I so. Well, sure, just about all of them. I guess it's kind of a hobby. I get a big kick out of it. Joe, see you, man? Yeah. Burger opened the polygraph room just called. What'd he say? They found 16 positive reactions on Ross. Thanks, Bates. Right. You know, there's one thing I get a real kick out of. These detective magazines, mystery stories, you know, the way they make out the murderer. How do you mean? Well, you know, they always build it into something big. Somebody's always killing somebody else for a million dollars or, or maybe over some woman. Some beautiful woman. Same with the movies. That's where they get it all mixed up. I don't think I follow you, Henry. Sure you do. Every time some guy writes a murder story, he's got to build up a big reason for the killing. Well, it generally works out that way, doesn't it? Why? I'll bet there's a thousand murder cases in your files without a reason. Some people kill, that's all. I've heard about lots of them. Sure, they just want to kill them, they go ahead and do it. Maybe for a few bucks, maybe for nothing. They just do it, that's all. That's all. Well, sure. You know that. Like this thing you've been talking about. 
10, 12 guys disappear. They got a few bucks, maybe they got nothing. Somebody plows them under, that's all. No big reason, they just do it. So 12 guys are gone. Doesn't mean anything. Is that how you figured it, Henry? Huh? Phone call a minute ago. That was from the man who gave you the lie detector test. Oh, that right? How'd it go? Well, he just finished going over your graph. He got 16 positive reactions. Yeah? What would that mean? You lied, Henry. 16 times. Is that right? Yeah, but I told him to get a new machine. I lied all the way through. You mind telling us why? No, I don't mind. I guess I knew you'd find out. Well, let's go out and get something to eat first, huh? Hungry. We better talk a little more, Henry. Now, well, let's go. I'll tell you while we're eating. Bring a pencil and I'll draw you a map. A map of what? The canyon. Where I buried him. I took Henry Ross out to get him something to eat. At his request, we went to Helga's health shop. It was almost closing time. Ross got himself a salad, molasses bread, yogurt, a vegetable burger, and some grape juice. Ed and I settled for a Swiss cheese sandwich and some grape juice. Vegetable burger and beets, huh? Sure smells great. Yeah, I can't take those beets too well. They repeat on me. Not me. I can eat anything. Salt and pepper? Yeah, thanks. You know, I haven't eaten much today. Did you get your sandwich made with molasses bread? No, wheat germ bread. Oh, you should have got molasses bread. Real black strap molasses. Hmm. Smell it. Nice and fresh, huh? Oh, you know this yogurt? Really sharpens up my appetite. Food tastes great, huh? Want some saccharin, Joe? Yeah, thanks. We brought a pencil along, Ross. Want us to start making notes? Good time as any, I guess. You know, the whole thing comes right back to what I was trying to tell you there in the office. Yeah, what's that? What do you know about the phony mystery stories? And every time there's trouble, there's a big reason behind it. <laughs> phony, that's all. Yeah? Sure. This Paul Davis, for instance. Well, I guess I knew you'd find out. I knew this morning when you picked me up, I knew you had to figure. Must have been a big job, huh? Finding me. Pretty big, Henry, yeah. A lot of mileage. How'd it happen? Well, there again, it's just what I was saying. There's no reason behind it. I needed a few bucks and this Davis came along. I guess he was up. So you want to pass me a song? Mm hmm. There you are. Where'd you meet Davis, Henry? Well, I was hitchhiking out in Ventura. Not a dime in my jeans. I was going up to Maricopa. Thought I had a job up there. Well, this Davis came along and picked me up. You ever known him before that? No, stranger. Said he's going to Oakdale and be glad to give me a ride. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I think we stopped for gas up around San Fernando and I saw that he had a few bucks in his wallet. I guess that's when I got the idea. About what? I'm feeling him. Maybe that gives you an idea what I was talking about. You don't need any big reason to kill somebody. Davis had 18 bucks. Suppose I told that to a writer, somebody killing that guy for 18 bucks. Wouldn't make much sense, huh? He'd tell you to never sell. You need a million dollars. Beautiful woman. Good motive. Where'd you kill him, Henry? Well, outside of Bakersfield. Little canyon there. Then picked up a fifth of sherry in Bakersfield, and I got Davis to drink some on the way. Say, would you pass us all again? Yeah. Here you are. Well, lettuce is no good without a lot of salt. How'd you kill Davis, Henry? Funny thing. He drank some of the wine and got a little sleepy. That was just outside of Bakersfield and it was dark by that time. I spotted this little canyon and I figured it was as good a place as any. Yeah? Well, I got him to pull off the road and we had a few more drinks and I spotted this little shack out there, out in the middle of nowhere. Exactly where was this, Henry? Well, I can show you. Maybe uh, two miles north of Bakersfield. We got to the shack and finished the wine, and then we went to sleep. Both of you? Mm-hmm. That's where the funny part comes in. Well, I guess I killed Davis all right, but I, I didn't mean it. Oh, get a whiff of that, will you? I think those monks would figure out some other time to clean up except when people are eating. They'll be through in a minute. 
How do you mean, Henry, you didn't mean to kill him? You already told us you had the idea. Sure, I had the idea. Well, let me explain it, then. Well, we both went to sleep in this shack, Davis and me. I guess that must have been about 9 o'clock that night. I just don't know what it was. Maybe the wine, I guess, and I started having nightmares. Huh? Yeah. I mean, this part sounds like a story, but it's the truth. I had all these dreams. I woke up, but they were still there. What's that? Only faces. That's all I could see. The air was full of faces. I guess I was really still asleep. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I picked up a two before and started swinging at them. Faces. Funny thing. I knew every one of those faces. How do you mean? People I killed. There's only a dozen of them, really, but it seemed like there were hundreds of them. All around in the air. Grabbed a two before and started swinging. And I was cold and I was sweating at the same time. I kept swinging. And I saw Davis. Swung hard. Kept swinging. He didn't even make a sound. Eyes closed. He kept swinging at his head. When I came to, there he was, lying on the floor. He seemed to take those other faces away. They didn't bother me after I killed Davis. What'd you do with him, Henry? Oh, I pulled him outside the shack, dug a hole and buried him. Burned his clothes, took his car and money and drove off. I'll show you if you like where I buried him, I mean. How about those other men, Ross? These faces you saw. Yeah, I wonder if I can get some more of that juice. Sure looks good. Oh, sure. Here, take mine. I haven't touched it. What about it, Ross, the other men? Well, I don't recall them too well. It's what you said in the office. Ten or twelve of them. A couple in Sacramento and the others down through the valley. Like I say, no big reason for killing any of them. Just happened that way, that's all. What'd you do with them, you remember? In general, yeah. There's one of them, though, that stands out. A guy by the name of Slattery. Some kind of salesman. A real crybaby. Where'd this happen? Only well, picked me up in his car outside of Chowchilla. It was nighttime and he was feeling pretty good. I made him stop on the side road and hit him with a piece of angle iron. Cried like a baby. Buried him in the field. He was one of those faces I saw. Shows you how psychology works, huh? Yeah. What'd you do with his car? Slattery's, I mean. I drove it down to Mexico and sold it there. Guess that's what I should have done with Davis's car, huh? Those killings of yours, Henry. You got any more you want to tell us about? I told you already. Ten or twelve of them. Pretty much the same. When was the first one? Oh, maybe 18 months, two years ago. First one wasn't any harder than the last. Just like I was telling you before. Yeah. You know, everybody builds up murder. It's supposed to be a big thing, hard to do. All those phony stories. I hit a guy a couple times with something. That'd be it. A real small thing. Didn't change me any. That's why I say it's, it's all built up. You ever been treated for any mental sickness, Russ? No, why? You ever been examined by a psychiatrist? No. After you killed these men, did it bother you at all? Oh, just that one dream. The time I was with Davis. That's about it. I'm sure a good meal, Sergeant. Thanks a lot. Yeah, okay. Ready? Let's go. We go back to City Hall now, huh? Yeah. You ready to give us a statement now? All right. I had an idea you'd find me. I guess I always knew you'd find me. Yeah. Well, I guess I proved my point anyway. It's all built up. What is? Well, murder, killing somebody. Those phony stories, it's all built up. It's just cheap. You got it wrong, Henry. Huh? Wait till they read you the bill. Come on, let's go. trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and found guilty of murder in the first degree.
Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. From one night to the next, it's never the same. They make it that way. Counting the suburbs, there's four million of them. Most of the people have something to add. A few of them are out to take it away. In my job, they're the ones who keep you on the move. I'm a cop. It was Wednesday, September 28th. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ed Jacobs, the boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 11.48 p.m. when I got back from the crime lab. The call came in a few hours before. An attractive blonde secretary was found beaten to death in a downtown office building. A length of steel pipe wrapped in heavy paper was on the floor beside her. There was no trace of the killer, no apparent motive for the killing. For every murder, there's at least one of each. We had to find him. You seen Jacobs around the last half hour? I was supposed to meet him here. Yeah, he's come and gone. Still around the building now. He just had a call. Oh, what about? Do you know? Yeah. He's on that killing tonight. Call came from one of the cruiser cars checking the neighborhood down where it happened. Mm -hmm. They find something? Picked up a guy about three blocks from the murder scene. He was acting suspicious. Been in the cruiser car. Figured maybe you'd want to talk to him. They're bringing the man in now, are they? Yeah. Mm hmm. You've been over checking at the crime lab? Yeah, there's not much. The murder weapon's all we got so far. A piece of pipe with heavy manila paper wrapped around it. Latent prints do any good? Well, they lifted a lot of fingerprints. They all belong to the victim. None of them are foreign. Have you got a toothpick, Joe? I had corn on the cob for dinner tonight. Yeah, they sure. Usually some in this top drawer, isn't it? Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Joe. I understand it wasn't much to look at, the killing, I mean. It was a pretty vicious thing. The girl took a terrible beating. Who found the body? One of the scrub women in the building. It was an office up on the ninth floor. Import-export company. Victim was a secretary there. Pretty girl. She dead long? Must have happened around 7 o'clock tonight, I figure. It's just a guess. What's the girl's name? She been identified yet? Yeah, uh -huh. Adele Pryor. Her boss is out of town. She was working in the office alone. No one suspicious was seen entering or leaving the office around the time of the murder. No one we know of, anyway. It's gonna take a lot of checking. Any ideas what the motive could have been? Well, it wasn't robbery. They didn't keep any cash in the office. And as far as we know, the girl wasn't carrying much money. We'll start making the rounds in the morning, checking with her friends, who we can pick up. Hi, how are you, Ed? Bring the guy in yet, Ed? Mm-hmm. Lopey, brief you about it, Joe? Well, yeah, cruiser car picked up a suspicious-looking guy out near the scene of the murder. That about the size of it? A little more than that. They found a man beating his head against a brick wall in a back alley, about two blocks from the office building where we found the body. Mm-hmm. guy had been drinking heavily when they picked him up. He was pretty far gone. Kept mumbling something about how he didn't deserve to live, how he was a murderer, a killer, not too coherent. Did they ask him about the dead girl, Adele Pryor? Yeah, but the stuff he said didn't make much sense. He sobered up a little since they picked him up. Might as well see what we can get out of him before we book him in, huh? Got him in the interrogation room now. Okay, we'll give it a try. Any calls come in, you know where to find us, Lopey, huh? Right, Joe. See you later. All right, thanks. Joe? Yeah? Can you check the crime lab? Mm-hmm. About all we're sure of is a murder weapon. No prints, no other physical evidence. Maybe it won't matter. You got half an idea we might have the killer now. The guy they picked up? How do you figure? Just a hunch. I don't think he's drunk as he pretends. Well, we're going to have to place him a lot closer to the murder scene than two blocks away. We can't prove a thing the way it stands. I was downstairs when they brought the man in. Talked to him while we were bringing him up to the interrogation room. Mm hmm Told me he knows the dead girl. All right. Said he was with her an hour before she died. <laughs> investigation of the murder scene by the crime lab failed to turn up anything in the way of leads. They knew they had the murder weapon and that was all. The deputy coroner arrived and removed the body to the county morgue for posting. At 10 o'clock that night, three hours after the approximate time of the prior girl's death, officers in a cruiser car patrolling the area found a drunken man butting his head against a cement wall and muttering incoherently about a murder. The man was picked up and taken downtown to the interrogation room where Ed and I questioned him. We talked to him a full hour before he began to make sense. He gave his name as Robert French, age 34, an unemployed engineer. While we questioned him, Becker and Encinas from Homicide checked the hotel room where French had told Eddie he was staying. I don't know. I guess I had three, four drinks at Dusty's place and I went down the street to the Blue Canary. Had some more drinks there. I don't, I don't remember what happened after that. I 
I wasn't feeling so good. You say you were drinking at Dusty's place around 7 p.m., not right, French? I suppose so. I wasn't watching the clock. I guess it was around 7. Did you talk to anybody while you were in the bar? Mm, no, no, just a bartender. His name's Sarge. I don't know his last name. He'll tell you I was there. What time was it when you got to Dusty's place, Frank? Mm, I couldn't tell you. Sure, about 6.30. Sarge would probably tell you. The bartender would tell you. A little while ago, you told us you knew Adele Pryor. Yeah, I knew her. I used to work for her husband. Uh, Rex's husband. I mean, they've been divorced seven, eight years now. You said you saw Adele Pryor in her office late this afternoon, French. What was the reason for the visit? Uh, borrowed a couple of dollars from her. She was always pretty good that way. Nice kid. I don't know anybody want to kill her like that. How about the show you were putting on out in the street tonight, French? Beating your head against that wall. Now, what was that all about? Mm, drunk. Really drunk. Not so long. I wanted to kill myself, just lay down and die. Well, how's that? You remorseful? You felt sorry for something you'd done? Is that it? Oh, I don't know. I don't think any special reason for it. When I got that way, I just keep thinking I want to die. Mm -hmm. I don't got the nerve for it, though. Like my old man used to say, I got the nerve to do anything right. I just wasn't born that way. I guess that's it. You use narcotics, French? No. I didn't even got the nerve for that. Booze, that's all. That's good enough for me. Hey, think we can go out for a cup of coffee, maybe? I, I could use it. Oh, we can have some brought in. Ed, do you want to check with Lopey? He's usually got a pot on the stove in there, huh? Yeah, okay. And see if those two men have checked back in yet, will you? Right. Appreciate it, Sergeant. Sure gonna be mean when booze wears off. I'd like to ask you a little more about the prior girl, French. Just how well did you know her? Not too well, I guess. I used to see her maybe once a month. Mm-hmm. Up there at her office? Yeah, that's right. Nice girl. Whenever I was broke, I'd always depend on her for a couple of bucks. I liked it. Nice person. Did you ever go out with her? Oh, no, 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 never did. No, no, no romance stuff. I didn't like her that way. She's a good person. We got along okay. Want a cigarette? No, no thanks. Not for cotton hurry. How about this business of Adele Pryor lending you money? She think quite a bit of you, did she? Well, I, I did her a couple of favors once when I was working for her husband. She was still married to him. She was going out with a guy she liked on the side. She was out with this guy once. I saw them together, and she asked me not to say anything, so I didn't. Before she got a divorce, I used to cover up for her all the time. She never forgot it, I guess. Mm -hmm. How about when you saw her in her office tonight, French? How'd she seem to you all right then? Well, yeah, same as ever. I asked her if she could lend me a five. She did, and I left. It was about quarter after six, I guess. Was there anyone else in the office when you left? Yeah. Uh, there was a guy waiting in the little reception room there. I don't know who he was. You remember what he looked like? Yeah, a little taller than I am, I guess. My age, had a gray suit on, black hair, kind of dark complexion. I didn't take a good look at him, though. No. You think you'd know him if you ever saw him again? I'm not sure. Maybe I would. He had a medium build. I think maybe I'd know him. You say he was waiting in the reception room when you left, huh? Yeah. When I walked out, he got up and started in the office. That's the last I saw him. What was that? I said that's the last I saw him. Joe, see you a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Becker and Ancinas have checked in. Just got back from going over French's hotel room. What'd they find? White shirt. A pair of brown shoes, a pair of dark trousers. What about them? Blood stains on all of them. The stained pieces of clothing found in the suspect's hotel room were delivered to Lieutenant Lee Jones at the crime lab for detailed examination. We had French checked through R and I. He had no previous criminal record. Ed and I continued to question the suspect until 4 a.m. He denied any knowledge or complicity in the killing of 28-year-old Adele Pryor. He told us the blood-stained clothing in his hotel room was the result of an accident that he'd been in two weeks before when he'd been drinking heavily. French kept insisting that we check on the dark-haired man who'd been waiting in the reception room of the prior girl's office the night before when French left her. We gave the description of the unidentified suspect along with the M.O. to the stats office, requesting them to furnish us with any information regarding any assaults or any solved or unsolved murder. <laughs> At 4.15 a.m., we booked in Robert French at the main jail on suspicion of 187 P.C. murder. The next morning at 10 a.m., the legwork began. Lopez and Beckner from Homicide started checking on the background and the alibi of the suspect, Robert French. It didn't hold much water. None of the people at either of the bars where French said he'd been drinking at the time of the murder could definitely vouch for his presence. But they all volunteered the information that no matter how much he drank, French was never violent toward other people, only himself. Lopez and Beckner continued investigating the suspect while Ed and I checked on the background of the victim, Adele Pryor. At 8.25 p.m., we got back to the office. Hi, I've been waiting for you, too. Won't be. You and Beckner do any good? Nothing to celebrate over. Long day, tired feet. 
Anything new at all? Maybe French is our man. You can't prove it by me. Every place we checked, everybody we talked to, the same answer. Yeah. He's a smart guy with a good education. He's on the bottle and out of work. Everybody seems to like him. He gets drunk, but he never bothers anybody. That's about the worst anybody can say about him. He drinks too much. How about his being friends with a dead girl? Did you dig up anything there? Yeah, but it only proves he was telling you the truth. As far as we could find out, there's nothing going on between the two of them. Everything we got, it only verifies what he told you. He had no interest in the girl except to borrow off her when he was broke. Mm -hmm. You got in touch with the girl's ex-husband, did you? Yeah, but we couldn't add anything. We're all clear there. By the way, Lee Jones called from the crime lab just before you came in. What do you have, Lopi? Well, we finished testing the blood stains on those clothes they found in French's hotel room. None of the stains on them match the victim's blood type. Another dead end. Yeah, it's hard to figure. Sure got me stopped. Oh, this just came in. Report for you from the stats office. He asked me to make a run for you on something last night. like more legwork. What's that, Joe? Well, French told us when he left Adele Pryor last night there was a man in the reception room waiting to see her. He gave us the guy's description and the stats office made a run on it for us. It's the best one they got. Yeah. The guy's name is William Tanner, WMA, 32 years old, 5'9", 160 pounds, dark hair, dark complexion. Fits the description French gave us of the guy. Yeah, well, the rest of it's a lot closer to home. How do you mean? William Tanner was a prominent suspect in the Donaldson murder last September. The testimony of friends and relatives subsequently cleared him. The Donaldson murder is still unsolved, you know. Well, the same thing that killed Donaldson killed Adele Pryor. How do you mean? Piece of steel pipe wrapped in paper. To the working detective assigned to examine a criminal case, the element of coincidence when it occurs generally serves to complicate any investigation. Toward the solution of the crime, coincidence may mean a lot or it may mean nothing. In any event, it can't be dismissed. This time we had two examples of coincidence to deal with. A girl had been beaten to death in an office building. Within two blocks of the murder, we found a man, fairly well acquainted with the victim, who admitted to seeing the girl within an hour of her death. Primary investigation uncovered some facts which tend to incriminate the man, some facts which tend to prove him innocent. Is his presence in the immediate neighborhood of the killing only coincidental, or was he there at the particular time for the purpose of murder? We didn't know. Same token, a man by the name of William Tanner was suspected one year before of beating an elderly woman to death with an identical murder weapon, a length of steel pipe wrapped in paper. This same person, William Tanner, matched the description of a man reportedly seen entering Adele Pryor's office shortly before she was murdered. Tanner also had a criminal record of one conviction for assault. Maybe it was a lead, maybe it was nothing. It had to be checked out. We showed Tanner's mug shot to our first murder suspect, Robert French, but he failed to identify it. When we found that William Tanner had moved from his last known address, we checked with his next of kin, his brother, Martin Tanner. He was with the city fire department. We found him on duty at the neighborhood fire station on Norwich Avenue. No, I'm afraid not, Sergeant. I haven't seen my brother Bill in three weeks now. If he's not at his apartment, I couldn't tell you where to find him. We tried the last address we had on him. He wasn't there. 8625 Norman Road. Oh, no, I moved out of there six, seven months ago. Got his new address in my locker upstairs. I can give it to you before you go if you want. We'd appreciate it, yeah. What's the boss, Sergeant? My brother in some kind of trouble again, I guess, huh? Just a routine check. You sound like you almost expect your brother to be in trouble, Tanner. Tell you the truth, I guess I do. I don't know what's happened to him. Excuse me a minute. No, it's not our call. How would you mean that, Tanner? What's happened to your brother? Tell you the truth, I don't know. Bill and I used to live together with our mother. Ma died about two years ago. I don't think Bill ever really got over it. He was a lot closer to Ma than I was. I see. After she died, he drank quite a bit for a while, and he tried women, lots of them. After that, he seemed to turn to religion. At first, we thought that it helped, and would have, too, except that he's an odd guy. Finds a way of distorting the Bible. Seems to go to extremes, that kind of thing. Do you know any of your brother's close friends by any chance? Oh, a few of them, I guess. I've been over to Bill's apartment from time to time the last couple of months. He's introduced me to a few people. Mm-hmm. Do you know any of his women friends? Yeah, I do. Two or three of them. How about the name of Del Pryor? Mean anything to you? Would she be kind of a pretty girl, blonde hair, nice clothes? Yeah, that's right. Have you met her, Tanner? Yeah, Bill had me meet her once. Seemed to like her quite a bit. Why? Was he pretty serious about her, or would you know that? Yeah, he was serious about her, all right. He told me that. I don't think it worked both ways, though. It looked to me like she was playing the field. Bill took it way too serious. How do you mean, Tanner? Well, they went together steady for a while, and they broke it up. She did, I mean. Mm -hmm. How'd your brother take that? Not so good. I remember the night about a month ago. Never saw Bill like that before. Real bad shape. Wasn't drinking, either. That's so? Never saw Bill like that in my life. Like what, Tanner? Off his head. He could have gone out and killed a girl. <laughs> Before 
Before we left the fire station, we got William Tanner's new address from his brother Martin. It was the same address as that of the murdered girl, Adele Pryor, an apartment house close by the intersection of Wilshire and La Brea. Tanner's apartment was on the third floor, just down the hall from the Pryor girl's apartment, but Tanner wasn't there. The apartment house manager told us that he'd moved out the night before without leaving any forwarding address. Ed put in a call to the suspect's place of business, an industrial chemical company where Tanner was employed as assistant office manager. What was the reason, sir? Oh, I see. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, sir. We'll be checking with you later. Bye. What did he say? Tanner left yesterday, quit without giving notice. Told me he had a better job lined up. Where? South America. Saturday, October 1st, 8 a.m., we got out a broadcast and an APB on murder suspect William Tanner. We checked with the local U.S. State Department office, but they had no record of granting a passport recently to a William Tanner to travel in a South American country. We talked to the various consulates in the city representing South American nations, but none of them had issued a visa to a William Tanner recently or anyone answering his description. Together with Lopez and Beckner from Homicide, Ed and I continued the search for the missing suspect. The deeper we checked into his background, the more we became convinced that mentally Tanner was far from normal. Most of the people who knew the suspect told us the same story his brother had given us. In recent months, Tanner had taken strongly to religion. He attended revival meetings and similar religious exercises every night in the week. He talked nothing but repentance. He quoted the scriptures constantly. He adopted the habit of carrying a Bible with him wherever he went, reading from it aloud every chance he got. He kept urging his friends to join him in being saved. On Monday, October 3rd, we began a check of the various revival halls. On Wednesday, October 5th, we found him. He was attending a gospel revival in a meeting hall in the south end of the city. He had a room in a small hotel directly above the meeting hall, but he seemed reluctant to take us up there. While Lopez and Beckner got a passkey from the manager and went up to check the room, Ed and I questioned Tanner. I was sorry to hear about Adele, what happened to her. That's a Terrible thing, isn't it? Yes, sir. We understand you knew Adele Pryor fairly well, Mr. Tanner. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I liked her quite a bit at one time. We used to see a lot of each other. I was engaged to her, you know. How is it you never married Tanner? Did she break off the engagement? Oh, no. I was lucky. I found out in time I broke off with her. What do you mean you found out in time? What'd you find out? I found the truth, Sergeant. The everlasting word. For know this and understand that no unclean person or covetous one has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. For these have given themselves up in despair to sensuality, greedily practicing every kind of uncleanness. Do not then become partakers with them. That's the everlasting word, Sergeant. The holy book. Yes, sir, but I'm not quite sure I follow you. Open your eyes and ears to the everlasting word and you will know and understand all things. It's very simple, officer. I don't want to say anything uncharitable about her. Adele wasn't for me. I'm glad I found out in time, that's all. When's the last time you saw her, Tanner? You remember? No, I don't. Not exactly. I think I saw her a week or so before it happened, before they found her dead. Where was it you saw her? How's that? I say, where was it the last time you saw her? On the street. It was downtown somewhere. I passed her on the street. You used to live in the same apartment house she did, isn't that right? Right down the hall from her? Yes, I did. Why? And for a full week, you didn't happen to see the prior girl around the apartment building at all? No, that's right. When I broke off with Adele, that was it. I had no reason to see her anymore. It's not too clear, Tanner. It doesn't jive with what we've been told about you and the prior girl. Well, they're lies, of course. I suppose you know that. Adele was a beautiful girl, very beautiful. A lot of men she knew were jealous of me. Well, now, the way we understand it, Tanner, you never did break off with Miss Pryor. You were going around with her, and you were seen with her right up to the day of her death. Well, that's certainly a lie. I can prove that. As soon as I found out about Adele, that was weeks before she was killed. As soon as I found out, that was the end. I broke off with her right away. I'd like to know what you're referring to, Tanner. You found out what? Adele, Adele. She was one of those. What? Well, I'm sorry, she was. A sinner. I almost went out of my mind when I found out she knew it was wrong. 
She must have known. It's right there in the book for anybody to read. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. What are you trying to tell us? It was terrible. She sinned all the time. She committed terrible sins. Come on over to the side there with me. I can tell you all about her. I'd, I'd just as soon nobody heard us. Sure, go ahead. This will be all right here. Just one question before you get started. Yes? Did you ever visit Adele Pryor at her place of business downtown at her office? No, I never did. Why? Did you visit Adele Pryor at her office the day she was killed? Well, the Lord is my witness, Sergeant. I have nothing to fear. Why should you ask me that question? We have a report you were seen going into the office less than an hour before the Pryor girl was murdered. I'd like to have you clarify that for us, if you would. Why, certainly. It's a lie. You sure you weren't in that office with her just before she died? Let me tell you about her sins. There was never anything as evil as this, Sergeant. Is that right? Yes, it was a terrible shock. I liked Adele. I think I loved her. We've been going out for two months. Sometimes I'd take her here so she could learn about the everlasting words, so she could know about the terrible sins some people commit. Drinking and parties and carrying on. Things that no one should do, especially girls like Adele. Beautiful girl. How can you be sure she was doing anything wrong, Tanner? Do you have any real proof of it? Everything, Sergeant. Just knowing she was sinning against the Lord. Do you know of any of the other men she went out with? They were sinful, I knew that. They only liked Adele because she was beautiful. Did you know any of the men? Did you know for a fact there was anything wrong? I knew everything, Sergeant. She was a beautiful girl, and I thought she was a woman of the Lord, and I wanted her for my wife. She gave in to sin. I guess that's her business, Tanner, how she lived. We're trying to find out how she died. Well, just let me tell you about it. I'd lie there in the dark in my room upstairs and wait to hear her come in down the hall. It was always late. Two and three o'clock in the morning I'd hear her come in. Well, you still haven't told us, Tanner. What about the men she went out with, the prior girl? Slaves of the devil, every one of them. All right, you want to tell us, mister, how about it? Is that what made you do it? Um, wait a minute. You don't wait to listen. You say, made me do it. Made me do what? I think you know what I mean, Tanner. You want to tell us now? It's a terrible thing, all this sin around us. It's a grave thing, the whole world. There's not one just man. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. There's none who does good. No, not even one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, and with their tongues they have dealt deceitfully. The venom of asps is beneath their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God. Well, yes, sir. We'd still like an answer to our question. Maybe we could talk it out a little better downtown. The wisdom and the knowledge is here and now. I knew Adele and the terrible sins. They had to be paid for. Adele had to pay for every one of them. You want to get to the point, mister. Now, what is it? What are you trying to tell us? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the charity of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. She sinned and she died. Yeah. In the name of God, in the name of our Lord. Amen. I killed her. William Harold Tanner was brought downtown immediately where he volunteered a complete statement admitting full guilt for the murder of Adele Pryor. Blood-stained clothing found in his room corroborated his story. He gave us the details of how he murdered Adele Pryor because she spurned his attentions. We began questioning him about the Donaldson murder, which had taken place more than a year before and which was still unsolved. The victim, 64-year-old Louise Donaldson, had met death in the same manner as Adele Pryor. No, I didn't know the old lady, but she had money. I'd been told that. I was broke and I needed the money, so I thought it would be a good thing. This was in September a year ago that you murdered her? Yes, sir, September, all right. She was all alone. She didn't have anybody. She was sick. I probably did her a favor. Now, your package here says you figured in the investigation on the plot to blow up the Rexmore Hotel about three years ago, homemade bomb planted in the basement of the hotel. Yeah, that was mine three years ago in September. You never could have traced it. It's too bad the bomb didn't go off. I hated those hotel people. All right. What was the matter? Well, I worked at that hotel once, you know. I worked hard, too. One Saturday, they held up my paycheck. I didn't get it until the next Tuesday. I never forgot that. September. September. Well, what would that have to do with it? I don't know, really. September's always been the time, that's all. I always seem to work into some kind of trouble. Every September. I don't know what it is. It just seems to be the best time, September. It's always September. Mm -hmm. I really didn't want to kill Adele. There wasn't anything else I could do. She was a sinner. Yeah. Drinking and running around, she committed sins all the time. The worst kinds of sins. Terrible. Yeah, well, maybe you better check the book, Tanner. You're way ahead of her. What do you mean? What kind of sin's worse than murder? On 
January 10th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was examined by three psychiatrists appointed by the state and found to be sane at the time of the murders. He was tried and convicted of first-degree murder, two counts. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. One of the biggest in the United States. Spreads out in all four directions like a broad loom rug. To the south and west, it's the downtown business district. To the east, the industrial area. Los Angeles, California. It's pretty much like your town. This is a Spanish priest, one of the city's founders. It's changed a lot since then. It's got high tension wires bringing in the power and bus lines to get you where you're going. It's got railroads and freight yards. Churches, any kind you want. parks and lakes. It's got a police department and a city hall. This is where I work. I'm a cop. It was Thursday, July 17th. It was sultry in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. It was 1.35 p.m. when we got back to the city hall. Nine months before, a jewelry salesman was slugged and robbed of $20,000 in precious stones. It took us weeks of investigation before we discovered the man responsible for the holdup. It took more weeks of legwork to gather all the evidence. We needed one more thing. His statement. <laughs> You want to call a captain? He said he'd be in the corner pocket. Yeah, I'd still like to know what this is all about, Sergeant. Dragging me down here Hello, in the captain, middle of the day. Hold on a minute, down. Darby. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Skipper. This is Jacobs. We just got back. Yeah. All of them? Good. Right. We're in your office. Yeah, thanks. The others check in, all right? Yeah, I just got back. Worked out fine. Would you please explain what this is about? Why have you brought me down here? We think you know why. I don't. I haven't any idea. You take me away from my store on a busy day, you put a police guard on it, you insist on bringing me down here, what's it all about? Now tell me. You tell us, Mr. Garvey. Hmm? Tell you about what? The jewel robbery nine months ago, the holdup. What holdup? My store hasn't been robbed. We're talking about your friend, Thomas Ashley. Ashley? What about him? We think you remember it nine months ago, the parking lot back of the building down on 4th Street. Oh, yes, yeah, surely. Some holdup man slugged him, stole his case of samples. I remember it now, yeah. Poor Tom. The thief made a big haul, didn't he? Unset diamonds. $20,000 worth. Yeah, I remember it now. I don't think Tom's gotten over it yet. I was a jewelry salesman for the same company at the time. You know, the same company Tom was working for, I mean. Yeah, we know. Some of the big bosses thought Tom had a hand in it. They figured it was a put-up job. Nothing was further from the truth. That's so? Of course, I know Tom. Close friend of mine. He wouldn't be mixed up in a deal like that. Tom and I worked out of the same office for years. We've had him over to the house for dinner. We've even been on vacations together. One of the most honest men I know. You're sure about that, are you? Of course I'm sure. Say, that isn't why you called me down here, is it? You don't think Tom had anything to do with that robbery, do you? You don't think he was in on it? He had nothing to do with it. Think you know that as well as we do. Then why am I here? There's nothing I can tell you about the holdup, only what I heard from Tom, what I read in the newspapers. Now, you can tell us a lot more, Garvey. We didn't bring you down here just to pass the time of day. Tom was slugged and his sample case of stones was taken. That's all I can tell you. You're a liar, mister. What? You engineered the whole thing. We know it, and so do you. Is this some kind of a joke? If it is, I think it's in bad taste. It's a long way from a joke, Garvey. You planned the job, you got the loop. We can give you chapter and verse. I really think you're serious. You think I robbed Tom? We got it past the thinking stage, Garvey. We already told you we know you robbed him. Now, wait a minute. This thing's ridiculous. The whole idea is ridiculous. 
I don't know who gave you the so-called information on me, but it's wrong. Nothing further from the truth. Nobody gave us the information. We got it ourselves. You're really serious, are you? I robbed Tom, and you can prove I did. You're getting the idea. I don't know what to say. It's fantastic. I robbed my best friend, Tom Ashley, nine months ago. I have $20,000 worth of diamonds, and you can prove it. Every bit of it. What about it? I think you're out of your mind. My name is Ernest George Garvey. Are you sure I'm the man you want? There couldn't be a mistake. There's no mistake. This thing would be funny if I didn't think you were serious. Let me ask you just one question. Maybe that'll clear it up for you. Yeah. If I held up Tom Ashley, how is it he didn't recognize me? You know better than that, Garvey. What? You didn't hold up Tom Ashley yourself. You had someone do it for you. Oh, cloak and dagger, huh? I'm afraid this is getting a little too wild for me, Sergeant. Maybe you can waste your time making ridiculous charges. I can't. I'm going back to my store. It's a weak bluff, mister. It's not going to do it. Excuse me. Are you sure you two men haven't been drinking? Sit down, Garvey. I told you. I'm going back to my Sit store. Sit down. You have no right to keep me here. Ridiculous charges. You think I'm one of those cheap hoodlums you're used to dealing with? Now, come off it, mister. You've got a $5,000 car and a $40,000 home. That doesn't rate you a special treatment. You're a thief. You know it as well as we do. I don't have to take this from you. You haven't got much choice, mister. We just finished five months' legwork proving it. Proving what? Sit down. You engineered that holdup. We know who you got to do it. We know how it was carried out. We know how you planned on disposing of the diamonds. We know who your fence was. We know what the split was. We know what you did with part of the money. We know how much you got left. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. What can I say? I don't even know what you're talking about. Any way you want it, Mr. Garvey. Maybe you'd like to tell me why I did all this. You're not better than we do. No, I mean it. Tell me. You weren't making enough money at your job to suit yourself, suit your wife either. It's pretty good. Marilyn get a big kick out of that. All right, mister. We can wait it out as long as you want. We spent nine months on it already. Another few days aren't going to make that much difference. Just as a matter of curiosity, how'd you first start off on this tangent? Whatever gave you an idea that I had anything to do with a holdup? When you started to spend money, new car, new office for yourself, new fur coat for your wife, transferred your two children to that private school. That makes a holdup man out of me because I wanted to send my kids to a better school? Where'd the money come from? Can you explain that? Don't you think that's my business, Sergeant? Where I get my money, what I do with it? Not when you get it stealing. I'm afraid you're going just a little too far. You insist I'm a thief, I'm going to insist you prove it. All right, have a look over here, Mr. Garvey. Yes? Some of the reports in the investigation, reams of them. They cover everything from the time of the jewel robbery up to late yesterday. Now, it's all right there. Everything from the crime report to signed statements. How could that concern me? Three quarters of the stuff concerns you. Have a look for yourself. I still can't get it straight in my mind. What makes you think I had anything to do with that robbery? Do you know what this is, Garvey, this machine here? No, some kind of recording apparatus. That's right, it's a tape recorder. You've been taking down this conversation. Why? No, not this one. We've been recording every conversation that took place in your office for the past four months. Every word. What do you mean? Just that, Garvey. Every time you talked on the phone, every visitor you had, it's all down on tape. Twenty-five reels of it. Interesting. Is that supposed to frighten me? We don't care if it frightens you or not. Something else. Yes? Reports on what you've been doing for the last four months. Daily reports, every movement you made. Is that so? Everywhere you went, everyone you talked to, everything you did. You like to hear a sample? This must be some kind of a joke. That's the only explanation I can think of. May 12th, Thursday. Sergeants Bitteroff and Rafferty. Those are the two officers who were tailing you at the time. You checked in at your new office at 9.38 a.m. At 10.03 a.m. you had a visitor, a Kenneth Tyson. You talked to him in your office. The conversation's recorded. Tyson left at 10.18 a.m. At 10.32 a.m., you left your office. If you're trying to impress me, I'm afraid it isn't working out very well. Care for a cigarette, Garvey? No, thanks. I have my own. All right. I've wasted enough time. Exactly what's the point of all this? It's pretty simple. You're responsible for a robbery. We can prove it. We're giving you a chance to make a statement. It's nonsense. Is it? Of course. People following me, checking everything I do, where I spend my money, where I send my kids to school. What's it all about? It doesn't make sense. Okay, Garvey, we've said it before. We can wait it out as long as you want. Look, let's get this thing straight. Let's go back to the beginning and take it step by step. Okay, fine. The holdup was last fall, wasn't it? Sometime in October? October 7th, Monday, 5.20 in the afternoon. All right, now just what am I supposed to have done? None of your vague references about a new coat for my wife or where I send my kids to school. Let's have some facts. Joe? All right, Garvey. You went to work as a jewelry salesman for the company ten years ago. Your friend Tom Ashley, the victim, started the same year. The two of you have been pretty close friends. That's right, I told you that. We'll skip the rest of your background for now. Two weeks before the robbery on September 24th, you had a meeting with a Kenneth Tyson. You met him in a cafeteria on South Broadway. Tyson's 19 years old. He lives with an older sister. He works in a gas station on Olympic Boulevard. He's done some work in your car for you. That's how you happen to know him. Yes, I think I remember the boy. I don't know him well, though. I don't recall the meeting either. You know the boy very well. At the time of the meeting, you promised him $1,000 if he'd hold up your friend Tom Ashley. Ridiculous. Tyson agreed to it, and you briefed him on the plan. The following day, you gave him a gun, a 32 caliber Smith & Wesson, serial number 362744. Nonsense. Where did you get that information? Tyson. He's lying. Believe me, if he told you that, he's lying. Is he the one who robbed Tom? October 7th, at your direction, he was in the parking lot behind the Hunter Crosswell building. Tom Ashley came out to get in his car. He had a case of sample diamonds with him. 
Tyson held him up, slugged him, took the stones and got away. Of course, it's obvious. Tyson's trying to say I put him up to it. He's trying to get out of it that way. I'm afraid not, Garvey. The boy couldn't have carried off the holdup by himself. Of course he could. It's obvious he's trying to cover up. There were six people in the company you worked for who knew that on Mondays, Ashley always took the case of sample diamonds along when he made his calls. Only on Mondays. You were one of the people who knew that. I suppose you've considered the other five people. They were all checked out at the time. They were all cleared you along with them. Well, I'm not clear anymore, is that it? This young hoodlum Tyson, you're willing to take his word over mine. After the robbery took the case of diamonds to you, that was the next day. You paid him $500 and promised him the other 500 when you got rid of the stone. Oh, I suppose I've gotten rid of them, or do I still have them? Which? Two months after the holdup, you contacted a fence up in San Francisco. You drove up there and sold him some of the stones. He broke them up and then he sold them. We know who he sold them to. We know what he got for him. This fence, he's supposed to be another good friend of mine? You're still doing business with him. His name's Fred Lawrence. It's a new one on me. I don't know any Fred Lawrence. Can't even recall the name. Maybe this will help you, Garvey. Listen to him on the tape recorder. What's all this about? Phone conversation, Garvey. One of the things we recorded from your office. Let's see, this one was on March 18th. I always thought wiretapping was against the law, or do you pay any attention to that? We didn't tap your telephone line. We recorded everything from dictographs we installed in your store and back in your office. They started recording the day you moved in. That was March the 1st, wasn't it? I don't know why you're telling me. I can sue you for that, you know. I can sue you for your last dollar. All we're concerned with right now is Fred Lawrence. You say you don't know him. I'd like to have you listen to this. Recorded March 18th in your office. All right? piecing words together, isn't there? They can record your voice and then fix the tape, take a simple sentence and change the words around to mean just the opposite. You can examine the tape if you like. We didn't make a splice in it. All you'll find in it are the usual factory splices, just the way it came from the manufacturer. What difference does it make anyway? Nothing criminal about that conversation, nothing at all. You told us a few minutes ago you didn't know Fred Lawrence. You never heard of him. On that recording, it sounds like you know him pretty well. It's a fairly common name, wouldn't you say? It must be quite a few Fred Lawrences. I didn't happen to remember the name right off. How about Tyson? What? Tyson. You told us you didn't know him well at all. I don't. Didn't sound that way on the tape. You were telling Lawrence he was all right. You said, believe me, he's a good kid. How about it, mister? How about what? Is this some kind of a frame? What are you trying to make me say? We're not going to make you say anything, Garvey. We work robbery detail. That's the job, robberies. They pay us to clean them up. I can pay you. What? Never mind. I didn't mean that. I meant I pay my taxes. I pay your salaries. I help to anyway. I don't know why I have to be treated like this. No reason to make a big headache out of this for everybody, Garvey. You engineered a holdup and we can prove it. We're giving you a chance to make a statement. That's all. I've got nothing to say. Make a statement about what? All you're going on is hearsay, circumstantial evidence. You can't say I planned that robbery. You admit you know Tyson. You know him well. I don't. I admit nothing. What about the phone conversation? It's a fake. They phony those things up all the time. You know it as well as I do. You admitted you know Fred Lawrence. We proved that on the recording. I admit nothing. You don't even know Tyson. Is that what you want to say? I know him. That's all. He worked on my car a couple of times. I don't know him well. I'd like to play you another recording, Garvey. A waste of time. I haven't got the whole day to spend here. I've got to get back to my store. I've got a business to operate. Won't take very long. Here we are. April 5th. Foolishness anyway. How do I know how you made those recordings? You could have gotten actors, made them up yourselves. There weren't any dictographs. How did you make those things? There were dictographs, Carby. You remember before you moved in that new suite of offices, you had them redecorated? Yes. There were sound technicians from our crime lab out there working side by side with the painters, carpenters. Installed dictographs in your store, back in your offices. They bugged the entire place. Wiretapping. I'll bring this into court if it's the last thing I do. We already told you, Garvey, it's not wiretapping. We didn't touch your phone lines. We didn't have to. Invasion of privacy. I'm going to bring this into court. All right, let's hear this recording. It might clear up a few things, huh? Clear up what? What are you trying to prove? Okay, Joe. Yeah. Okay. Date on this is April 5th. Pretty good. 
I'm trying to get a hold of you the last week or so. Hard to do, you're not in very much. Yeah, pretty busy, Ken. That time of year, you know, keeps you going. Well, I don't want to waste any time. I'd like to know how the deal's working out, though. Going back east to Albany next month. I'd like to get the rest of my money if I could. It's just like I told you the last time, Ken. I'm sending the stuff north. I hope to hear in a couple of days. Yeah, I know. That's what you told me before, but it was a pretty heavy job. I could use the money. I mean, if it wasn't so heavy, I wouldn't mind. But, well, I got it coming, I think. Of course you do, Ken. There's no question there. It's just that I haven't got it right now. Believe me, you'd have it in a minute if it was mine to give. Yeah, but that was the agreement, wasn't it? 500 before the job, 500 after. Half and last October, that's it. How about it, Garvey? What do you say? Ridiculous, that's all. Obvious fake. You can look at the tape if you like, inspect it. You can check every one of those 25 reels. We'll play them for you if you want. Fakes, bad ones at that. Now look, I'll give you both a chance. Either you book me in on a charge or else release me. You try booking me in and I'll sue you for false arrest. I'll break you. I'll sue you blind. I promise you that. Yeah. Release me and I'll get back to work. I'll forget all about it. Now you name it, which one? Book me in or release me? That's fair enough. You're giving us a choice. You bet it's fair. You could get in a lot of hot water. Now it's up to you. Which one? You ran a bad bluff, mister. What? We're booking you in. Thursday, 3.55 p.m., Ed Jacobs and I continued questioning the robbery suspect, Ernest Garvey. Despite the evidence at hand, he still refused to admit any knowledge of the $20,000 jewel theft nine months before. The questioning went on. Garvey's answers became more and more confused. We kept pressing, laying out the case against him step by step. 4.30 p.m. We stayed at it. But it must have taken quite a bit of money, didn't it, Garvey? Your wife's new fur coat, new car for yourself. Where did it come from? Now, look, there has to be an answer. Where'd that money come from? Simple. I borrowed it. Where'd you borrow it? Some of it from friends, some from the banks. I don't see how it concerns you. How much money did you borrow? Don't you think that's my business? Wasn't it about $7,000? that about right? Yes. No, it was more. What's the difference? It's my business. Complete financial file on you, Garvey. Took us quite a few weeks getting it together. A lot of work. You must like snooping in other people's affairs. No, not especially. It's pretty dull. Here's a copy of your bank statement from the California banks. Photostat. Doesn't make much sense here. What do you mean? Well, we checked your income for that month. Amounted to $620.18. Now, how was that possible? For your information, I made a loan that month. That's probably some of the loan money I deposited. I'd quit my old job that time. I was going in business for myself. I needed the money to redecorate the new store, the office. It's as simple as that. Mm. Photostat's your loan papers right here. The loan was for $2,000. Yes. The month before, February, you borrowed from another bank. Let's see. That was for $3,000. Made another one in April, too. That was for 1500 Different bank again. Yes, that's right. Do we have to go over this line by line? In three months, you made bank loans for $6,500. Now, besides that, in the same three months, you earned a total of $1,713.88. Now, together, that makes $8,213.88. What's the point? Copies of your bank statements, Garvey. You have five different savings accounts in five different banks. How do you explain that? Garvey, any explanation? Almost five o'clock. Can I use the phone? I have to call my wife. Let her know. All right. We'll have to listen in on the extension. The conversation will be monitored. Go ahead. I don't care. Okay. You dial nine to get an outside line. Oh yeah. Busy. Photo stats there if you want to examine them, Garvey. I see them. Well, you want to give us an explanation? You only had $8,200. How could you bank 11000 It had to come from somewhere. Purely a personal matter, that's all. I borrowed 3000 from a brother of mine. Lives back in Minnesota. You'd already made three loans. Why'd you have to borrow from your brother? You mind telling us? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do mind. Well, it still doesn't balance the books, Garvey. You earned and borrowed $8,200. You got another 3000 from your brother, you say. That's 11200 You banked 11000 Yes, that's right. You always have to repeat. That'd leave you with $200. Did you and your family live for three months on $200? Why not? That could easily be. A lot of people do it. Yes, sir, but not your family. I'm getting sick and tired of this. You trying to tell me you know my family better than I do, what they eat, what they spend, what it takes to support them? We've been on this thing for nine months, Garvey. We'll put in a lot of hours, and we know your family pretty well. If you like, I'll tell you the last time you ordered steak from the meat market. When you paid your gas bill, the last time your wife bought a pair of shoes. I guess this is standard procedure for you, threatening people. We're not threatening you, Garvey. We're giving you facts. Another file here. It took us over a month to get this one together. Complete record of your expenses from February 1st. Covers February, March, April, May, and June. I hope the police department has a good lawyer, Sergeant. You've got fair warning. I'm going to sue you for your last dollar. Now, you say you and your family lived three months on $200. That doesn't jibe with what we've got. 
You can take a look here if you want to. It's all there. Lies, forgeries, it's all lies. I promise you're going to regret this. There's a photostat here of the receipt for your wife's coat, Garvey. $1,612.34. That includes the tax paid in full. Photostat of the contract for your new car. Down payment, $2,000. Liquor bill for the big party you threw in March, March 20th. Liquor bill, $387. There's a catering bill here, $194. Full year's check for tuition, room, and board for your kids at that private school you sent them to. $1,864.07. That's only the beginning, Garvey. It comes to a lot more than $200. Have you heard enough? I better try to get my wife again. I have to let her know. All right, Ed, you want to get the extension? Yeah, right. You dial 9 to get outside, Garvey. Yeah, I know. Stupid. Now, wait a couple of minutes. You'll get through. Gabbing on the phone all day long. Gab on the phone and play cards. It's all she ever does. I've got some more figures for you here, Garvey. Be a good idea if you hear them. Bills for two more parties you threw last month. Food bills, liquor bills. Why do you have to keep pushing that stuff at me? So you've been sneaking around finding out about my personal affairs. That's supposed to be good police work, is it? This is the kind of thing they pay you for? Now, look. You carried off a robbery, Garvey. We're giving you a chance to make a statement. Why should I? What for? Give you a statement and have you twist it around? Incriminate me? I haven't had anything to do with this kid, Tyson. Better make that call. Down on first. I know, I know, you told me. What's wrong, Garvey? What's the matter with her, stupid? She ought to know I'm trying to get her, stupid. Down on. I know. Just a piece of it. Think you ought to hear it. Not the one from May 10th, is that it? Yeah, uh huh. Tyson and Garvey. Same place. The office. Ow! 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 Ow!
November 4th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, which is punishable by imprisonment from five years to life. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Steel and stone and two million people. They produce everything for the millions. They use it up for the millions. And they waste it the same way. Every month they throw away thousands of dollars worth of everything. Some of them waste food and water. Some of them waste time and money. And some of them just waste themselves. When they do, I pick up the pieces. I'm a cop. It was Sunday, March 9th. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 4.35 p.m. when we got to the Kelsey apartments. The call came in a half hour before. A man reported the fatal shooting of his wife. We didn't know how it happened. We didn't know why it happened. The husband claimed it was suicide. The evidence pointed to murder. Woman's dead, shot to the right temple with a 45 automatic. Husband claims it was suicide. What's the name? Mr. and Mrs. Andrew Robertson. Wife's name is Marie. That's Mr. Robertson in the front room there. Crime lab been called? They're on their way. I guess we better talk to Robertson. Right. Mr. Robertson? Sergeant Jacobs, Sergeant Friday. How do you do? How are you? Mr. Robertson, you want to tell us what happened here? <sighs> Just gotten back from the corner grocery store. My wife and I had a little argument going. It started before I left for the store. Still on when I got back. I see. She was fixing chicken fried steaks for dinner. Putting flour on them. We had a few more words and I went over and sat on the Davenport right where I am now. Mm -hmm. She was standing here in the doorway to the kitchen. She said something that set me off. I guess I got pretty mad and said a few things. Then she went over to that little nightstand there by the door to the kitchen. That's where I keep my army automatic. She pulled it out of the drawer and backed into the kitchen. Put the gun to her head and said, this will put an end to the argument once and for all. I yelled at her and tried to stop her, but I was too late. She pulled the trigger and fell right there where she is. What'd you do then? I went upstairs to Ted Carlton's place. He lives in 212 right above us. We don't have a phone here. I asked him to call the police and send for an ambulance. Did you go over to see how badly your wife was shot? Yes, I forgot to tell you. The minute she fired, I rushed right over to her, but it was too late. She was dead. Did you touch anything in here? Move anything? No, sir. Not a thing. I've been right here ever since I got back down from Ted's room upstairs. Joe? Empty cartridge casing here on the floor. Yeah. Well, when Jones gets here, we can measure the distance. Just a minute. saucer over till the crime lab gets here, huh? Right. Hi, Jones. Harry? Oh, Lee, kitchen. Harry? What if 
you'd mind taking Mr. Robertson downtown. We'll be right down as soon as we finish up here. Right, Joe. See you later. Thanks, sir. Shot through the right temple. Husband claims suicide. Uh-huh. What's under the saucer? Empty casing. Looks like she was flowering meat, huh? That's what the husband says, yeah. That's probably what that is on the barrel of the automatic there. Yeah, we noticed that. Wastebasket's so full, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right tempo, huh? Mm -hmm. 45 automatic. Yeah. If she shot herself in the kitchen, the position of the body doesn't warrant the empty casing being out there in the living room, does it? George. Yeah. Come in. Friday. Jacobs. How are you, George? Hi. Right. What do you want to shoot? Why don't you get an overall of the room first and then grab one in the kitchen there? Yeah, all right. Can I get this sauce off the casing for you, George? Thanks. Okay. Jacobs, you mind moving over there a little? Oh, yeah. Thanks. What do you want now, the kitchen? All right. Right from where you are now, Scott. Okay. Now, right over the body. Yeah, all right. Better get that chair to stand on. Yeah, here you are. Thanks, Ed. How much room to work in here? Can you get it all in there? Yeah, I think so. Better use the wastebasket as your right-hand side line. Kitchen stove on the other side. Right. Can't get the stove in. Uh, you settle for the wastebasket only? Fine. Just use that as your right-hand side line. Right. Okay. Now, Lee, when you finish up here, Ed and I are going to run upstairs. Well, Joe, before you go, do you want to give me a hand? Take over this end. Sure. Fine. Where do you want it? Right to about where she must have been standing. About here? That's good. Okay, we'll check you later, Lee. Fine. All right, Sally. Friday, Jacobs, how is it? Rough one. officers. You're Mr. Carlton? Yes, I am. It's an awful thing, isn't it? We understand you're a friend of the Robertsons. Yes, I am. You found out anything yet? You think Andy killed her? We don't know. We haven't completed our investigation. Oh, I see. Well, I'll bet that's the way it was. I hate to say that, but from all the indications, it certainly looks that way. How do you mean? In the argument, the shouting, and then that single shot. I don't know. It sure struck me that Andy did it. When did the argument start? Was it prolonged, do you know? What do you mean? When did it start? What time, do you know? Well, this one today started about 3.30 when Andy got back from the store. They've been arguing ever since I've known them. How long have you known them? About two years. Those two never should have gotten married to begin with, if I'm any judge. You married? No, sir, I'm not. I wonder if you can tell us. Did Mrs. Robertson ever say anything that would lead you to believe that she was in fear of her life? Well, yes, she did. One time Andy stalked out of the apartment down there and Marie came up here to see me. She was in tears, all broken up about it as usual during those spats. I see. She said, uh, I'll try to remember exactly how she put it. She said, uh, 
And he gets so mad sometimes, I think he's going to kill me. What do they usually argue about, you know? Mm, different things. This particular time I was telling you about, I think, was over as being late for dinner. I see. Now, aside from this one instance, is there anything else you can offer us? Well, Andy has a terrible temper, that I know. We used to go out and bowl once in a while, Marie, Andy, and myself. We had to stop. Every time he missed a spare, you'd think it was the end of the world. Would he usually seem to take it out on his wife? Most of the time, yeah. Although I must say I caught it myself a few times. Abusive language. He really carried on over nothing at all. Did Robertson leave his wife home alone much of the time? No, not any more than usual. Seems like he always wanted to get home just so they could argue. Everybody in the apartment house knows about him. Now, you said that Mrs. Robertson came up here after that one particular argument. That's right, sir. Did she come up here often? No, not very often. Just when she was unusually upset and her nerves were on edge. But only then when Andy'd rush out mad. Do you know whether or not Robertson owns a gun? Yes, I believe he does. As a matter of fact, I know he does. One night we were having trouble with prowlers. He came up here with his automatic. I see. Later on, I think I asked him where he got the gun. He said from the Army. Anything else you can add, Mr. Carlton? Well, I was the one to call the police. You knew that. That's what we understand. Well, didn't Andy tell you? He came up here right after the shot and asked me to call the police for him. They don't have a phone. Exactly how did he tell you? Well, what do you mean? Well, what were his exact words? Can you remember? He said... My wife shot, call the police and get an ambulance quick. What was your reaction to this? Well, I'd heard the shots, so I wasn't too surprised. When Andy came running up here, I knew before he said a word. You could tell just to look at him. You could tell what? That something was wrong. I had a hunch all along that this might happen one day. What's that? That Andy'd kill his wife. <laughs> Let us use his telephone. I called the coroner and then I checked with R&I. There was no previous record on Andrew Robertson nor his wife, Marie. Ed and I continued questioning the various neighbors in the apartment building. Their stories all matched in every detail. The Robertsons had been known to argue quite frequently and quite loud. None of the neighbors could definitely say that they had ever heard Andrew Robertson threaten his wife. All of them volunteered it would be entirely possible. We went back to the interrogation room where we questioned the suspects for a full hour. Everything I've told you was the truth. Would you mind going over just once more? All right. We had our quarrels and our arguments. I guess some of them were pretty bad. But I'd never do a thing like this to Marie. You don't seem very upset about all this, Robertson. I'm not crying about it, if that's what you mean. I'm sorry she had to do it. I tried to stop her, but there was nothing I could do. You seem to be taking all this pretty well under the circumstances. I don't know if I can explain how I feel about it. You see, Marie and I weren't too happy the last couple of years. We've been married eight years, and I guess from the start we could never hit it off. Did you used to argue quite a bit? No, not at first we didn't. It just seemed that we've drifted apart the last couple of years. We seem to fight all the time over nothing at all. I honestly believe we fell out of love. Would you mind telling us again exactly what happened this afternoon? First of all, when I got up, I always liked to sleep in on Sundays. She asked me to go to the store. That started the argument. She knows I don't like to do the shopping. It seemed like she was always forgetting something and I'd have to go. Mm -hmm. When I got back from the store, she was making chicken fried steaks for dinner. She's putting the flour on the meat. We argued back and forth for a minute, and then she stepped into the living room. I went over and sat on the Davenport. Go on. We had a few more words, and she went over the small nightstand by the kitchen door and took out my army automatic that I kept in there. She backed up into the kitchen and pointed the gun at her head. Yeah. She said, this will end the argument once and for all. As I said, I was on the Davenport about 12 feet away from her. I yelled at her. What'd you say? I said, Marie, put that gun down. It's loaded. Before I could reach her, she pulled the trigger. Then what'd you do? I rushed over to her, but it was too late. She was dead. What happened then? We don't have a phone, so I rushed upstairs to the apartment right above us. Ted Carlton's. I asked him to phone for the police and the ambulance. Did you tell this Carlton about your wife? Yes, sir, I did. I told him she'd been shot. Then where'd you go? So just like I told you, at the apartment. I went back downstairs and waited in the living room for you people to get there. Did you go near your wife's body? No, sir, I didn't. Did you always keep that gun loaded? Yes, I did. I always kept it loaded and actuated with a shell in the chamber. But I kept the safety lock on. Marie knew how to operate the gun because I showed her for when I was out late. She wasn't strong enough to actuate it, but she could work the safety. Did your wife ever try to commit suicide before? No, sir, not to my knowledge. Mr. Robertson, are you sure that everything you've told us is the truth? It's the absolute truth, every word of it. Well, now, here's the way it looks to us. We think you killed your wife. I didn't. Let us lay a few things out for you. We talked to your friends and neighbors in the apartment house. We have people who testify to the fact that your wife was afraid that you might kill her. She told one man that. It isn't true. 
I don't know what she may have told somebody, but I didn't kill her. It's a known fact throughout the entire apartment building. You and your wife had violent quarrels. Kind of arguments from all reports could easily lead to something like this. I told you that we argued, but I didn't kill Marie. I couldn't do a thing like that. Mr. Robertson, we've made a preliminary investigation of your apartment. Now, you say your wife killed herself. Let me show you some of the flaws in your story. All I can say is that I've told you the truth. I didn't kill her. You told us that your wife went to the nightstand and got the gun. Yes, sir, that's right. How did she pick up the automatic? How do you mean? How did she take it from the drawer? Like anyone would pick up a gun by the butt. She picked it up like anybody who was going to use it. You're sure about that? Yes, sir, positive. She didn't touch anything but the butt? Well, she had part of her hand on the trigger. Yeah, we know that. But she didn't touch any other part of the weapon. No, sir, she did not. She didn't have time. Then how do you account for the fact that we found traces of flour on the barrel of the gun? Sure, she was flouring me. How did the flour get on the barrel? I don't know. Isn't it true that when you approached her with the automatic pointed at her, she tried to ward off the shot with her hand? Isn't that how the flour got on the barrel? No, sir, that isn't true. Now, you said that your wife was putting flour on some steaks. That's right. How do you account for the fact that we didn't find any flour on the butt of the gun where it belonged? Or on the drawer of the nightstand where you say she first picked up the automatic? I can't answer that. I don't know what all this means. Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that unless you've got some kind of explanation, we have to assume you're lying, that you killed your wife. I don't know how to explain all these things, but I didn't kill her. Mr. Robertson, you say you are an army man. Isn't that what you told us out at the apartment? Yes, sir. I was a sergeant in the army during the last war. What outfit were you with? I was an instructor in sidearm weapons at Santa Ana Army Air Base. Then you'd be somewhat of an authority on the Colt 45 caliber automatic pistol, wouldn't you? I guess I would, yes. That was one of the weapons I instructed in. You'd know all about the system of ejection employed by the Colt company on their 45 automatic? Yes, sir, I would. The empty casing ejects to the right, up, and back. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. In other words, if you were pointing a 45 at me and you pulled the trigger, the empty casing would eject to your right, up, and fall to the floor to the rear on your right side, is that right? Yes, sir, that's the way it would end up. You still maintain your wife shot herself? Yes, I do. Where was she standing when she pulled the trigger? As I told you before, in the kitchen. How was she standing? What do you mean? Which way was she facing? Let's see, facing me about three quarters. Yes, that's right, in the kitchen near the sink, facing out toward me. And where were you? On the Davenport in the living room, facing her. Now, bearing in mind what we've already discussed and agreed upon concerning the ejection system of a 45, how do you account for the fact that the empty casing was found in the living room, six feet, four inches from the kitchen? Well, let's see. I'll figure it for you. The empty casing should have been found on the floor of the kitchen somewhere to the right and rear of your wife. Isn't that about it? Well, I, I don't understand. Why are you trying to prove me guilty? I've told you and I swear to you, I didn't kill my wife. It would be a physical impossibility for that empty casing to have landed anywhere but in the kitchen if your wife had pulled the trigger of that automatic. Now, how about it? What can I say? Please believe what I'm telling you. I didn't do it. Not according to the evidence. I don't understand any of this. All right. Here's the way we've got it reconstructed. You had a quarrel. You got the gun. You met your wife at the doorway of the kitchen. You pointed the gun at her. She tried to ward it off with her left hand, leaving flour on the barrel of the gun. You fired, and the casing was thrown up and back to the right where it landed on the rug of the living room. The testimony of the neighbors, the flour on your wife's hand, the position of the empty casing. Robertson, you're it. I don't know why all those things are the way you say they are. We do. We don't believe your wife committed suicide. Come on, Ed. I certainly got him tapped. Yeah, with all that proof, and he still refuses to cop out. Yeah. Something doesn't jive. We had Gene Bechtel take Andrew Robertson's statement that his wife had committed suicide, a fact that he couldn't prove and that we could disprove. We had before us the final investigation. All physical evidence was taken to the crime lab for analysis. The photographs taken at the scene were developed and brought in for careful checking. Blotter tests were made to determine the distance of the gun from the victim when it was fired. Both Robertson and his deceased wife were fingerprinted, and latent prints details started to check them out. Two teams of men were sent out to talk with the close relatives of the two people. Sunday, March 9th, 7 p.m. We got a call from Lieutenant Lee Jones that he had the final results of his investigation. We went over to the second floor of the Central Station, the crime lab. Take a look at this. Picture of the 45 casing, huh? That's right. Take a close look at it. Right here, particularly. Yeah. Notice this one edge is a little indented here. Ejector marks? No, here are your ejector marks up here. You see? 
This indentation is something entirely different. What is it? You remember where you found this casing? Yeah, six feet four inches into the living room. That's right. We wondered how it could have been thrown that far by the ejector if the husband's story is true. The ejector didn't do that. I wondered too. On closer inspection, I noticed this indentation. Now, let me show you how this casing got there in the living room. Here's an identical 45 caliber cold empty casing. Yeah. We place it on the floor on a piece of linoleum, the same thickness as their kitchen linoleum. Now watch this. I'll step on it, hitting it from an angle. There's your answer to that one. Now, when the husband ran over to his wife's side, uh, what did he say he did? That's about the size of it. He stepped on the casing accidentally, certainly not caring about it at the moment, and it bounced out into the living room, just like a tiddlywink. Notice the casing now, the indentation. Check it against the photo. Yeah, it matches. Did the flower on the barrel of the gun, it was flower, by the way, did it figure in for you, fella? Well, we figured the wife was trying to ward off the gun when he pointed it at her. Certainly the logical deduction. Here's that shot of the kitchen out there. Mm -hmm. Notice the wastebasket here? Pretty full, isn't it? Yeah, we noticed that when we were out there. What you probably didn't notice was this. Here's a blow-up of just that section where the wastebasket was. Can you see what's on top of the stuff in the basket there? Yeah, looks like a flour sack. That's right, an empty flour sack. Now, figuring the position of the body in relation to that wastebasket when she dropped the gun, it fell from her hand, striking the wastebasket, bouncing off and landing on the floor where you found it. You said when she dropped the gun, you figure it was suicide? It's beginning to shape up that way, isn't it? There's no flower found on the butt of the gun. That part of the automatic didn't come in contact with the flower sack. Yeah, Lee, but she was flowering meat. There were no traces of it on her right hand, on the palm, just on the back. Checking the clothing, we found streaks of flour where she could have wiped her hands clean before picking up the gun. It doesn't look like he killed her. There's more here. As you know, we ran blotter tests to determine the distance of the gun from the body when it was fired. Shot a 45 caliber Colt from various distances before we got the right answer. Yeah. Here's the results of the tests. Found powder burns on the right side of the wife's head. This test shows that the gun was held approximately three inches from the right temple when it was fired. Mm -hmm. That's it. Here's the report from Leighton Prince. Smudges, one good thumbprint, right hand, belonged to Marie Robertson, indicating she was the last one to handle the weapon. That's about it, Lee? No, I've got some more for you. Now, this shot was taken facing the east wall of the kitchen. That's the wall that would be on anyone's left sitting on the Davenport in the front room. Wouldn't be possible to see that wall from the Davenport. You can see the back X where we located the slug. Mm -hmm. Relative to the position of the body, if she was standing, holding the gun at approximately a right angle with the side of the head, the bullet would come to rest approximately four inches below the crown of her head. To check out? The coroner says she was 5'4". The bullet was found at a height of five and one eighth, proving that she shot herself rather than anyone else doing it, judging from the inclination of the bullet. As you know, this is critical. Yeah. For what it's worth, the condition of the wound indicates that it was inflicted from extreme close range. A fair point when you consider that most people wouldn't submit to being shot from close range without a struggle, or unless taken by surprise. And from all reports, we know she wasn't. Well, that's it, fellas. That's all we have. Thanks, Lee. It's enough. Crime Lab Jones. Yeah, right here. Just a minute. Either one of you. Hey. This is Friday. Oh, hi, Harry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's it say? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Harry. Yes, it sure does. Right. Bye. Harry Fremont. He just left Marie Robertson's mother. What'd she have to say? Well, Fremont says she gave him a letter. He's on his way in with it, written by Marie Robertson. Says something about her taking her own life. Her mother says that the husband didn't do it. Says that the daughter's shown indication in the past of wanting to take her own life. I had about cinches it. Makes you feel kind of good, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Finding a man clear on a charge instead of having to hang him up. Yeah. Come on, Ed. Right. Where are you headed? Back cross street. Wait till I get my coat. I'll go with you. What for? I want to see him, too, when you tell him. On March 12th, the hearing was held in the office of the coroner, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that hearing. Dead body report, Form 311, was made out stating that the deceased, Marie Robertson, had committed suicide. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. The fourth largest city in the United States. It's still growing. Every year we get more of everything. Population, transportation, stores, crime, buildings, and more crime. More than 50,000 major crimes were committed last year alone. That means 50,000 criminals. They range from professional killers to petty thieves. A lot of them are experts. Every year they seem to get better at their jobs. And the better they get, the harder I work. I'm a cop. It was Tuesday, April 28th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of safe detail, burglary division. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Captain Wisdom. My name's Friday. It was 2.16 p.m. when we got back to the Hall of Justice, Superior Court, Department 38. On January 4th, the safe in the Grant Harrell building was burglarized. It took us weeks before we narrowed down the suspects to one man. He was an ex-con, a two-time loser. It took more weeks of interrogation, gathering evidence, long hours in the crime lab to build our case against him. It was a big job, a hard one. He was guilty. We were convinced of it. We had one step to go. It was the jury. We had to convince them. <laughs> I think we got him, Joe. Did you testify yet? This morning. How'd it work out? Physical evidence tied in perfectly, all six points. Jury impressed? Hard to tell. Buckley's got a smart lawyer. I was talking to the assistant DA. The case ought to go to the jury late today. What's coming up next? Now? I'm due back on the stand when this recess is over. <laughs> There's the bailiff. The Superior Court is again now in session. Remain seated. No smoking, please. record show that the jury, the defendant, and his counsel are present. The prosecution may proceed. If it please, Your Honor, I'd like to recall Leland Jones to the stand. Leland Jones, take the stand. Be seated. If I may, Your Honor, for the benefit of the record, state that Leland B. Jones has been duly sworn, that counsel for the defense has stipulated that he's a forensic chemist attached to the Scientific Investigation Division of the Los Angeles Police Department, and that he's qualified to testify as an expert in the case. Proceed. Mr. Jones, earlier today in this court, you heard the testimony to the effect that Conrad Buckley had identified these exhibits as his own. This wool jacket, this pair of trousers, and these shoes, did you not? I did. This morning, Mr. Jones, you pointed out these pertinent facts about these articles of clothing. First, People's Exhibit 1, the red paint smudges on the soles of the shoes. They match the paint on the ventilation pipe, which leads to the third floor of the Grant Herald building. Is that correct? That is correct. You further stated that the footprints left at the scene of the crime were made by a size 8 shoe with Cuban heels and metal taps on each toe. Is that correct? That's right. People's Exhibit 1. A pair of black shoes identified by the defendant as his own. They're stamped size 8, Cuban heels, metal taps on each toe. 
Mr. Jones, you're acquainted with the fact that on the night of January 4th, someone scaled the ventilator pipe to the third floor of the Grant Herald building, forcibly entered the attic of the building, gained access to an adjoining suite of offices, and there burglarized the safe. I'm acquainted with that fact. Is it possible that someone else other than the defendant could have burglarized that safe? In my opinion, no. On what do you base your conclusion? I base it on the application of the law of probabilities to such a case as this. Uh, would you explain that to the jury, please? Uh, first, um, uh, let's apply a set of figures to these facts. Let's say, conservatively, that one man in every hundred in this city wears a size 8 shoe with Cuban heels and metal taps on the shoes. And then, let's say that one man in every hundred has red paint smudges on the soles of his shoes. Same color and same texture as the paint from the building. Uh, further, let's estimate that one man in a hundred also wears ten ribs to the inch woven trousers and wool jacket woven twelve ribs to the inch. Let's also estimate that one man in a hundred carries a small piece of charred lath in his jacket. Then let's say that one man in a hundred carries in the cuffs of his trousers particles of plaster similar to the plaster in the attic of the Grant Herald building. What are the chances in that one man in this city other than the defendant could possess all six of these various items. That would be one chance in one trillion. Well, how do you arrive at that figure, Mr. Jones? Well, simply by multiplying 100 by itself six times over. You mean only one man in one trillion other than the defendant could have burglarized the safe on the third floor of the Grand Herald building? That's correct. One trillion. Can you give the jury something to compare that figure with? That's more people than have lived on Earth since the beginning of time. <laughs> Lee Jones was the last witness to testify in the case of the state versus Conrad Buckley. For the rest of the afternoon, the defense lawyer and the assistant DA delivered their summations. The defense lawyer was eloquent and colorful. He spoke for more than an hour and threw up every possible smoke screen he could think of to disguise the facts of the case. The assistant DA reviewed again the six points of physical evidence clearly defined. At five minutes to five that afternoon, the case went to the jury. We were expecting a quick verdict. We didn't get it. The jury was locked up for the night, and we went home. The Superior Court, State of California, N for the County of Los Angeles, is now in session. The Honorable John Edwards, judge presiding. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? Yes, Your Honor, we have. Hand me the verdict. Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles People versus Conrad Buckley. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant not guilty. No talking back there, please. So say you want to so say all. Is this your verdict? It is. Record the verdict. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I've been a judge for 26 years. For the past 14 years, I've presided in this particular court. May I say now that this is the worst miscarriage of justice I have ever witnessed. After hearing your verdict in this case, I can arrive at only one conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, either you are innately dishonest or you are complete morons. Court's adjourned. As soon as possible, the district attorney's office began exploring the personal life and background of each one of the 12 jurors. They contacted their neighbors, their friends, their acquaintances. They checked back 10 years in the lives of every one of them. They found nothing. The jury was indifferent. They wouldn't follow the case. Well, all the facts were there, Lee. None of the jurors were fixed. The DA's office found out that much. Why wouldn't they follow the case? A lot of people think they're doing their city a big favor when they serve on a jury. Uh -huh. They figure all they have to do is sit in the jury box for a few days, mark a ballot as fast as they can, and then leave. Beats me. They pay the taxes. They pay for these trials. They can follow the technical case closely if they want to. A lot of them aren't that conscientious. They don't think it means money in their pockets, so they don't care. We went through hell on this thing. Four months to catch him, three months to prove him guilty. And the jury blew it. You want my opinion, Lee? I think it stinks. You don't have an opinion, Joe. You're a cop. The 
case of Conrad Buckley became just another item filed away with hundreds of thousands of others in the record bureau of the Los Angeles Police Department. Six days after he was acquitted, he left the city and a few weeks later was reported in Baltimore, Maryland. After that, he dropped from sight. Summer came, autumn, Christmas, New Year's. On Wednesday morning, Ed and I checked in for work as usual. What's the date, Ed? Wednesday, February 1st. Thank you. Your mother get over that cold, Joe? Yeah, finally. How about your kid? Nah, he's okay. Wife's got one now. Hi. Morning, Ed. Hi. Got a minute? Yeah. Cutter Printing Company was robbed last night. How much? There's the crime report. 14,500. Yeah, it's a big haul. The most familiar, climbed a drain pipe to the roof, kicked in a skylight. Yeah. Conrad Buckley's back in town. I think it might add up. Could be. Sounds like it. There's one sure way to make him, put him in small words and big type. I don't know how to make it any more positive than the last time. I don't know if that Greek with a lamp ever found an honest man, but get the guy. <laughs> Ed and I drove out to the Cotter Printing Company and spent the rest of the morning and most of that afternoon checking into the $14,000 safe burglary. We examined the office where the burglary took place and the smashed skylight where the thief entered. We traced his path from the time he got into the building to the time he left. No fingerprints, no leads. How many safe men you know that work like Buckley? Well, let's see. There's Hagen. He works about the same, but he's up at Q. Walters, he operates like Buckley. He's doing time, too. Anybody else? No, not that I can think of. All right, find Buckley. Find out where he lives, who his friends are, where he eats. Find out what he's doing. You want us to tail him? Give him plenty of room. When you get the dope on him, we'll have a squad of men tail him alternately. All right. Where do we start? The Manchester Bar, down on Central Avenue, near 5th. When was he there last? Monday. First night he got in town. Might be his favorite spot. Okay. Anything else? I hear Buckley's learned a new trick since he's been away. Yeah. Carries a gun. That night, Ed and I started down into the south end of the city to find Conrad Buckley. First stop was Comanche's bar. Buckley didn't show. The next night was the same. And the night after that, no sign. On the fourth night, at 10 minutes past 8 p.m., Saturday, February 4th, Ed spotted Buckley entering. We waited. At 25 minutes past midnight, Buckley came out the main entrance with a blonde woman on his arm. He walked unsteadily. The two of them got into a gray car and sat there talking. What's the license number, Joe? Nine Robert 702. Want to get a make? Yeah. Control one, request a rolling make in the three column. Nine Robert 702. Nine Robert 702. Roger, 80K. Stand by. KMA 367. It's a nice looking car. Yeah, if it's his. Might pan out if we're lucky. Control 1 to 80K. Come in. 80K to Control 1. Go ahead. 9 Robert 702. Car registered to Mrs. Conrad Buckley. 939 South Norwich Road, Beverly Hills. 80K to Control 1. Roger. KMA 367. <laughs> What does that prove? It proves he's supporting a new car and a wife. Let's find out how. One twenty-two a.m. We trail Buckley and the blonde woman we figured to be his wife to 939 South Norwich Road in Beverly Hills. We waited. At 3 a.m., Ed called Captain Wisdom and a couple of men were sent out to relieve us. By Friday of that week, February 10th, we had his movements fairly well established. We turned all the information we had over to Captain Wisdom and he assigned a crew of eight men to tail the suspect constantly in alternate shifts. The trap was set. 6 p.m. Tuesday, February 14th. I'll get it. 
Friday talking. Yeah, Captain. What's up? Uh huh? Yeah, right. Buckley, he's making a move. We left the city hall and drove out to the site of the stakeout near Buckley's home on South Norwich Road. Captain Wisdom was there waiting for us. He left his place alone. He was on foot. Bergen Marconi tailed him to a bar. That's where he lost him. And he hasn't come back to his place? No, not yet. I could have hunched you well. His car's still there. Yeah. And we can shake him down. If he's been out on a cable tonight, he should have whatever he stole with him. Uh -huh. Car there in the driveway? No. Check the license. Uh -huh. Nine Robert 702. That's Buckley's car. There's somebody coming out of the house. His wife? Looks like it. Does she know either one of you? No. Follow her. Yeah, let's go in. Miss OK, can you see the door from here? Yeah, this is fine. It's her move. Let's sweat it out. The blonde woman entered the apartment house at 1261 Wilcox Avenue at 14 minutes past 11 p.m. At five minutes past midnight, she came out and got in her car. A man was with her. Buckley. Must be the hideout. You two follow them. When they get to the house, shake them down. What about you? I'll check the apartment. Meet you back at the office. Right. At 21 minutes past midnight, Ed and I pulled up at the Buckley home at 939 South Norwich Road. We waited until Buckley and his wife got in the house. Then we went in and shook them down. We found nothing. We searched the house, the garage, and the car. The same. Nothing. Yeah, all right. You can put your stuff away. Place is clean, Joe. Nothing. Right. Didn't I tell you? I'm clean. You haven't got one thing on me. I'm clean. It's a nice car you're driving, Buckley. Is it yours? That's right. I like nice things. They cost money. What does not When'd you get back in town? Last week. Why? What are you doing with your time? Morris Cabinet Company. I'm a journeyman carpenter. When do you work? Nights. Good job. Believe me, I'm legit. All right, you stay that way and we won't have any trouble. Ed and I left Buckley's house, drove back to the office and checked in with Captain Wisdom. He told us that he had talked with a manager of the apartment house at 1261 Wilcox Avenue. Buckley was renting apartment 7A in the building under the name of James E. Wilson. On the average, he used the apartment only once or twice each week. The rent was $75 a month. What'd you find in the apartment, Captain? He keeps two complete changes of clothes in the closet. The rest of the place is empty except for one thing, set of burglary tools. Yeah. Found them under a false bottom drawer. Set of safe jimmies, small sledge, the works. Then he works out of the apartment, huh? He's getting cagey, or he thinks he is. After a job, he probably comes back to the apartment, gets rid of his work clothes, and figures he's pretty safe. Well, then all we have to do is keep an eye on that apartment. The next time he pulls a job, we grab him. That's right. The next time we pick him up, it's going to be for keeps. That depends on the jury, doesn't it? 3 a.m. that morning, Wisdom ordered a stakeout at 1261 Wilcox Avenue. The stakeout on his home also continued. During the next week, the suspect was seen to come and go from his home, and on two occasions, he visited his apartment during the daylight hours. No suspicious moves on his part were reported. The stakeout went on. Five weeks later, on March 22nd, the safe in the offices of Butterfield and Crucian Wholesale Grocers was burglarized of $7,500. That afternoon, Wisdom, Ed, and I met with Lieutenant Lee Jones in the crime lab. It's cyclohexane, a coal tar product. Well? It's colorless and it's odorless. When it's rubbed into the surface of an object, it's invisible to the naked eye. Well, what about it, Lee? It's a crystalline hydrocarbon, slightly soluble in ether or alcohol. Uh-huh. Well, here, let me show you this cloth. I help you, Lee? Yeah, will you, Joe? And there. Dust it on here. Now, can you see or feel anything at all? No. Seems to disappear. You can't feel anything. You can. Oh. Ed? No. 
Sure, nothing on it. Captain, there. you want to catch that light, please? Sure. Have a look. How about that? Seems to glow. Yeah. Hmm. Will this stuff rub off, Lee? Try it. Now look at your hands. Nothing harmful in that stuff? No. How long will this stuff stay on, Lee? Maybe as long as 24 hours. Only shows up under that ultraviolet lamp, huh? That's right. Well, does it work on everybody? It'll work on Buckley. Ten minutes later, Wisdom put in a call to the two men on stake out at Buckley's apartment on Wilcox Avenue. They reported that the apartment was empty. Buckley hadn't been near it since early the day before. At 6 p.m. that night, Lee Jones, Ed and I went to the apartment, let ourselves in with a pass key, and went to work with two jars of cyclohexane. We dusted it on everything in sight, on Buckley's clothes, his shoes, his hat, and on the set of burglary tools which we found in the false bottom drawer. We rubbed it in until it was invisible. We arranged everything exactly the way we found it. Then we went back to the office. Lee Jones had a portable ultraviolet light set up for immediate use. Wisdom alerted communications to pass along immediately all reports of burglaries throughout the city. We waited. At midnight, we went out in ships for sandwiches and coffee. The watch kept on. 2.30 a.m. I got it. Wisdom. Yeah? Thanks. Harvard and Wilshire Boulevard. Safe job? Two of them. Call Lee Jones. I'll meet you downstairs. Right. What do you think? We'll let the lamp tell us. Bergstrom, keep the storefront clear. Ten feet on either side. Anything, Lee? You'll know in a minute. Okay, Bob. All right, we can try it. I'll get the light, Lee. Buckley's house, Lee Jones directed the photographer to stay at the scene of the burglary and take photographs of the telltale cyclohexane prints and all other pertinent photographs for use in court. At eight minutes past 4 a.m., we walked into Buckley's living room. Uh, now, look, this is kind of getting on my nerves. It's four in the morning. Ed, outlet's right down there. Right. Who is all that stuff? What's that you got? Okay. Okay, Joe, the light. What's this all about, anyway? Look at yourself. What are you doing to me? What is all this stuff? Like a Christmas tree. Yeah. I don't have to take this stuff. You haven't got anything on me. You had me in court once before, and you had to turn me loose. Yes, we had you in court, and I can tell you every move you made in that case. Yeah? You tell me if I'm wrong. You climbed the back of the Grand Herald building using some pipes as supports. You crawled across the roof on your hands and knees to the firewall. You raised up a couple of times to see if everything was clear. You went over the firewall, leaving impressions of your coat and trousers. One of the coat buttons was scratched, so you went over stomach down. You then went to the front of the building, walking in a crouched position to see if there were any police cars in the vicinity. Then you returned to the skylight. How am I doing? Keep talking. You removed the glass from the skylight, crawled through the entrance, kicked a hole through a plaster wall into the attic. You broke some of the charred laths so that you could crawl through the attic, 
to an opening in the office of the Grant Herald building. Then you opened the safe and took out $1,250. Is that right? No, I took $1,350. Okay. You give me a couple hours and I'll tell you what you did on this case. Here's your coat. Yeah. What about my clothes? They're all ruined. By the time you need them again, they'll be out of style. All right, come on. Let's go. On October 15th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 84, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of first-degree burglary. Due to his previous convictions, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Two million taxpayers. They pay firemen to protect them from fire. They pay doctors to protect them from disease. Judges to protect their rights. They pay me to protect them from themselves. I'm a cop. Thursday, September 6th, I was working the day watch at a homicide division. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. I checked out of the office and gone home. I received an urgent phone call to report to the San Fernando building, main entrance. I got there as fast as I could. It was an emergency. serve notice. Well, how do you mean? Says he's going to jump at 10 o'clock. Who's standing by after his cover? Fractal and Wiseman. They saw the crowd gathering in the street on the way back from dinner. They looked up and saw the guy on the ledge and they came right up. Well, how long's the guy been standing out there? About 15 minutes now. Sure drawing a great crowd. A lot of people down there, aren't there? Fred? Uh, the office right here. How's it standing out back? Well, he's still out there ready to jump. We got about 22 minutes to figure out how to stop him. Pretty big out on it. I'll let the doctor tell you. Go ahead. Where did Dr. Turner go? We went down to meet Dr. Wright. He's bringing him right up. This is Captain Lorman, homicide. Miss Lenahan. How are you? How do Sergeant you? Friday, Officer Lockwood. Here's how he climbed outside. This window right here. Right now he's standing on that ledge out there. The ledge is about 14 inches wide. No other windows closer to him? Yeah. The one in the adjoining office there, but it's jammed. Didn't want to break the glass. Freddy might scare him off. You try to talk him out of it, get him back inside? Yeah, we had a turn at it. Wiseman crawled out on the ledge, so did I. He's one of the queerest jumpers I've come across. How do you mean? He got a hammer with him, carpenter's hammer. Whenever you get close to him, he takes a cut at you. Wiseman wasn't looking for it, had to duck fast, he almost went over. No other way to reach him? Well, double check the whole layout, this window's the closest. How about lowering a man from the roof? A yeah, wide piece of cornice up there, big overhang. Put a man down the rope, he'd be hanging three feet from the side of the building. Wouldn't come close to the guy. What about this doctor you mentioned back? Figure he can help? That might be worth a try. Miss Lenahan? Yes, Sergeant? You saw it happen, you know better than I do what Dr. Turner's idea is. Would you fill these men in, please make it brief? Surely. Well, this man on the ledge, who is he, do you know? Walter Harrison's his name. He's one of the doctor's patients. His sister brought him in for a routine checkup. How old is the man? Forty-one. His sister told us he'd been complaining of a backache lately. While the doctor was examining him, Mr. Harrison flared up all of a sudden. He yelled out we were trying to cripple him, that we wanted to kill him. Excuse me, please. Dr. Turner's office. Yes. 
Well, we're still here. We have an awful lot of trouble. Yes, all right, thank you. Never seen such a madhouse. What happened after Harrison started to act up, Miss Lenahan? Well, Dr. Turner and I tried to hold him. He shoved the spove out of the way. He hit the doctor in the face. Then he ran out to that window and got on that ledge, crawled along the side of the building. He's been there ever since. Was Harrison a mental case? Yes, has been for 10 years. He's been in and out of the state hospital a couple of times. His sister Ruth's been taking care of him since the accident. Accident? Yes, his wife and daughter were killed in an auto smash. His sister can tell you more about it. Where is she now? Next door, the treatment room. Thelma, that's the other nurse. She's looking after Miss Harrison. She's pretty close to hysteric. Try to talk to her, Skipper. Not much help so far. Uh -huh. You say the doctor's been treating this Mr. Harrison nurse? No, he just came in for a physical checkup. Dr. Reich's been handling his mental condition. That's where Dr. Turner is now getting Reich. He has an office in the next building. What time you got, Bill? Getting short, 19 minutes to 10. How about the time element, Beck? If he's gonna kill himself, why is he waiting until 10 o'clock to do it? Got me. He scribbled a note out there, threw it down the street. One of the men the rescue squad grabbed it and brought it up. I got it right here. Let's see, Joe. Mm -hmm. They want my life. They want me... What's this next one? I can't make it out. Dead. They want me dead. Yeah. I'd like to pray first. I'll jump at 10 o'clock. I can't make this last thing out, Bill, with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, 10 o'clock. Don't touch my body. Yeah, that's it. Don't touch my body. You saw the man at close range back. What do you think, so serious? I don't know. I'm not even going to guess. How about me going out there and talking to him, Skipper? Might work. Won't do any harm. Ledge is 14 inches wide. If you slip, I don't want to explain to your wife and kid. Well, how about me giving it a try? A jumper case last October. I was on that one. Volunteer to me, Joe. I'm not going to argue. You know the risk. I'll watch it. Bill, you want to stand by at the window here? Yeah, okay. Be careful. Right. Joe. Yeah. Don't forget about that hammer the guy's got. It's just a guess. Yeah, what's that? The guy might want to die. I don't think he wants to do it alone. 9.43 p.m. If we could take Walter Harrison's word for it, we had exactly 17 minutes to talk him into a change of mind before he plunged to his death on the pavement nine stories below. I crawled out of the window and started inching my way along the narrow ledge. slow. I kept my eyes on Harrison. He stood about 10 feet away from me, looking down at the crowds jamming the streets below. I edged along to within eight feet of him. He didn't seem to notice me. Why do you want 
want to kill yourself. You're only going to hurt people. You don't care about people. You don't care about me. Well, then what am I doing out here? You got it wrong, Walter. A lot of people care about you. They want you back inside. They want you where it's safe. You're another one of those. You want to get your hands on me. You want to grab me. Well, you're not. I'm going to kill you. That's all right, Walter. You can kill me. I want to help you first. Stay back there. Don't move anymore. Got this hammer. I'll smash your face with it. I'll smash it. I only want to talk to you, Walter. I know we can straighten this out now. Well, do it my way. Understand? My way. I know you are. You've been after me before. I know what it's all about. I know you do, Walter, but you got it wrong. Now, look, you're going to jump off this building at 10 o'clock. That's in 15 minutes. That's right. You bet I am. All right, now. Let me talk to you for five of those minutes, huh? Can't do any harm. I'm not going to hurt you. How about it, okay? Or should I talk to you? Because I care about you. I care about what happens to you. So does your sister. So do a lot of people. When I mean, you're like a lot of people, you want to get your hands on me. Get those animals down there, a whole dirty pack of them. You want to grab on them, get around close, put their hands on me. Well, they're not going to do it. Of course they're not. Nobody's going to hurt you. You know that, don't you? Bet your life they're not. See that dirty pack down there? They don't know it, but I'm going to jump right through them. I'm going to jump right through all of them. They can touch me. And do it right now. Now, wait a minute, Walter. Don't forget your promise. What are you talking about? What promise? Ten o'clock. You wrote it down yourself. You said you wouldn't jump until it was ten o'clock, didn't you? Well, that was no promise. I just wrote it down. That's all. Ten o'clock. Well, your sister believed it. We gave her the note. She says you promised. You're going to make a liar out of yourself now? You're the liar. Ruth didn't say that. She didn't say it was a promise. You don't have to take my word. Come on, Walter. Let's go and ask her. How about it? See Ruth? Inside? Yeah, sure. Let's ask her. Now, come on, Walter. Take my hand, huh? All right. I'll take your hand. Watch your step. Look out. Get back there. Get back. Next time I won't miss. I'll smash your whole arm. I think you're pretty smart, don't you, trying to trick me. I told you before, I know who you are. Trying to get your hands on me. You promised your sister, Walter. Ten o'clock. You still gonna break that promise? Like you and that pack down there. I don't break promises. Everybody knows that, Walter. They trust you. Now, how about talking this thing out, huh? What time is it? 9.46. 14 minutes to go, Walter. You're lying. How do I know that's the time? Well, here. You look at my watch right here. See? Take a look at it. Stand back. I told you before. Stay away from me. Just wanted to show you the time, that's all. Got my own watch. I'll keep track of the time, all right? I don't need you. Okay. You don't mind if I talk to you while you wait, do you? There's that plane again. What's it doing up there? Just an airliner, probably on its way into Burbank. Not fooling me. That plane's been by before. Flying low, too. Well, I guess I didn't notice it. What difference does it make anyway, huh, Walter? Well, I'd probably watch it flying back and forth. Maybe the police. They're trying to do something. Yeah. Put their hands on me. Yeah, sure, Walter. Could be their plane. It's a big one. Sure, they're trying to do something. I'm coming right by here, flying low. Same one. Look, right there on the wing. What's that, Walter? Number, right there on the wing. Same one. Passed over a few minutes ago. I'm going to kill you. Thought you tricked me. Didn't know I had my pocket knife. I can kill you with it now. I can kill you right now. I told you before, Walter. That's all right. Look out. Watch your step there, will you? Put your hand there, see? Could have killed you. Look at your hand. Sorry, Walter. It's not your fault. I just wanted to talk the whole thing over to tell you how your sister feels about it. You're a liar. I knew it when I looked at you. Now, get away. Get away before I kill you. There's only one thing I can tell you, Walter. Your sister Ruth's sitting inside. She's worried sick. She's waiting for you. She wants to take you home. Now, how about it? There's no reason for all this. You know that, don't you? Do I? Sure you do. Your sister and your family, they care about you. They want you home again. They want you with them. There's no reason to be standing out here now, is there? Wait till 10 o'clock, mister. Yeah? I'll give you a reason. 9.48 p.m., 12 minutes left. I made my way along the ledge through the window back into the office. Dr. Reich, the man who'd been treating Walter Harrison for his mental sickness, was already there with Dr. Turner. While the nurse bandaged my hand, Captain Lorman, Bill, and I talked with him. I've been treating Harrison for ten years on and off, I guess. He's shown some improvement, not much. Definite paranoid tendencies. Did he ever do this before, Dr. Reich? Not to my knowledge. His sister can tell you more. I don't know what to advise you to do. He's never been this violent before, using a hammer, a knife. There's one thing I got to know, Doctor. Is it worth letting another one of my men go out on that ledge? I'm afraid that's your decision, Captain. It may help, it may not. I know the patient, but I can't read his mind. I was just thinking, Doctor, we could bring Harrison's sister to the window, let her talk to him. You think that might help? Very possibly it might. In a spot like this, I'm in the same boat you are. It's all guesswork. Do you think Harrison's really going to be ready to jump at 10 o'clock? From what you tell me, yes, I think he will. 
sure got to come up with something. We can't just stand around and let a guy dive down nine stories. I wish I knew the answer. There's got to be one someplace. There's got to be an answer. Yeah, we'll check your watch. We got ten minutes to find it. duty of the peace officer to protect the lives of the citizens of the community in which he serves. That isn't always limited to protecting the citizens from criminals and lawbreakers. Oftentimes the citizen has to be protected from himself. The drunken driver can do as much harm to his own person as he can to others. The same for the narcotic addict. The same for mental incompetence like Walter Harrison. If he was being assaulted, robbed, or shot at by a gunman, it would have been no more serious. Harrison's life was in jeopardy. Trying to save him had to be the first consideration, even if it meant death for one of the officers. 9.50 p.m., Gene Bechtel inched his way out on the ledge of the ninth story and kept Walter Harrison busy talking, anything to keep his mind off the jump. Skipper? Yellow. Just check with the rescue squad down on the street. They're worried about trying a net. Yeah. They're not guaranteeing anything. What do you mean? Well, they're afraid of those ledges jutting out from the building every other floor. They say if Harrison jumps close enough, he's bound to hit one of them. Yeah. If he does, he'll be dead before he reaches street level. That down there won't do him any good. Nothing we can do about it. Something else we've got to hand over to luck. They come up with any ideas? Well, just one sounds like it might work. What's that? They figured like we did. The overhang on the roof is too wide to lower a man directly down on top of Harrison to grab him. Yeah. They think it might work if they get a man in a rope sling, put him out through the window just above Harrison, lower him down as close as possible without tipping it, give him a good line, let him try to rope Harrison. I don't know. They got any candidates to try? Yeah, one. The guy's been on the rescue squad for years. Supposed to be an expert with a lasso. I do it, I don't know. What happens if he misses Harrison? Who knows? What happens if Harrison jumps? Captain Lawton. Yes, how's Harrison's sister? Feeling better. She'd like to see you right away. Thanks. Where are the men from rescue squad now? Standing by. I got their equipment with them. Tell them to hang on. I got an idea. Right, Skipper. Right. right. Miss Harrison, I'm Captain Lorman. Sorry. He's still all right, isn't he? They're not lying to me, he isn't John No, Jay. no, he's all right. I've tried to do everything I could for him, officer. Nursed him ten years. I thought he was getting better. I've, I've nursed him ever since the accident. Yes, ma'am. When his wife was killed, and baby too. Auto accident. He couldn't get over it. Just never could. Kept thinking about it. Said it was all planned. People were after him. They wanted him dead too. It was just terrible. I tried to help. We haven't got much time, ma'am. Now, can you tell me this? Does your brother still have any strong attachments? I mean, for his family, friends, certain things he might like? Well, I, I'm the only one that's been close to Walter. No other relatives. I, I know he trusts me. Nothing else he's attached to? A hobby of some kind? Maybe a household pet? We've got a fox terrier, Chip. Walter's very fond of Chip. All right, miss, I'll lay it out for you. It's got to go fast. We're lucky we're going to have one more chance to grab your brother before he jumps. We'll need all the help you can give us. Anything, officer. We've got some men upstairs, and they're going to make another try to grab your brother off of that ledge. It'll be our last chance. You'll have to hold his attention while we try it. What do you want me to do? An officer will take you in the elevator down to the street. There's a PA system down there, and I want you to talk to your brother. He'll be able to hear you. Sympathize with him. Talk to him about anything. Home, family, friends, anything that appeals to him. But keep talking. Keep his mind off jumping. All right? Yes, I... I think I understand. What time you got, Joe? Five minutes to ten. Skipper, Joe, can I see you? Excuse us, Miss Harrison. Yes. I just got off that ledge in a hurry. He came at me with that knife. You any closer to the window? No, backed off again. Something else. That watch of his? Yeah. He seems to be going by it. It's five minutes fast, according to mine. Yeah. He thinks it's ten o'clock. 9.55 p.m. Metropolitan Division rushed a power megaphone to the scene. Gene Bechtel took Walter Harrison's sister, Ruth, down in the elevator to the street. While Bechtel held the bullhorn, Ruth Harrison started talking to her brother. Word was passed to the special detail of men from the fire department's rescue squad standing by on the floor above. They went to work. Captain Lorman went upstairs to help in the operation. Bill and I waited in the office on the ninth floor. The nurse, Miss Lenahan, was with us. 9.57 p.m. The firemen started to lower the man from the rescue squad in a rope sling. He held a double-strength lasso in his hands. I looked from the window along the narrow ledge. Walter Harrison stood erect and motionless, an open pocket knife in one hand, his feet poised in the brink of a nine-story jump. The voice of Harrison's sister drifted up from the loudspeaker down in the street. Walter, this is Ruth, Walter. 
Can you hear me? This is Rose. I want you to come home with me, Walter. Please. You've got to understand there's nothing wrong. No one's going to hurt you. We want to help you, Walter. Please. There's nothing to be afraid of. You know this, don't you? Come home with me. Please, I'll take care of you. I'll see that you're all right and safe. Nobody's going to hurt you, but leave. These people are your friends, Walter. They want to help you. Can you hear me, Walter? They want to help you. They're your friends. You can trust me. Just hit the roof. You've got to trust me, Walter. I want to take care of you. I want to take you home to Chipper and all our old friends in the neighborhood. They care about you, Walter. They care about what happens to you. Oh, Walter, you're just mixed up, that's all. Let me tell the truth, Walter, please. Can you hear me, Walter? Sister's doing all right. She's got his attention anyway. It'll finish it sure if he looks up. Hope it keeps on. Looks like it might rain, though. Was that overcast? No, it just smog, Joe. I hope you're right. Rain will make this ledge as slippery as glass. Oh, that's small. How's Harrison reacting? Can you see? Yeah, he's looking down, not moving at all. Keep your fingers crossed. Missed him, Joe. Waller, wait a minute, Harrison! Get away from me! Pull that man up, pull him out of the way! That does it, a clean miss. It's the only still on that ledge, I'm going out. Joe, wait a minute. Yeah? It's only a chance. Yeah? Why don't you try to get him mad at you, say anything, and sell him? All right, I'll try. Anything to make him go for you. If you can get him down by this window, I can grab him. If I get him by the window, I'll hold on to him. And when you grab him, lean as close to the building as you can. You know, there's not much to lean on the other way, is there? through the window and out onto the ledge. Harrison still had his eyes fixed on the pavement nine stories beneath us. He waved his arms and shouted at the crowd below. In his left hand, he still held that open pocket knife. It started to rain. You're not gonna get your hands on me? Not even gonna get close! Wait a minute, Harrison, watch it. You watch me, mister. I'm gonna jump right through him down there. Just watch me. Wait a minute, I got a message for you from your sister Ruth. Don't you wanna hear it? You won't get your hands on me, none of you. I'll see you later, mister. You won't jump, Harrison. You haven't got the guts. What? You heard me. You're not kidding anybody. You don't think I can, huh? Just watch me. Sure, anybody can jump. Any phony can do that. Huh? That doesn't take anything. Those people down on the street there. Any one of them could do that. You're just like them. I still got this knife. I used it before. I can kill you. You couldn't kill anything. You haven't got the guts. You're a phony. You liar, you rotten liar. I cut you to pieces. You talk big, Harrison. You're all talk. I can cut you to pieces. You haven't got me fooled, mister. Not for a minute. Cut your pieces! You haven't got half the nerve. You're a phony and you know it. Rotten liar! Stand still! Go on, I'll show you! Talk a good game. That's about all. You're all talk. I'll show you! I still have my knife. I'll kill you right now! Yeah, sure. You're backing away. You're afraid! You're a phony, Harrison. Nobody's afraid of a phony. I'll cut you up good. All right, I'm waiting for you. Come on. What's the matter, Harrison? You're not waiting. Stand still. Stop backing away. Stop! Come on and get me. Haven't you got enough nerve? You're just talking again, huh? All talk. That window. You gotta stop there. I'll cut you to pieces. All right, Harrison. Here. Now go ahead. Prove you're a phony. Liar! I'll show you a liar! It looked like you were both going over the side. Smog. <laughs> On 
On September 10th, the sanity hearing was held at the county hospital, psychopathic ward, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that hearing. The patient was examined by three psychiatrists appointed by the court and adjudged mentally incompetent. had escaped from the state prison at Chino, California. We knew they were both armed, both dangerous. The report said they were coming our way. We had to be waiting for them. Morning, Joe. Oh, hi, Crowley. What's doing? Any word in those escaped prisoners? Nothing this morning, no. Captain would like to see you right away, Joe. Okay, has Ben checked in yet? No, he hasn't. It's getting a little late, so it must have held him up, huh? Captain wants to see you right away, some bad news. Well, what's about, do you know? Maybe it's better if he told you. Okay. I'll check you later. Oh, morning, Joe. Morning, Captain. You want to see me? Yeah, come on in, sit down. Got some bad news, Joe, real bad. Oh, what about? I know how much it means. I wish I didn't have to be the one to tell you. Well, tell me what? I'm sorry, Joe. It's about Ben. Something's happened. Ben? What do you mean? We heard about it early this morning. I thought about calling you. Figured it'd be better if I told you in person. What's the matter? Ben's sick? He's dead, Joe. Ben's dead early this morning. What? Yeah. Sorry. Heart attack happened a little after 6 o'clock this morning. Oh, no. Got out of bed, started dressing to go to work. Went downstairs, put a pot of coffee on, make some toast. His wife heard him fall. She went downstairs. She found him already dead. He went fast. I don't get it. It couldn't be. I'm sorry, Joe. It means a lot to all of us. No, I don't get this. Ben didn't have any trouble with his heart. He never mentioned anything about that. Maybe that was the trouble. It was his heart, all right. When his wife found him, she called the doctor and the fire department rescue squad. They worked over him for about an hour. No use. Then his wife called me enough to tear your heart out. I can't believe it. What did she say? She didn't break up. Too shocked to realize it, I guess. Sounded apologetic. She said, I'm sorry, Captain. This is Mrs. Romero. Ben died this morning. Thought you ought to know. Ben's dead. This is terrible. It's a lousy shame. She kept saying the same thing over again. I'm sorry. Ben's dead. I thought you ought to know. Ben's dead. I tried to talk to her. Wasn't much use. Excuse me. I'm sorry. You were with him a long time. Yeah, 11 years. The day I came on the job, they assigned me as his partner. It's a tough one. It's hard to believe. It's tough on his wife. Well, if it's all right with you, I'd like to go out and see her. All right. I wish I could give you the day off, Joe. I know what it means to you. The escaped convicts thing, I just can't spare you. Oh, it's all right. I'd just soon work. I figure I ought to talk to Amy, though, his wife. I'd help take the edge off it for her, huh? Sure, go ahead. Joe. Yeah? I know what it is. I've been on the job 19 years. I've lost two partners, good cops. One of them was killed in the line of duty. The other one worked at his job until he dropped. It's the same, Joe. Yeah. In my book, they're both rape medals. I thought about what I was going to say to his wife. I thought about his little boy. I thought about them. Eleven years I'd been working as a cop, and all of a sudden it wasn't the same anymore. I thought about the first day I met Ben. I was a rookie. I remembered what he taught me. I thought about what I owed him. I thought about thousands of cops just like him all over the country. The ones that came before us, the ones that'll take our place. I thought about their lives, what they meant, what their jobs meant. I thought about Ben. Eleven years. Steak 
workshops, the early morning watch, interrogations, office duty. You could cover it in volumes or write it on the back of an envelope. He was a good cop. He was a good friend. There wasn't much else to say. It was a big loss. I went over to Ben's house for about an hour and I talked to his wife. I told her to call me if she needed anything. Then I checked back in at the office for work. Temporarily, Officer Frank Smith was assigned to work with me. The big problem at the moment was a pair of escaped convicts. Smith and I drove out to run down a possible lead. 11.05 a.m., we got to the address listed, the Cathedral of St. Augustine. We checked at the rectory. services. No, that's the order. It's probably just practicing. Easter Ham sure sounds pretty, doesn't it? Yeah, they do. Then he takes me back. That's it. Never believe it, Joe. I used to be a boy town. Mm -hmm. Sorry to keep you waiting. Telephone. Are you Father Moon? Yes. Come in, please. Thank you. The police officer's father. I see. My partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? How do you do, sir? My name's Friday. How do you do? I'd like to talk to you a few minutes if you have some time, Father. Uh, of course. Sit down, gentlemen. Thank you. So we're inquiring about a Jack Blaine, Father, and we understand you know him quite well. Oh, yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I read about him in the paper this morning, the trouble he's in. Is that what you wanted to talk about, Sergeant? Yes, sir. We're making a check on all his known friends and relatives. Oh, very unfortunate, wasn't it? Did the newspapers get the story correct? Yes, sir, I'm afraid so. When was the last time you heard from Jack Lane, Father? I think it's been three years at least, maybe longer. I don't think I've heard from him since he went to prison. Blaine never wrote to you? None of his family ever contacted you? His mother dropped by to see me once, I think it was about a year ago. That's the last I heard of the Blaines. Too bad. But would you have any idea where his mother's living now? Not offhand, no. I could check in the parishioner's book. We might have an address for her. If you wouldn't mind, Father. Certainly a tragedy, I mean, happening at Easter time. I'll remember the boy in my mass tomorrow. Lord knows he can use some prayers. Yes, sir, I guess he can. How about Blaine's friends and relatives, Father? I mean, besides his mother, do you happen to know any of them? Yes, I believe there's some of them still living in the parish. I'll have to go through the addresses in my visiting book. Right. The newspapers weren't too specific. How did he manage to escape the way he did? I always thought state penitentiaries were well guarded. Apparently, Blaine was one of the trusted prisoners. It's a minimum security prison to begin with, Father. I see. I suppose Blaine and the man he escaped with thought about it a good deal. According to the paper, it was well planned. When did they get away last night? This morning, prison officials figured about 2 a.m. They slept a guard and went over the fence. Somehow, the two of them got hold of a gun. They held up a motorist on the highway and stole his car. That's the last report we've had. Terrible. Did the police consider them dangerous? Well, they're armed. Both of them were doing time for robbery. They both used guns before. Can you think of anyone in particular Blaine might contact if he should come back to the city, Father? No, I don't think so. No one in particular. He was never very close to his parents. I knew Jack very well when he was younger. Rough house type, lots of energy. Nice boy, though. He had a bad home life. Oh, that's so? His father used to run around and drink quite a bit. He took the pledge two, three times. He never kept it, though. The mother didn't help much either. How about possible contacts he might have out of town, Father? Can he help us there at all? I'm afraid not, Sergeant. I think Jack knew some people in San Francisco. I don't know their names or addresses, though. I haven't any idea. Mm -hmm. And there's no special person or place that you know of that he'd be likely to go if he heads back to Los Angeles? No, none I can think of. Do you imagine he'd be likely to come back here? Well, we're not sure. Last report we had seemed to indicate Blaine and his partner were heading this way. Prison's only about 40 miles away. Could be there in the city now. I don't understand. I mean, with all the police looking for them, why would they come back here? Well, they probably figure they can find cover a lot easier than they could out in some of the small towns. Sergeant. Yes, Father. Do you think they'll have trouble taking Jack? I mean, can they take him alive? Well, we'll try our best to make it that way. It's just like I told you, Father. He's got a gun. If he's cornered, there's a good chance he might try to shoot his way out. It's discouraging sometimes. I try to help them. I pray for them. Young thieves. I only hope they're all as lucky as he was. How's that, sir? Table over there. Figure of a man on it? Oh, yeah. It's a statue of Dismas. One of the luckiest men who ever lived. I like to tell fellas like Jack about him. I don't think I understand, Father. You know the story of the crucifixion? The two men who were crucified with Christ? They were both thieves. Mm -hmm. A few minutes before he died, one of the thieves turned to Christ on the cross and confessed his crimes. Asked our Lord to remember him. Christ told him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. The man's name was Dismas. We like to call him the good thief. Oh, yeah. 
I told Jack about it. He should have remembered it. Yeah, I guess so. I told him you never give up hope. You can make a grade in the last five minutes of your life. Jack ought to know better. He ought to remember. Sir. A good thief. He made it with a prayer, not with a gun in his hand. Father Newman, he gave us a list of eight names and addresses, people in the neighborhood who'd known the escaped convict, Jack Blaine, before he was sentenced to the state penitentiary to serve time on his robbery conviction. 3.15 p.m. We met with Sergeants Max Herman and J.E. Crowley from robbery. We divided the list of names in half and began checking them out. How about you? No luck on our end either. Last I heard of him was when he was sent out two and a half years ago. And finishes that. Any late reports at all? Yeah, there's a teletype from the sheriff's office. He was waiting here when Max and I got back. Yes, our hunch was right. Looks like they're headed this way. How do you mean? Somebody spot them? Just this side of West Covina. They held up a grocery store, slugged the owner. We got $23.40. We're going to take them far. Descriptions match out? Yeah, perfectly. Suspects believed to be two prisoners who escaped the state from California Institution for Men Chino. Jack Plain, Wesley A. Russell. Something else. Yeah? The grocery store they knocked over. They picked up another gun, the owner's. Description and serial numbers on it here. They got 20 rounds of ammunition, too. Supplementary APB's already on it. How about a car? They switch over? And if they have, we don't know about it. Apparently, they're still using the Buick Coupe they took from that motorist this morning. No reports on it. That's a queer one. You'd think somebody would spot it. They got the Highway Patrol working this. Highway Patrol, Sheriff's Office, our department, everybody you can name. By the way, you had R and I pull their mugshot, didn't you? Yeah, both of them. Bland and Russell. They're running off the duplicates now. Five hundred of them. They should be ready pretty soon. Pretty good shots? Mm-hmm. Stand-up mugs. Fairly recent. They were made the last time we had the two of them through here. How about that other list of their friends and relatives we pulled from their packages? Young and McHale were checking them out, weren't they? Probably still are, and they're working with them yet. How do you size the two of them, Joe? Lane and Russell. I don't know. It's a tough combination. Russell's older. He's got the nerve. Any way you figure it, it's not going to be easy. The guns and the ammunition they grabbed, that ain't going to help much either. Guess the roadblocks are up, huh? Highway Patrol take care of that? Yeah, all set, working now. All our special details have been alerted. Airports, bus depots, train terminals. Just about everything covered. <laughs> Robbery, Collie. Yeah, Mac, how is it? Uh -huh. You'll stay on it, huh? Right, see you later. And Caleb, he and Young are still checking on friends of Russell and some of the places he hung out. Any luck? Nothing yet. Either one of you see the captain on the way in? No, he's going to be over at the sheriff's office, didn't he? Okay, I got it. April 24th, 
9 p.m. Along with Captain Didion and a dozen other men from robbery, Frank Smith and I left the office and headed north over the freeway through the San Fernando Valley. The area where the two escaped convicts were reportedly surrounded was just the other side of the Ventura County line. On the way out, we stopped for a minute at a gas station and I phoned Ben's house. His wife had been given a sedative and she was resting. Her folks were there to help out with the final arrangements. at the meeting point on the edge of the blockaded area from which the search was being directed. Communication facilities had been set up. There were over 500 men taking part in the hunt. From our office, the L.A. Sheriff's Department, the State Highway Patrol, Ventura Sheriff's Department, and a couple of dozen private citizens who lived in the area. Together with Max Herman and Crowley, Frank Smith and I took up our positions in the line of men that stretched north and east, then north again, circling the entire area. 20 square miles of it. The line drew slowly inward. 12 midnight. 1 a.m. No sign of the suspects. We stayed at it all night. Sunday, April 25th, 9 a.m. A half dozen planes from the Sheriff's Aero Squadron continued patrolling the entire area. idea the size of these fields just start walking over them yeah it's a long walk i could use a cup of coffee couldn't you yeah me too I'd like some donuts too ready smith yeah Captain. no use beating the brush around here anymore we're moving up three miles north how come blaine and russell they hit again early this morning kidnapped an old couple from the farmhouse they still on foot yeah as far as we know they're hemmed in in a two square mile area may try to break out use the old couple as a shield where does that leave us i don't know looks bad doesn't it yeah, they kidnapped them they're desperate you figure it search party were shifted north to the area where the two escaped convicts and their kidnapped victims were last seen. Two officers were sent to each farmhouse in the immediate neighborhood to make sure that the suspects and their victims were not hid out or that they were being held as hostages. The officers were ordered to remain at the homes in the event that Blaine and Russell might try to find cover. The searching party moved slowly over the affected area. We knew for certain the suspects were still somewhere inside. 10.45 a.m. Still no sign of them. The lines drew in closer. 11 a.m. Immediately, the search has been canceled. 
The search has been cancelled. What's the matter? Are we giving it up? No, but maybe we've been going at it backwards. Been trying all night and half the day to jump them. Got a new idea. Yeah. Maybe we can make them jump us. <laughs> Captain Didion and Sheriff Durley ordered the men to return to the sheriff's office. With the exception of two deputy sheriffs, Captain Didion, Sheriff Durley, Frank Smith, and myself, the rest of the searching party vacated the area. The plan was to give the general impression that the search had been canceled in the hope that it might bring the suspects out in the open. Captain Didion and Sheriff Durley decided instead to try and lure Blaine and Russell from wherever they were hiding out. Each of the small farmhouses in the immediate neighborhood, eight of them in all, were already under surveillance. The occupants were requested to park their cars in a conspicuous place outside their homes with the distributor head removed. In the event they heard anyone trying to start their cars, they were to remain indoors. Frank Smith and I were assigned to cover one of the houses. The other men covered the rest of them. We staked out about 300 yards from the house. We waited. 1.05 p.m. Foxtails really getting your clothes, don't they, Joe? Yeah, they do. Sounds kind of hot, huh? Yeah. Just remember. What's that? Easter Sunday. Wonder how long this thing's gonna go on. I promised my kids to hide Easter eggs today.
ladies and gentlemen. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Two million people, almost a million kids. The people have tried to plan for them. They've built schools for them to learn in. Beaches and parks for them to play in. Most of the kids follow the course as planned. A few of them get lost on the way. When they do, it makes trouble for me. I'm a cop. It was Thursday, April 10th. We were working the day watch out of juvenile division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Stein. My name's Friday. The crime wave had suddenly erupted among the teenagers of the city. We were getting reports of robberies, burglaries, and bodily assault. We didn't know why it was happening, but we had to try and stop it. We had trouble Monday night. Yeah, sounds like it might be the same gang, too. Those kids are sure moving fast. Yeah, did you leave the note for Simmons? Mm uh hmm. -huh. All set. What is it this time? Movie theater on West Fremont, small neighborhood house. Mm uh hmm. -huh. They had a crowd of 15 or 20 kids in there today, mixed group, boys and girls. For no reason at all, they started to tear the place up. They do much damage? Well, we can see when we get there. They told me on the phone, theater manager tried to quiet the kids down. Half a dozen boys piled all over him. One of them pulled a knife. They tore up a couple of seats, moved out into the lobby, smashed mirrors, lamps, beat up one of the ushers. The lousy little punks would give a right arm to know how this thing got started. We never had much trouble from the kids in that neighborhood out there, Joe. Not until this last month. They seem to be going crazy. Well, it's not getting any better. Burglaries, car thefts, wrecking property. Somebody's going to come out on the short end if it keeps up. It's got to happen. Well, maybe it already has, Frank. When they were ripping up that theater lobby today, one kid got hurt. What happened? Fourteen-year-old boy. In the mix-up, he got shoved through a display case, plate glass. Cut up pretty bad. On his eyes. I'm not sure he's going to see again. <laughs> In police work, the standard law of cause and effect works like it does for everything else. When a crime's committed, there's a cause behind it. There's a reason for it. And when a group of normally well-behaved kids in an average residential neighborhood start running wild, there's got to be a reason for that, too. A month before, a rash of auto thefts, petty stealing, and public disturbances had broken out suddenly in this particular neighborhood. All of the incidents were traced directly to the teenagers in the area. Why the kids had suddenly decided to run wild, we didn't know. But the amount and nature of the violations kept getting more serious. Juveniles who'd previously been picked up for petty thefts and placed on probation were now being brought in on charges of burglary. Auto thefts in the area had jumped 20%. Misconduct and drunk charges against the teenagers, girls and boys alike, increased by the week. We had a fair idea what the root of all the trouble was. So far, we hadn't been able to trace it. 3.07 p.m. We got to the neighborhood movie theater on West Fremont. We went inside. The lobby was a shambles. A new show had just started. The manager of the theater met us in the lobby, a Mr. Clyde Barton. Get the best of me, Sergeant. I don't know what to make of it. Just look at that wreck. You'd think they were a bunch of savages. You have any idea at all what started them off, Mr. Barton? No, no idea in the world. A bunch of them came in about 2 o'clock today. Boys and girls both. They sat in front and watched the picture for a while. And it started getting noisy. Did you recognize the kids? I mean, are they from the neighborhood here? Sure, I know who they are. It, I say they started to make trouble down in front, kicking the back of the seats and yelling around. I sure couldn't do anything with them, so I went down to tell them to quiet down and get out. Well, did any of them in particular seem responsible for the racket? Any ringleader? Mm -hmm. Not that I noticed, no. I tried to be nice to kids, reason with them. They just wouldn't have it. Must have been almost two dozen of them. When they wouldn't behave, I told them to leave. I'd give them their money back. What'd they do? Mm -hmm. Got real foul mouth. One or two of the girls, too. Some of the language I wouldn't even use at a stag party. Well, I got so mad, I grabbed two of the guys in the neck and told them to get out. That's when it broke loose. What happened exactly? A whole crowd of them jumped out of their seats and piled on me. I fell back down there on the floor and I started swinging. Tell you the truth, Sergeant, I, I was scared. I didn't know what to make of them. It seemed like a pack of animals, wild. I happened to hit this one kid. And I saw him pull out a knife and come at me. You usually get along pretty well with the neighborhood kids, do you, Mr. Barton? They don't have any grudge against you that you know of? Not that I know of, no. Up until a few weeks ago, everything was fine. I never had a bit of trouble with them. Then all this rowdy stuff began. 
Tell you, it's got the best of me. And this is the first time you've had any trouble of any real size, is that right? Yeah, once in a while the kids fool around the show, talking loud, you know, but nothing like this. <laughs> you want to see Fred, my usher, the way they messed him up, brutal. That little 14-year-old that they shoved through the glass showcase. Gonna be a real mess if he doesn't pull through. I was gonna ask you, sir, about the kids in that crowd you recognized. You happen to know any of their names? Here's the list. Seven names in all. Every one of those kids was in that gang. I can give you a hand tracking down their addresses. Thank you. Something else. Here. Here's what I was talking about. What's this, sir? In that scramble here in the lobby, that little box fell out of one of the kids' pockets. One of the ushers picked it up and brought it into me. Have a look inside. too much about it, Sergeant, but I got a hunch. I don't think I made a mistake. Yeah. What do you think? No, sir, it's no mistake. Marijuana. We finished interviewing the theater manager, Clyde Barton, and then we talked to the usher, Donald Masters, who recovered the small box containing the marijuana from the floor of the lobby. He told us he recognized the young fellow who dropped the box. He said the boy's name was Harold Everson, one of the names which appeared on the list which the theater manager, Mr. Barton, had given us. 7.45 p.m., Frank and I located the Everson boys' home. It was a two-story frame, colonial-style house in a better-than-average section of the city. The boy's father answered the door, a Harold Everson senior. We told him what we wanted. We were about to sit down and eat. You have to make routine calls at dinner time? Not a routine call, Mr. Everson. We'd like to see your son if he's home. Harry, what do you have to see him about? Do you have any idea where your boy spent his time today after school? We well, said he was going down to the gym, play a little basketball. Then he was going to the library at school night. He had studying to do. I think maybe you ought to keep a closer check on your son, sir. That's not the way we get it. Well, what are you getting at? I trust my boy. He said he was going to the gym and then to the library. Got no reason to lie about it. Well, I had a minor riot in a neighborhood movie down in West Fremont today, sir. A gang of high school kids ran wild and wrecked the place. What's that got to do with Harry? Well, a couple of people recognized him among the gang of kids. They say he did his share of wrecking along with the rest of them. Well, it couldn't be. It's a lie. Harry didn't go to the show today. Told me when he got home, he even had his books with him. He spent the afternoon at the library. I'd like to have you take a look at this, Mr. Everson. Hmm? This box here, would you recognize that at all? Well, yeah. Same kind of box my stomach pills come in. Got a little acid condition in my stomach. I take these pills for it. What's all this have to do with Harry? Open the box, Mr. Everson. I don't get it. What is this stuff? Someone saw your son drop the box in the lobby of that theater today. The box contains what appears to be marijuana. Well, that's stupid. It couldn't be right. I haven't got that kind of boy. I know it isn't right. Do you mind if we talk to your son? Maybe he can explain it for us. Just a minute. I'll get him down here. Have a chair if you like. Thank you. Sure a nice place, huh, Joe? Yeah. Beautiful furniture. And nothing like period furniture. Never goes out of date. Be in style ten years from today. Mm -hmm. We better be sure and tag by Georgia Street Hospital on the way back. See how that kid's doing, the one that was hurt at the show. Oh, yeah. Officers, this is my son, Harry. Hello, Harry. Hello. Hi, right, Harry. Harry just told me, officers, he doesn't know what this is all about. He was at the library, like I said. Well, sure. I was there till they closed. Somebody made a mistake. I wasn't at the show today. You know Mr. Barton, Harry, the man who runs the theater? Yeah, I know him. Why? He swears you were there today. So does one of the ushers. Who? Hmm. By the name of Donald Masters, he says he knows you pretty well. I don't know any Donald Masters. We go to the same high school together, son. You're in the same class. I told you, I don't know any Donald Masters. What about this, Harry? Huh? Would you recognize this? No. What is it, Harry? What's wrong with you? Nothing. I, I don't know whose it is. It's not mine. Well, it was lost in the lobby of the theater today. Master says he saw you drop it. He's lying. I hate the kid's guts anyway. He's lying. I thought you said you didn't know him, son. What are you shaking for? What kind of story are you trying to tell? I didn't mean it, Dad. A kid got this stuff for me. I didn't mean to get it. I didn't mean to, Dad. It's beginning to look like I'm the dunce of the family, huh? Take it easy, Mr. Everson. You liar, Harry. A kid got this stuff for me, Dad. It's the truth. I didn't buy it. You want him downtown, officers? Afraid so, Mr. Everson. I'd like to have you come with him. Go get dressed. Go back to your room and get your clothes on. Okay, Dad. I can't believe it. My own boy using marijuana. Can't tell you how I feel. Afraid there's going to be more folks feeling the same way before this is all cleaned up. But it'd be different if Harry didn't have a chance. A good home, good training. Boys had the best I could give him. Yes, sir. It's the last thing in the world I thought could happen. I never even thought about it. I never entered my mind. Yes, sir. Same for my wife. We never even worried about it. Neither one of us. Maybe that's why it happened. Before 
we left the Everson house, we checked the boy's room and came up with another small box full of marijuana, which he'd hidden back in his closet. Besides Everson and his son, Harry, four other teenagers who'd had a part in the theater brawl were rounded up and taken downtown along with their fathers for interrogation. By the time we finished our questioning and the teenagers had finished talking, we had most of the story pieced together. A story that had the parents so amazed that half of them thought the youngsters were making it up. The pattern was familiar enough for us to know that they were telling the truth. Almost two months before, word had gone around among the teenagers in the neighborhood that marijuana, along with various stimulating drugs, was to be had easily and in quantity for anybody who wanted them. Word was passed around that it was the new thing to do, the smart thing to do, if you wanted to keep up with the crowd. In questioning the Everson boy, we found that he seemed to know more about the history and operations of the narcotics campaign in the neighborhood than the other boys did. I know one of the guys who first showed up with this stuff. His name's Johnny Demering. He's about my age, 17. I used to know him pretty well. How do you mean he was the first to show up with this stuff, Harry? What kind of stuff? Marijuana and some of the other things. You know, yellow jackets, scoop balls. More of the kids go for them than they do for marijuana. And do the youngsters know what these goop balls are made of, son? Do they know what they are? It's dope, I guess. Narcotics. Kids get a big kick out of them. I guess that's all they care. Well, now, this Johnny Demering, does he sell the stuff around the neighborhood, Harry? Well, yeah, he was the first one. He's got a couple other kids selling for him now. A couple of them are girls. They sell a lot for him. Johnny makes pretty good money. Yeah, I guess he does. Where does he get the stuff from, do you know? No, I wouldn't know that. Some place downtown, Johnny knows a guy. Never told anybody where he goes to meet the guy. Nobody ever goes with him. Was Johnny at the show with you today? No, he doesn't hang around with the kids much anymore. He's getting a little big time, I think. Got his own car, good-looking girlfriend downtown. Says he's gonna quit school next month. Where does Johnny live, son? Can you tell us that? I don't know the address right off. I can check it for you in the phone book. How about the kids that Johnny hires to sell the stuff? Can you give us their names? Yeah, okay. I, I think I can remember who they are. You gonna bring Johnny in and talk to him? That's the idea, yeah, son. I don't know if you'll find him right away. He probably heard about the trouble today. Johnny's a pretty smart guy. We'll find him. Nobody knows much about him. He never talks about what he's doing. Never tells anybody anything. Well, he told you. How smart was that? Complete statements were taken from each of the youngsters we'd brought in for questioning, and then in practically all cases, they were detained pending the completion of the investigation. With the information we had at hand, it took us the better part of four days to round up everybody involved in the narcotics distribution system, which had been set up among the teenagers in the neighborhood by 17-year-old Johnny Demering. As for the Demering boy himself, he couldn't be found. We checked with his family, his relatives, his friends, all his known associates. We got out a want on him. And then we checked the car he owned through DMV and we got out a want for that. No sign of the boy. Narcotics division gave us a hand and got their informants busy trying to track down the source of the dope for which the Demering boy had been the only distributor. We knew it went far beyond him. The whole campaign to introduce narcotics in a seemingly harmless form among neighborhood teenagers and then gradually build a solid demand for more expensive stuff as the habit grew and took roots with each and every youngster. It reached to the same vicious men who make their money off the hopeless adult drug addict. The same vicious men who today are trying to build a new market for their wares among the young people of this country. Tuesday, April 29th, 2.30 p.m. I'll get it. Right. Juvenile Division, Smith. Yeah, Brady. Uh-huh. That right? What's his name? All right. Right, goodbye. Joe. Yeah. Brady from Narcotics, the figure they got our man. The Demering boy? No, the guy was pushing the stuff to Demering. His name's Jocko Harris. They found him in the county hospital this morning. Yeah. Somebody got a hold of him two nights ago, gave him a good working over. If we're lucky, we'll make it. What do you mean? He's not supposed to last the day. 2.35 p.m. Frank and I left the office and went immediately to the county hospital where we were allowed to interview the narcotic suspect, Jocko Harris, briefly. He was in critical condition with a fracture of the skull. He gave us a statement in the form of a dying declaration. He admitted being the connection for 17-year-old Johnny Demering and admitted also that he kept the boy supplied with enough narcotics to keep the neighborhood teenage demand for the stuff fully satisfied. Seemed like a good boy, Johnny. Nice kid. Smart. I never thought he'd turn away to that that's all. Where is he, Jocko? Do you know? I only wish I did. Go beat his head in, get my stuff back. Take everything I had. One of the biggest hauls I ever handled. Every ounce. What was it, heroin? The best. Got only one word for you. Yeah. You better get him fast. 
age to start a war. Wednesday, April 30th, 9 a.m., the hunt for 17-year-old Johnny Demering was intensified. To our knowledge, because of the information we'd gained from narcotics peddler Jocko Harris, the teenage youngster had a large store of high-grade heroin, which we knew, because of his inexperience, he was unaccustomed to dealing with. In his hands, the narcotics immediately became a lethal weapon. We knew that Johnny Demering had only one market to deal in, only one type of customer he was acquainted with, the teenager. In previous transactions, we knew the youngsters received only a low-grade type of narcotic, highly diluted. We knew that if Demering succeeded in dispensing the highly concentrated store he had on hand and the juvenile customers he served tried it on themselves, it would very likely result in death. 11 a.m. Wednesday. Despite all our efforts, Johnny Demering and the store of high-grade narcotics which he'd hijacked from Jocko Harris were still missing. Wednesday, 12 noon, we began rechecking every one of the possible sources that might lead us to the suspect. One of them was the boy's mother, a Mrs. Frances Demering. We talked to her at her work. She was employed as a motograph operator in the mailing department of a large downtown department store. Not since the last time you talked to me, officer. I haven't heard a word from my boy and nothing at all. Have you heard anything? Well, yes, ma'am, in a way. We've got an ID still somewhere in the city. That's why we figured we'd come back and talk to you again. Have you been in touch with your relatives in town recently, Ms. Demering? I mean, those Johnny might possibly contact. Yes, there's just my sister and my mother. They're the only ones I think Johnny go to in a case like this. Maybe because he's in trouble and all. I only wish I could have stopped the whole thing. I mean, even before it started. It should never have even started. Yes, ma'am. I guess it just wasn't to be right from the start. Johnny's father ran away, you know. I tried my best after that and never seemed to be enough. I suppose there's no getting away from it. A boy needs a father. You can try all you want. They still need a father. Some kind of discipline. Yes, ma'am. Well, how about the relatives you have out of town, Ms. Demering? Any word from them at all about Johnny? No, Sergeant, nothing. Matter of fact, I've been waiting for a letter. Nothing at all. Do you have any idea at all where Johnny most likely go in town if he didn't want to be seen, Mrs. Demering? Where he'd go? No, I wouldn't know that, Sergeant. First place, Johnny's never really been in trouble before. I mean, where he'd have to hide. He's always been good to me. Maybe too good. I wouldn't know that. Well, how about Johnny's school friends, ma'am? Would there be any one of them he might possibly contact in a jam? None that I haven't told you about before, I don't think. Evelyn. She's the only one I suppose Johnny'd go to if he needed help, if he was in trouble. That's his girlfriend at the high school, Evelyn Maxford. Yes, that's right. Sweet girl. How about a girlfriend that Johnny was supposed to have downtown somewhere, Miss Demling? Would you know anything about her? Nothing really, no. I knew Johnny had some other girl besides Evelyn. He did mention she lived downtown. Guess that's all I know about her. Her name was Betty, I think. Johnny mentioned it once. That's all I know about her, though. You have no idea where she lived downtown? No, I don't. Johnny and his girlfriends, that was one thing I tried not to pry into. All right, ma'am, thank you very much. Appreciate if you'd notify us if you hear anything at all about your son. All right, thank you. Tomorrow's Johnny's birthday, you know, I meant to tell you. I always expect Johnny home on his birthday. Seems no matter where he is, how he's tied up with his school or sports or something, Johnny always makes it home for his birthday. I see. wonder how it'll be tomorrow. He's never missed being home on his birthday, not once. Well, if he shows up, I guess you can count on one thing, ma'am. What's that? We might have to miss next year. 2 p.m., Frank and I picked up a glass of milk and a hot dog for lunch, and then we continued making a check of Johnny Demering's closest friends. Next in line after his mother was Demering's high school girlfriend, Evelyn Maxford. We located her at home. She seemed unusually nervous as we interviewed her. No, there's nothing wrong. It's just all this business about Johnny, all this trouble. I've been upset ever since I heard about it. You haven't heard from Johnny at all, Miss Maxford. He's made no attempt to contact you since the last time we talked. I haven't heard a word, officer. I know tomorrow's his birthday. His mother's expecting him home. I know he won't come, though. I'm sure of that. How are you sure, miss? Well, I just know that's all. I guess he should give himself up and take his chances. But I know he won't. I know Johnny that well. He just isn't that type. I'd like to ask you again, miss. Yes? Are you sure you haven't heard from Johnny Demering recently in the past two days or so? No. That's what I told you. Don't you believe me? Do you know why we're so anxious to locate Johnny, Miss Maxford? Oh, I think so. It's about the narcotics business. You say Johnny had a hand in it. He was selling those things to the kids. I still don't believe it myself. It's a lot more than that, the way it stands now, Miss Maxford. What do you mean? When he was at school, Johnny was kept supplied with narcotics by a man named Jocko Harris. He's what we call a pusher, a kind of an in-between supply man in the narcotics trade. Uh -huh. Two nights ago, Johnny caught up with Harris. He beat him up badly enough to send him to the hospital with a skull fracture. And then Johnny stole every bit of narcotics Harris had in his room, some of the strongest stuff he can buy on the market. 
That's why we want Johnny, Miss Maxwell. I don't think I understand. What does it mean? Well, it means that most of the teenage kids Johnny's been supplying stuff to have been getting fairly weak grades of heroin. If he gets some of this stuff to them and the kids start taking it, it might prove too strong for them. If they take too much of it, it could kill them outright. Oh, no. Now you see what we're up against. We've got to find that boy and we've got to find him soon. Couldn't you talk to his mother? Maybe she could tell you something. We already have, miss. She couldn't tell us anything. That's why we halfway depended on you. Why do they have to put it in my lap? Why does it have to be me? I liked Johnny for a while. I don't know what to think now. Have you heard from him, Miss Maxford? There's no reason to be afraid. You'd probably feel a lot worse if something happened to one of the high school kids, wouldn't you? Miss Maxford? I got a call from him yesterday. Johnny. He wouldn't tell me where he was. I asked him, but he wouldn't tell me. Well, what else did he say? He knows everybody's looking for him. He doesn't know about the stuff that he stole, though. I'm sure of that. He doesn't know what it could do. Did he make any dates with you? Did he want to see you? Yes, he wants to see me. He wants me to meet him this evening. Where? He's going to tell me. Excuse me, I'll have to get the phone. Hello? Yes? Oh, but I don't know. I don't, really. What? 5.30? All right. Yes. Yes, I'll meet you then. All right. Bye. Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. That was Johnny just then. He wanted to make sure I was going to meet him. When? 5.30 in Lake Park. Which side, miss? The west side. Sergeant, I could hardly understand him. He said he was sick. Ma'am. He sounded sick, too. Terribly sick. It can't be true. I hope to God it's not true. What's that? The narcotics he stole from that man. You say they were powerful? Yes, ma'am, we did. Johnny's been taking them for two days. Together with two other men from Juvenile Bureau, Hurst and McTie, we drove down near the appointed spot along the lake in Lake Park where Evelyn Maxford's meeting with the teenage suspect Johnny Demering was to take place. We staked out at a reasonable distance and Miss Maxford went ahead to the meeting spot. As far as we could see, there was no sign of Demering. Someone on the opposite side of the lake was playing a phonograph. The music came over faintly across the water. We watched the Maxford girl make her way up the path into the park. as we could get there. When we got close enough, we found out the reason for the scream. He was lying face up in the water near a clump of trees. He was a good-looking boy, dark hair, good build, handsome. Took only one look and you knew right away he was too young to be dead. You could argue for a week, but you couldn't change it. He was dead. The girl stood over him, her face in her hands, crying. I don't see any marks in the body, do you, Joe? No. Looks like an overdose, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Better get her out of here, huh? Yeah. It's all right, Miss Maxford. Come on. Let's go over here. We'll have one of the other officers take you home. We can take care of what has to be done here. He was a good boy, Sergeant. He was smart. How could he ever get started in such a thing? How could he make such a mistake? He had the best excuse in the world, miss. Yes? He was 17. On May 2nd, a coroner's inquest was held at the county morgue, Hall of Justice, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that inquest. Those involved in the juvenile narcotics ring, a total of eight persons were tried and convicted under the State Narcotics Act. They received sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their terms in the State Penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Just
Chesterfield. Chesterfield, only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the setting. All year round it wears work clothes. On holidays it dresses up. To most people Christmas brings happiness and prayer. To some it brings heartbreak. Then my job gets tougher. I'm a cop. It was Thursday, December 22nd. We were working the night watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. We'd gotten the call that a nine-year-old boy was missing from his home. The evidence pointed to foul play. We had to check it out. Thousands are changing to Chesterfields, regular and king size, because Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both sizes. That means that Chesterfield King Size contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other King Size cigarette. The same fine tobaccos as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference except that King Size Chesterfield is larger. Contains so much more of the same tobaccos, it gives you more than a fifth longer smoke. Yes, more than a fifth longer smoke. Ask your dealer for Chesterfield either way you like them. Premium quality Chesterfield, and much milder. I'll get it. Homicide Friday. Oh, yeah, Doherty. Uh-huh, yeah. What's that number? Right, I got it. Yeah, nine-year-old, huh? Well, how long's he been gone? Right. How do you figure homicide? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, sure, we'll get right on it. Right. Anything? Doherty, Unit 113J. He and Levinson are out on Hollis Avenue trying to track down a nine-year-old boy. What's the story? Well, the kid's missing. Suspicion of foul play. How long has he been gone? About two hours. Kid was last seen playing in the backyard of his home. Yeah. Doherty says they checked over the yard. Find anything? Blood stains. Lots of them. They look new. <laughs> Tom Doherty from Highland Park Juvenile was waiting for us in front of the house. We went down the driveway and into the backyard. Doherty told us that the boy's mother told him that she'd gone out to do some Christmas shopping at 11 o'clock that morning. And when she returned home at 2 p.m., the boy was gone. His name was Stanley Johnstone, age nine years. Ray Pinker started his preliminary investigation of the stains found on the patio. <laughs> Type the blood first, Ray. Certain test won't run more than 20 minutes. Take three or four hours to run a blood grouping, though. Anything else you want to check? Yeah, let me borrow a scribe in an envelope, will you, Ray? Sure. Twenty-two caliber empty cartridge casing. I marked it for evidence. Doherty went on to tell us that he and his partner Levinson had talked with the neighbors. They could tell them nothing. 
He said they put out a missing broadcast on the boy and that the mother was at a loss to explain the boy's whereabouts. Blood stains, empty cartridge. Could mean a hundred things. Any ideas, Freddy? Yeah, just one, and I don't like it. 4.30 p.m., Thursday, December 22nd. The neighborhood search for nine-year-old Stanley Johnstone continued. Ray Pinker went back to the crime lab to start the precipitant test and the blood grouping. Levinson and his partner Doherty from Highland Juvenile stood by. We called Captain Lorman and he arranged for a special detail to aid in the search for the missing boy. Frank and I questioned the boy's mother, a Mrs. Ruth Johnstone, a woman in her early 40s. She seemed fairly calm under the circumstances. Mrs. Johnstone, is your boy Stanley in the habit of wandering off without telling you where he's going? No, he's not in the habit of wandering off, but he has done it before. When was the last time, Miss Johnstone? You don't have any children, do you, Sergeant Friday? No, ma'am, I'm not married. When it comes that time in every young boy's life when he feels that it's time to leave home, go out on his own. Usually happens somewhere around 8 to 10. Yes, I think I know what you mean. I have a boy of my own. You know how it is. My husband and I scolded Stanley one afternoon after school, and he was quite put out about it. Thought George and I were unfair. Packed a few of his things and left. How long was he gone? Oh, no time at all, about two hours. I was worried about him, but my husband said to leave him alone, said every boy had to go through that stage. Well, then you think he's run away from home again this time, do you? Yes, I think so. He's been gone about four hours now. I have a funny feeling about it. Well, did you and his father have some misunderstanding with the boy recently? That's just it. We haven't. I don't mind telling you. Now that we're talking about it, I'm getting worried. Any place around that he might like to visit, a hobby shop or a playground where he might be? Well, yes, there's Jensen's model shop, little Heidi Robinson, but I've already called all his friends and they have no idea where he is either. I see. We'd like a list of all of his friends and the places that he was known to frequent. Yes, all right, I'll give them to you. Where do you suppose he is? Where's your husband now, Mrs. Johnstone? At work. George works for the city. He's a fireman. Where is he stationed? Engine Company 12. He's working the A platoon. He'll be home tomorrow morning. I haven't told him Stanley's gone. Was well, there any chance that the boy might be down at the firehouse with his father? No, he seldom goes down there anymore. No, I, I don't think he's there. I'm awfully worried. May I call my husband? Oh, sure. Go right ahead. Excuse me. I know George will be worried. Engine Company 12, please. Stanley's been gone too long. Hello? May I please speak with George Johnstone? This is Mrs. Johnstone. Thank you. I hate to call George at his work. Yes, ma'am. Does your husband own a gun? Yes, he does. What caliber, would you know? Well, it's a 45 automatic. He got it in the Army. George? This is Ruth George. Is Stanley down there with you by any chance? Oh. No, I can't find him anywhere. He wasn't here when I came home from doing my shopping. Were well, there are two policemen here? No, dear, I'll call you if we don't find him soon. All right, dear, yes, you too. Bye. I didn't think you'd be with George. That 45, is that the only gun in the house? Yes. Why are you asking about guns? Has anything happened you're not telling me about? No, ma'am, just routine checking. We'll have to take a look at that 45 if you don't mind. Well, maybe I should tell you, we do have another gun in the house, but it's all wrapped up. George bought it for Stanley's Christmas present. I wonder if we could see that, please. Oh, well, yes. Do you have to unwrap it? I'm afraid so. Well, it's this way. It's in this closet. I think I can reach it. I can't hide it. Stanley must have found it. It's gone. Here's the gift card and the box the gun came in. There's a rifle. I wonder if I could see that box. Of course. How about it, Joe? Thursday, December 22nd, 5.15 p.m. The search for the missing boy continued. We checked the list of Stanley Johnstone's friends. None of them or their parents had any idea of his whereabouts. We talked with Doherty again. He'd been in touch with the detail combing the neighborhood. They found nothing. We went down to Hollis Avenue and 10th Street, the service station on the corner. Want a dime, Jeff? No, I don't. Ray? No, 
Ray Pinker. Hi, Ray. It's Friday. No, no sign of him yet. Did you finish the precipitant yet? I see. No, we don't know. But we didn't want to upset his mother any more than we had to. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can do it that way. What? What? Oh. Yeah, we'll transfer me over, will you, Ray? Yeah, thank you. Right, check you later, Ray. Well, hi, Captain. It's Friday. Yeah, well, we just left already. If you... Yeah. Right? We'll stay on it. What Pinker have? It's human blood. He's working on the grouping now. I wanted to know the Johnstone boy's blood type. Something else. Yeah. There's another one missing. An eight-year-old boy. <laughs> Six thirty p.m. We talked with Officer Doherty about the other missing boy. He told us that his name was Stephen Martin, eight years old. His family had just moved into the neighborhood. It seemed that no one besides the Martin family knew that the boys played together. We got a description of the Martin boy and put out a missing broadcast. We called the Johnstone's family doctor. He told us that Stanley's blood type was type O. At seven p.m. We talked with Mrs. John Martin. Stevie told me he was just going out to play. He said he'd be home by six for dinner. Yes, ma'am. It's always prompt, never overstays his playtime. It's after seven, isn't it? Yes, ma'am, five after. You sure Mrs. Johnston doesn't know where the boys are? She has no idea, Mrs. Martin. It's terrible, just awful. I feel there's more to this thing, something you're not telling me. Well, there's no use to upset you until we know a few things for sure. Then you are holding back something. Please try not to worry, Miss Martin. There are certain questions we have to ask, routine questions in any kind of investigation. Is there anything else you want to know? Yes, what's your boy's blood type? It's a funny question. Do you think anything's happened to him? Have you found him and you're not telling me? No, ma'am, we haven't found him. We don't think anything's happened to him. Blood type? Yes, ma'am. I think I have it written down in Stevie's baby book. Yes, here it is. It's typo. Thank you. I wonder if I might use your phone. Yes, of course, in the hall. Thank you. Excuse me? Mm-hmm. 2667, please. This is Friday, just checking back. I got the blood type of the two missing boys for you. Yeah, typo. No, both boys, typo. Yeah. Right. Frank, see you in a minute. Right, Joe. Excuse me, Miss Martin. Pinker just finished the blood grouping. Bad. The stains, both typo. We like to give the facts about Chesterfield so you can be your own judge. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to tell you what it's made of. The world's best tobaccos. Kept tasty and fresh by pure and costly moistening agents. The best that money can buy. And Chesterfield cigarette paper is of the highest purity. Now Chesterfield is the first cigarette to present this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. 45% of this group have smoked Chesterfields for an average of over 10 years. After eight months, the medical specialist reports that he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. I'd say that means real mildness. Either way you like them, regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Eight p.m. Thursday, December twenty-second. Still no sign of either of the missing boys. Captain Lorman went back to headquarters to direct the search from there. He dispatched another detail of 50 men to aid in the hunt for the missing youngsters. 8.30 p.m. We went up the block to see Mrs. Johnstone. Her husband had quit work early and returned home. We talked with him. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. We still had not informed either of the families about the blood stains and the empty cartridge casing which had been discovered in the backyard of the Johnstone home. 
It was more than possible that they had a right to know about our findings, but Frank and I felt there was no cause to add to the distress of the two families at this time. If the two missing boys were found alive and well, then the blood stains in the cartridge would be of no concern to the relieved parents. At 8.40 p.m., Frank and I left the Johnstone house and went to the home of Mr. and Mrs. John Martin. Mrs. Martin, you say your husband works in the market? Yes, he telephoned about 15 minutes ago and said he was closing up right away. He'll be here any minute. I do wish Stevie would call or come home. It's so cold out tonight. All he had on was a thin cotton shirt. Well, you try not to worry. We're doing everything we can. He'll be all right. Stevie's father's such a sensitive man. He and the boy are so close. I know he's terribly upset. Now, you say you looked every place. There's no place else the boy might be. Oh, no place, no. If anything's happened to the boy, it'll just kill John. You just take it easy, Mrs. Martin. Sit still, I'll get it. Thank you. Joe. Yeah. The Johnstone kid, he'd been found. He's home, Sergeant. He's come home. Thank God he's all right. Well, where's he been? Did he tell you? No, he didn't. He's acting so strange. I've never seen him like this. How do you mean, Mrs. Johnstone? Well, he just came in the front door, said, hello, Mom, sat down in the chair and stared at the floor. I won't talk to his father or me. Mind if we talk to him? Well, no, go ahead. I asked him about the little Martin boy, but he wouldn't tell me a thing. Where is he now? In the dining room. Looks all right, Joe. Yeah. Son. Son, this is a police officer. He wants to talk to you. Don't be afraid, dear. He only wants to ask you some questions. Son. You see, Sergeant? Stanley. Look at me, son. Come on, youngster. Get your head up. Come on, now. That's better. Had your mother pretty worried, you know that? Want to tell us where you've been? You should try and get him to eat a little something. You hear that, son? You want something to eat? Stanley, there's another little boy up the street who hasn't come home. You know where he is? His father and mother are worried about him, too, just like your folks were. You've got to help us find him, son. I killed him. I killed Steve. What's the 22? We were only playing, but I killed him. How do you know you killed him? Maybe he's only hurt now, isn't that it? No, he's dead. I know he's dead. The gun went off. We forgot we put bullets in there. Where is he, Stanley? I hit him. I was scared. I didn't want anybody to find him. I don't want to go to jail. Where'd you hide him, son? Out in the back under some leaves. I didn't mean it. He was my pal. You want to show us where, Stanley? Yes, I'll show you. Please don't send me to jail. December 22nd. Nine-year-old Stanley Johnstone led the way out beyond the backyard of his home. He showed us the wagon he moved the body in. single bullet wound in his chest just below his heart. He was dead. I knew where it was and I got it. There was a box of bullets with it. Were you pointing the gun at Stephen? No, sir. No, sir, I wasn't. It was Steve's turn to play with it. I was chasing him and he tripped over that stump there and got hit him in his stomach and went off. Why do you think you killed him if you're telling us the truth? I'm telling the truth. Honest, that's the truth. All right, I believe you, son, but why do you think you killed him? It was my gun. Steve would still be alive if I didn't go get it. 
wish it a window Christmas. It's all my fault. Where have you been all this time? Right here. With Steve. What were you doing, son? I was praying. I was praying for God to make you alive again. After a thorough investigation, Frank and I were convinced that the shooting of Stephen Martin was accidental. All evidence indicated that the Johnstone boy was telling the truth. We put in a call to the coroner's office and acquainted him with the facts. He designated a local mortuary to handle the body pending autopsy and granted us permission to remove the body to the Martin home. Mrs. Martin collapsed. The family doctor was called. Frank and I sat in the living room to wait for John Martin, the dead boy's father. Edith? Edith? Mr. Martin? Yes. You the police? Yes, sir. Where's Edith? Where's my wife? Well, has my boy come home yet? Well, have you found him? Yes, sir. Well, where is he? Stevie? Stevie? Where's Steve? He's hurt, isn't he? Yes, sir. Well, where is he? I want to see him. He's hurt pretty bad, Mr. Martin. Well, where is he? I want to see him. How bad? Pretty bad. Unless his father was with him until he learned how to treat firearms. Where's your boy? He's 
right here. You should come in. It's all right, Miss Johnson. inquest was held at the county morgue hall of justice city and county of los angeles state of california in a moment the results of that inquest you know if you're as busy as i am you've got most of your christmas shopping left to do so take a tip from me give them quality give them chesterfield the only premium quality cigarette available in both regular and king size and it's in the best looking christmas carton that you're going to find so make it a chesterfield christmas now, from all of us on Dragnet and the people who make Dragnet possible, Liggett and Myers, the over 6,000 wholesale distributors and the 1,300,000 retail Chesterfield dealers, including the one you know so well, a Merry Christmas. The coroner's jury ruled that the death of Stephen Martin was the result of an accident. about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Everything in it is one way or the other. There's no middle ground. Narrow alleys. highways, mansions on the hill, shacks in the gullies, people who work for a living and people who steal. These are the ones that cause me trouble. I'm a cop. It was Monday, April 17th. We were working the day watch out of forgery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Welch. My name's Friday. We'd gotten reports of an expert check forger operating again in the city. She'd written more than $20,000 in bad checks. We had to stop her. Morning, Joe. Hi, how'd the weekend go? Oh, pretty slow. Stayed home, did some gardening. How about that new lawn you put in? How's it doing? Well, there's only one solution. If we want a garden, we're gonna have to move. Well, why? What's the matter now? Same old thing. Gophers? Happens every year. I don't know why I try anymore. It's just a waste of good grass seed. Joe, Frank? Yeah, Ferguson. Cat wants to see us. Okay. What's up, Fergie? You ain't gonna like it. What's that? Skipper will brief us. Morning, Skipper. 
Hi. You took Finney's up at the Meyer case yesterday, is that right? Yeah, it's all washed up. We're clear. Good. Then you can start on this one right away. You work with Besser and Ferguson here. Well, what is it, Kim? The Grandma case. I had a hunch, Joe. What have we done to deserve this? There's nothing any of us have done. It's what we haven't done. I want her stopped once and for all. We any closer to her than we have been, Fergie? Just about the same, Joe. That's the reason I'm putting two more of you on it. How well do you know this case? Well, just what we've heard around the office. Frank? Same here. I could stand some briefing. Ferguson? Connick, you must have heard how she operates three months out of the year, April, October, and December. That's all. She's never been known to change the schedule? Not as far as I know. She's been doing it the same for nine years. All the phony checks she cashes are personal checks? That's right. She never writes them less than two dollars, never more than a hundred. <laughs> nine years. She's been doing that long? Nine and a half. It'll be an even ten this October. You want to check them out on the totals, Ferguson? Yeah, up to and including the first of the month, she's cashed 1,273 checks. The total is a little over $22,000. Anything special about the way she writes the checks? Nothing but the signatures. There's an alias list on her, but it'll knock your eye out. More than 200 different names. Her description's still the same. About 50 years old, kind of plump, nice face. A few minor changes. Last year, she had gray hair, dressed very plain. This year, she dyed her hair black, dresses a little more expensively. <laughs> Nine years, that's a long streak of luck for any paper hanger. That's just it. This old gal's not just an ordinary paper hanger. She's no amateur, now don't get me wrong. But she doesn't operate like any check forger I've ever known. She contradicts part of her MO, part of it she doesn't. She takes chances an ordinary paper hanger would never take, and she gets away with them. Take a look at just one of these exhibits. Twenty-eight checks pass on the same chain of grocery store, same company. Pass them all in one month? Nope, that's just the point. Two years ago, she passed 14 of them, spread them out over a period of a month. Last year, she passed another batch of 14, all within three days. One year, she used a different name on each check. On this batch, she used the same name. Well, does she have identification when she passes these checks? Always. Phony driver's license, social security card, the works. And she's got that sweet grandmother smile of hers. Clerks rarely turn her down when she shows up at the check. You can get used to various descriptions on her, too. Give the file a look. Hardly three of the check victims can get together on what she looks like exactly. But where are they getting stung the most, downtown or out in the neighborhoods? The neighborhoods. Anywhere from the beach area to the valley. Well, that whole file skipper, that's not just her work, is it? Every last bit of it. We can't fit it in a six-foot shelf. In nine years, I've had five teams of men work this thing. None of them reached it. You and Friday make the six. Yeah, well, it's April 17th. How's she doing so far this month, Furry? Okay, $602 in checks we know of since the first of the month. Same general description, same general M.O. No fresh leads? She's been operating nine years, Joe. Yeah. She's just as good as ever. To the working detective, there's no tougher job than tracking a lawbreaker who's half professional and half amateur. You can expect a criminal who's entirely professional to react generally the same in a given set of circumstances. The same with the amateur. But take the two, the professional and the amateur, and intermingle their possible and probable reactions. You'll likely have a sound reason why and how an elderly woman could victimize merchants with $20,000 in bad checks over a period of nine years without being caught. Grandma, as she'd come to be known, worked only three months out of each year, April, October, and December. Her apparent fine sense of timing and her knowledge of psychology was far and away superior to that of the ordinary paper hanger. If the file on Grandma was any indication, she apparently had been born to be a successful check forger. After Frank and I spent three days on the case with Sergeants Ferguson and Besser, we were almost convinced there was only one way we could reach the suspect. She had to make a mistake. Fergie, how'd you do? Pretty sour. Four checks in two days. What'd you get? Two. Don Myers checked the signatures. They're all hers. Here's our list if you're interested. Meat market out on Pico, $25. Grocery in West Hollywood, $48. Two department stores downtown, 100 bucks a piece. How they describe the woman? Same old yarn. She was a nice, charming little lady, about 55 or 60. Small, dark hair, graying, dark eyes, nice smile. Clerk told me she reminded him of his mother. Yeah. For one thing, sure, her timing's just as good as it was nine years ago. The Downtown Merchants Association's screaming again. They're looking for action. Well, fine. So are we. When they stop cashing checks for people they don't know, they'll stop getting hurt. We can't stand behind their counters and run a make on every one of their customers who wants to cash a check. How many publicity campaigns have we run on bad checks? I don't know, but they don't seem to stop Grandma. Uh, do you talk to the captain today? Yeah, he's looking for action, too. I don't know what we can do unless we get some kind of cooperation from the merchants. Every time the old gal pushes a bum check, it's three or four days before it gets to the bank and we hear about it. The trail's pretty cold by then. Joe and I were talking just before you came in, Furry. We can't expect too much to happen the way we're going. Any ideas? Well, more men and more stakeouts. The captain says he'll buy that. That's about all we can do. Another ten days and April will be over. Grandma will be through pushing checks until October again. I don't know, Joe. Our formula's too perfect for me. There's got to be a flaw in it someplace. Yeah, sure. All we got to do is find it. You got out a bulletin on that revised description of her, Fergie? Yeah, all taken care of. Special notices are mailed out to the merchants. I'll get it. Marjorie Smith. 
Yes, sir. Oh? Yes, sir, we'll be right out, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a supermarket on North Temple just got hit with two checks. Yeah. Clerk says the woman reminded him of his mother. A week passed. The number of stakeouts on business places throughout the city was doubled. The M.O. and the description of the suspect was circulated among the merchants in the downtown and suburban shopping centers. Clerks were especially warned to be on the lookout for. The precautions went for nothing. Grandma's checks kept showing up at the rate of two and three a day. On April 27th, she passed a check for $50 at a delicatessen on Hollywood Boulevard. We drove out to interview the owner, a Mr. Hammerston. She's the nicest old lady I think I ever met, Sergeant. Sure surprised me. Say, you wouldn't care for a piece of liverwurst, would you? It's a new brand. Don't know whether my customer's gonna like it or not. No, thank you. Had you ever seen the woman before, Mr. Hammerston? Oh, I guess she'd been coming in here for at least a week or two. Said she was new in the neighborhood. We used to get Gavin all the time. Mm-hmm. Did she do much shopping here, sir? Mm-hmm, quite a bit, yeah. Always paid in cash. We got to be great friends, you know. Used to talk about the old country, things like that. And she, uh, said she came from the same town in Finland my folks did. I guess she was just buttering me up, huh? Well, that's the way it sounds, yes, sir. Had you ever refused to cash a check for her? No, she never tried to pass one, just this once, and I did it. Do you have one of those circulars that we sent out on this woman? Well, I'm ashamed to say it, Sergeant, but I have. Hanging right back there in the storeroom. Thing is, I never connected the two, the woman and notice. The way she looks at you, you know? Like you'd be a heel even to question her. How was she dressed the last time she was in, do you remember that? No, yeah. had on a black coat. Oh, I told you that. Very plain looking clothes, like any other housewife. Print dress, some kind of scarf around her neck. That's about all I noticed. How about that description of her in the bulletin we sent you? That fit her pretty well? No, I guess so. Didn't seem exactly plump to me, though. Kind of a nice figure for a woman her age. Well, do you know if any of your customers were acquainted with her? No, I wouldn't know that. She acted as though she knew some of them, but, well, now that this has happened, I can see she was just putting on. Well, she was a great disappointment to me. Well, she is to a lot of people, sir. I used to judge with her all the time. Is that so? Yeah. She seemed like a real good sport. Fine personality, joshing all the time, just as homey as you please. Mm -hmm. Fits in with the other descriptions. Say, how are you ever going to catch somebody like that? Well, we're not sure we will, sir. Yeah, they're going to like this. Two days later, on April 30th, right on schedule, the flow of bogus checks in Grandma's handwriting suddenly stopped. If she continued to work by the same timetable she'd been using for the last nine years, she wouldn't start operations again until the 1st of October. During the next five months that followed, from May to the end of September, Besser, Ferguson, Frank, and I handled the usual run of check cases. At the same time, we used up every spare hour we had making preparations for Grandma's next appearance. Every business ran throughout the city who might be a possible victim was alerted. A revised description of the suspect together with her M.O. was printed up and given wide distribution. Every possible precaution was taken. October came. Grandma started on the 10th year of her forgery career without a hitch. On October 1st, she cashed a check for $75 at a large downtown woman's shop. As soon as we got the report, we drove out to the store and went to the department where the check had been received. A fashion show was in progress. We asked to see the manager. Are you the one who authorized this check to be cashed? Yes, I okay all the checks that we cash in this department. And you okayed this one? These are your initials? Yes, that's right. 
I don't know what I can do for you, gentlemen. The check was passed by unfortunate occurrence. The sales girl handled the transaction. She showed me the check. I knew the signature, so I okayed it. Mary Walker? Yes, that's how the check was signed. What kind of identification did the woman have? Uh, her charge account plate. You know, the small metal card? Charger plates, we call them. I recognized that and the signature immediately. You know this Mary Walker pretty well, do you? She's one of our best customers. Friday, October 4th, 2 p.m. Before we left the store, we found that another worthless check bearing the signature Mary Walker had been cashed in a different department of the store on the same day as the other Ford's check. The woman had used the same means of identification, a metal charge account plate stamped with the name Mary Walker. We took the two checks back to the office and had Don Meyer in handwriting compare the signatures. There wasn't any doubt in his mind, the writing on both checks was Grandma's. It was only a hunch, but it was beginning to look as though the suspect had finally done what we'd been waiting nine years for her to do. She'd made a mistake. Frank and I drove out to an address in the Wilshire district to interview Mrs. Mary Walker. She fit the general description of the suspect, but she denied writing either one of the checks which bore her signature. Well, it's out of the question, Sergeant. I couldn't have written those checks. I haven't even been in the city for the past five days. And these signatures on these checks, Mrs. Walker, they're not yours. Well, it looks like my handwriting, but it's not. I didn't write those checks. They're forgeries. Well, you do have a charge account at the store, don't you, ma'am? Yes, I've had one there for years. Nothing like this ever happened, though. Do you have one of those charge account plates, do you? Well, yes, I did have one. You lent it to someone in your family? No. As a matter of fact, I lost it. I intended to report it to the store, but it slipped my mind. Do you have any idea where and when you might have lost it? Well, I think it was last Sunday night, Sergeant, but I'm not sure. Well, just a minute. I know someone who would remember. My name is Landa. She was there, and I'm sure that she'd remember. Mm -hmm. Who's she, ma'am? She's a girlfriend of mine. She lives in this neighborhood. Hello, Inez. This is Mary Walker. Oh, I'm just fine. You? Good. Say, Inez, what night was it that we went to the Boosters Club meeting? Sunday? Well, that's what I thought. Oh, nothing. Just some silly misunderstanding. Well, all right, Inez. Uh, thanks for remembering for me. Yeah. Bye. It was Sunday night, Sergeant. Inez Lambert and I went to the neighborhood Boosters Club meeting. And I'm sure that that's where I must have lost it. Well, and you think the charge account plate just fell out of your purse, is that it? Either that, or it was taken. Why do you say that, ma'am? Well, it's a very serious thing, and I didn't want to mention it. What's that? Well, I left my purse on the chair next to me part of the evening. And when I got home, I thought I was missing a $5 bill out of my change purse. I didn't notice then that the charger plate was gone. Do you remember who was at that meeting, Mrs. Walker? Oh, 40 or 50 people at least. How many women, would you say? Oh, a dozen, I suppose. Now, I'm not accusing anyone of robbery, Sergeant. I know that that's a very serious charge to make. Do you know if one of the club officers might have taken a list of those present? Oh, they don't have to. We do the same thing at every meeting. What's that mean? We all sign the attendance book and we leave. Three p.m., Frank and I contacted the secretary of the neighborhood Boosters Club. He gave us a list of those present at the Sunday night meeting of the club. As Mary Walker had told us, each person present had signed his or her name and address in the attendance book. We took the record downtown with us and had Don Meyer compare each signature on the list with samples of Grandma's handwriting. Number 32 on the list, fellas, that's it. Positive make, Don? No, don't mind mine. That's Grandma's handwriting. Let me see how she signed it. Mm -hmm. This is Inez Lambert. We went down the hall to R&I &I and had them check the name Inez Lambert through the files. She had no criminal record. Together with Bester and Ferguson, Frank and I spent the next day and a half trailing Inez Lambert wherever she went. She fitted the description of the suspect perfectly. We questioned her friends, her neighbors. We dug back into every corner of her life for the past 10 years. The results were pretty amazing. We found that she was highly respected by everyone she knew. She was active in a dozen civic and church organizations. Her reputation was spotless. There was only one hitch. Mrs. Lambert's hobby was charities. By checking back, we found that during the past 10 years, she donated an average of $3,000 annually to various charitable organizations. Her husband's total annual income was $7,000. From her bank, we obtained specimens of Inez Lambert's handwriting. It matched almost perfectly with every signature in the grandma file. Monday, October 7th, Frank and I called on Mrs. Lambert. She asked us back to the kitchen. You know, Mary Walker was telling me about you. 
<laughs> she told me about missing those things from her purse at the meeting. Is that what you want to inquire about? Well, yes, ma'am. We want to ask you some other questions besides that. <laughs> well, you've sort of caught me at a bad time. I was just getting ready to put some baking in the oven for dinner tonight. Would you mind very much if we talked while I worked? I've got to get this done. No, not at all, ma'am. You go right ahead. Oh, there goes that cream sauce boiling over again. <laughs> Officers, just take chairs there, would you please? I'll be right with you in just a minute. Oh, thank you, ma'am. You know, this cream sauce is so temperamental, I can't take my eye off of it for a minute. Yes, ma'am. Either of you officers like a nice cup of hot cocoa? It's kind of chilly out today. Well, no, ma'am. We only have a few questions for you. It won't take very long. I see. Well, I'll just get my eggs beaten up here then. Uh, the crowd here, would you mind holding that? Sure. For me? It's just yeah. half a minute. But, but anyway, that's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> eggs beaten, you know, and we make meringue. You can't make meringue very well without plenty of eggs. Yes, ma'am. What's this going to be? Oh, this is going to be a pinch pie. Did you ever hear of a pinch pie? Uh-huh. It's a, oh, you know, it's a sort of a meringue tart. Uh -huh. I'll just beat these up nice and fluffy. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, I'll take it, please. Sergeant, would you mind handing me that cup of sugar right back up here or some sugar, and I'll put it right in the yes, cup here. Yes, ma'am, cup here. This is a whole pack. No, I'll need the one. It's all right. Thank you very much. Yes, just pour a little. That's not thanks very yes, much. Make it nice. There we are. Beaky's all up nice and fluffy. Now, what was it you wanted to know? Well, Mrs. Walker had a charge account plate stolen that night at the Boosters Club meeting. Someone's been using it to cash bad checks in her name. Is that so? Well, Barry didn't tell me that. The same person who's using that charge of plate has been cashing bad checks all over the city. Been doing it for some time now. Oh, my. <laughs> Well, I don't think I can help you, Sergeant. I went to that meeting with Mary. She says somebody must have been in her purse, but I didn't see them. Do you have that charge account plate, Mrs. Lambert? <laughs> me? Oh, no. I have my own. Now, let me see. Teaspoonful of vanilla, teaspoonful of vinegar, teaspoonful of water, combined in a small pitcher or cup. We've got good reason to believe you have that charge account plate, ma'am. Did you take it from Mrs. Walker? That's a silly thing for you to say, officer. I told you I have my own charge of plate. I never borrow anyone else's. No reason to. Add a few drops of combined liquids and beat constantly. Did you cash two checks last week and sign them with Mrs. Walker's name? Why, of course not. Why should I do such a thing? Mary Walker's one of my best friends. I would do that to her even as a joke. Our handwriting man compared the signatures on those two checks, Mrs. Lambert. Both of them match your handwriting. Well, then your handwriting man certainly made a mistake. Oh, uh, there's a large Pyrex dish in that cupboard right there. Would you mind getting it for me? I'll get it. Oh, on the top shelf, way up. That's right. Oh, on the left. No, not those. A big one. See that one? That's right. That's Pyrex. Don't, don't drop those on your head. Oh, my last dishes. I don't want you to break them. That's fine. That's it. Careful. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you deny you wrote those two forged checks last week? You deny you've written and cashed about 1,500 worthless checks in the last nine years? Why, of course I deny it. You sure you haven't made a mistake? We're sure, ma'am. Sorry, you'll have to come downtown with us for questioning. What's that? Oh, my cream sauce is boiling over again, Sergeant. Well, I can't leave the house now, right in the middle of getting dinner ready. My husband would be furious. If you want to talk, couldn't we do it later on? Sorry, afraid not. But you certainly can't accuse me of doing anything wrong. Folks at church will vouch for me. We've got just as many people who say you cheated them. The same people who cashed those checks for you. Quite a few of them, ma'am. Nine years worth. But that's silly. Nine years and cashing checks. I'm sure you must mean somebody else, Sergeant. Well, I've got to get this platter greased now. Let me see. Heat meringue upon lightly greased platter. Yes, that's right. We don't mean anyone else, ma'am. You'll have to come along with us, Mrs. Lambert. But you can't prove a thing. You can't prove anything about me. We've got a record downtown on every single check you passed since you started. We've got specimens of your handwriting and people to identify you. We know what your income is. We know how much you've given to charities. My donations to charity are my business. You've no right to upset me like this. How many average families give half their income to charity? Can you answer that for us, Mrs. Lambert? But that's my business. It's none of yours. I certainly have a right to give what I please. The money's got to come from someplace, ma'am. Is that what the checks were for? All right, we're going to lay it out for you, ma'am. We have all the evidence against you that we need. Witnesses, too. We don't know why you've been cashing these checks, but we do know that you have been. Now, I think it'll work out better for everybody concerned if you tell us the truth. I do hope I put enough vanilla in that. Would you like to tell us about it?
I never thought about anyone finding out, I guess. I guess I should have expected it, shouldn't I? Yes, ma'am. It'll be terrible, I know. He'll never understand. Who's that? Albert, my husband. He'll never understand. Would either of you like a cup of coffee? No, thank you, ma'am. The money wasn't for me, you know. Not one dollar of it. I can prove that for you. Yes, ma'am. It was all for charity. There were so many of them. Orphanages and old people's homes and the Christmas poor fund. And then the overseas relief charities. Well, they all needed money. Somebody has to take care of them. Your husband didn't know anything about this for ten years, ma'am. <laughs> Nothing at all. They were my charities. I had to have money for them. I took the money from people who had it and gave it to those who didn't. What do you think, Sergeant? What's that? Was I wrong? Do you think the good Lord will say I was wrong? Well, I wouldn't know, ma'am. I only wanted to help the poor. He did. He came to help the poor. Well, there's a big difference, ma'am. Yes? He didn't use a checkbook. December 17th, trial was held in Department 81, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect entered a plea of guilty to two counts of forgery, and the remaining charges were set off the calendar. She received the sentence as prescribed by law. Forgery is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than one, nor more than 14 years. to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Four million people. There's something for everybody. Houses to live in, places to work, places to relax, churches to pray. Most of them enjoy life and they try to hold on to it. A few of them have lost their grip. In my job, I get to know them all. I'm a cop. It was Monday, August 12th. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Stein. My name's Friday. We'd gotten a call that a seven-week-old baby had been abandoned in a bus terminal. There was no sign of the mother, no lead to her whereabouts. We had to find her. glad you're here. I've been waiting around the steeple for hours. I don't know what to do. That's a good baby. Why don't you go to sleep? Come on. Close your eyes and go to sleep. Oh, thing, it's a shame. Yes, ma'am. The report we got didn't go into detail. Some woman left the baby with you, is that it? Yes, as soon as we got off the bus this morning. She said she'd only be gone a few minutes. It's been hours. I don't know what to do. Did you know the woman, Ms. Lewis? Her name's Dorothy Miller. She's from Arizona. Tucson. We got off the bus and she asked me if I'd hold her baby while she went to get her luggage. She said she'd meet me right there by the information desk. I've been waiting ever since. She hasn't come back. I don't know what to think. How well did you know this Dorothy Miller, ma'am? Well, not too well, but she seemed like such a nice girl, friendly, very sociable. We sat together all the way in. Mm-hmm. 
You got on the bus with her at Tucson, is that it? Oh, no. I'm from Cincinnati. I got on a bus there and then went down to Dallas. I had a visit with an aunt of mine down there. Oh, I see. I uh, got another bus in Dallas to come out here. Went along the southern route. Very nice. The same bus I came in on this morning. I'm out here to meet my husband, Army man. He's coming in on a transport from overseas. He's coming in tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Now, you say this Dorothy Miller boarded the bus at Tucson with a baby. She rode all the way into Los Angeles with you, is that right? Yes, right into the seapole. She sat in the seat next to mine. We struck up a conversation. Got to be quite good friends. Such a cute baby, I just can't imagine. Now, how about her description, Ms. Lewis? Anything unusual there? No, I wouldn't say so. A small girl, five foot three or four, I'd say, 110 or 15 pounds. Red hair, shoulder length, dark eyes, nice complexion, very pretty eyes. About how old would you say? Twenty. That's what she told me anyway. She said she had a birthday in May. I remember we talked about that. She was born under the same sign I was, Taurus the Bull. Mm -hmm. Then all the talk she had with the Miller girl, she never gave you any reason to think that anything was wrong with her. She didn't seem to be despondent, depressed about it. Perfectly normal girl, as far as I could tell. I just can't get over it. I can't imagine her doing anything like this. You checked around the depot, did you? You had her page? I talked to everyone in the place. The porters, ticket clerks, information desk. Traveler's aid. Not one of them could help. I tried everybody. Babe, it's all right. We'll find your mother. We'll find you. It's so wonderful. It's just adorable. It's a little boy. She said his name's Stephen. That's right. Her own baby. So small and helpless. How could she go off and leave him? Well, I guess she had a reason. It must have been important. Seven-week-old baby? Your own? What's more important than that? Before we left the bus depot, Frank contacted the clerk at the depot information desk and left our card with him. If anyone came in to make inquiries about the abandoned child, he was to advise them to get in touch with us. 11.48 a.m. The woman the baby had been left with, Mrs. Marjorie Lewis, agreed to return to the office and give us a complete report on everything she knew about the case. As soon as we got back, we briefed Captain Stein on what had happened and he assigned policewoman Betty Stone to come in and help out with the baby. Cursory examination seemed to indicate there was nothing abnormal about the baby. No apparent deformities. We checked the blanket and the baby's clothing, but we found no identifying marks of any use to us. Policewoman Stone made the baby comfortable for the time being, and then she began to check through the contents of the small valise which the baby's mother had left with Mrs. Lewis. It contained the usual assortment. Baby oil, powder, dextrose, a few cans of milk, a couple of blankets, and a supply of diapers. Frank and I continued to interview Mrs. Lewis. Is this the Miller woman's first baby? Do you know or did she happen to mention? Yes, it's her first. That's what she told me anyway. Did you talk about the baby's health at all? Was there any trouble there? Well, she did say she had some trouble with the formula at first. It didn't seem to suit the baby. It wasn't anything serious, though. Matter of fact, that does worry me a little bit, Sergeant. What's that? The baby's formula. Mrs. Miller did say it had to be fixed a special way. Some special medicine she put in it, too. Are you sure the baby's going to get good care? Yes, ma'am. No need to worry. He'll be moved to the general hospital. They'll look after him. Frankly, I can't help but feel a little guilty about all this. What do you mean, Mrs. Lewis? I mean, turning the baby over to you. It'll probably be put in some kind of an orphan's home. I can't help but think that maybe the Miller girl picked me out. She had to give the baby away and she wanted me to have him. Then I turn around and hand him over to the police. It does make me feel a little guilty. She probably expected more of me. There's no need to feel like that, ma'am. It's not your responsibility. I suppose not, but I just can't help feeling that way, running out on a little baby like that, leaving him alone. You wouldn't be in a position to take care of him anyway, would you? No, I suppose not. I'd have to talk to my husband first. He'll be in tomorrow from overseas. He'll be back to the same old life again, living in hotels. No, I guess it wouldn't work even if they'd let me adopt him. It gets me down sometimes. I've always liked children. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Lewis. We appreciate your cooperation and everything you've done here. Not at all, Sergeant. I only wish I could be more help. Would you mind telling us where you'll be stopping in town, ma'am? It's possible we might want to contact you again. Well, I don't have any reservations. I was thinking of staying at a hotel close to downtown. Well, there's a big convention going on in town now, Ms. Lewis. Most of the places are pretty crowded. We'd be glad to help you find hotel space if you like. Oh, well, that's certainly very nice of you. Sergeant Friday, could I see you in the place? Yeah, sure. Excuse me. Yeah, Betty. Well, for a policewoman, I'm not bad at checking diapers. What do you mean? Right here, the valise the mother left with Mrs. Lewis. Did you come up with anything? I didn't think so at first. I went over the valise, everything inside, nothing. Then I started putting the things back in the bag. I found this in a stack of diapers right there. Paid receipt for a hospital bill, maternity ward. Oh, Santa Maria Hospital, Tucson, Arizona. 
There's the patient's name right there at the top. Mm -hmm. Dorothy Miller. Twelve thirty p.m. A local broadcast and an APB were gotten out on Dorothy Miller. Then we sent a communication to the Tucson Police Department laying out the story for them and asking them to check with the Santa Maria Hospital there for a possible lead on the missing mother. Meantime, the baby was removed to the general hospital. We found accommodations for Mrs. Lewis in a downtown hotel. We dropped her off there and then we drove back to the bus depot on 6th Street. We tried to locate the driver of the bus on which the Miller woman and her baby had arrived that morning. We were told he was off duty and that he wouldn't report back in until 8 o'clock the following morning. We left our card along with a message for the driver asking him to contact us as soon as he returned. For the rest of the afternoon, Frank and I, along with two other men from juvenile division, checked with all the bus depot personnel, but we were unable to turn up any kind of a lead. After that, we started making the rounds of the hotels, bars, restaurants, and taxicab stands in the neighborhood. The same results, nothing. 7.55 a.m. the following morning, I reported back in for work. Good morning, Joe. Well, hi, Betty. Frank, check in yet? Yeah, he went out for a minute. He said he'd be right back. Mm -hmm. What do you know? Anything new? Communication for you from the Tucson PD. Kick back on that query you got off to them yesterday. Mm -hmm. You see this? Yeah, confirms the fact the woman had her baby in that hospital. Still not much help, though. Yeah, I see. We checked out her last known address in Tucson. She moved. No forwarding address. No line on her friends or relatives. And the day the baby was born seems to check out. Yeah, June 24th. Makes the baby just about seven weeks old. This part doesn't make much sense, though. The Miller girl's description? Yeah. Ms. Lewis said Dorothy Miller was small and dark. Long red hair, dark eyes. People at the hospital describe her as being fairly tall. Blue eyes, short brown hair, about 29 or 30 years old. Mrs. Lewis said the Miller girl just turned 20, didn't she? Yeah. Sure doesn't figure, does it? A little too much to write off as coincidence. Two Dorothy Millers having babies, same day, same hospital. I just happened to think. This description of the Miller girl. Uh-huh. Fairly tall, short brown hair. Ms. Lewis says short brown hair, hasn't she? Hi, Joe. Morning, Frank. You know that bus driver we wanted to talk to? The one that drove the bus to Dorothy Miller and the baby came in on yesterday? Yeah. Well, he came up to see us. He's in the next room. I've been talking to him. Mm -hmm. You saw this answer from Tucson? Yeah. I think we got the tie-in. How's that? That description Mrs. Lewis gave us to Dorothy Miller. The driver doesn't remember anyone like that on his bus. He remembered Mrs. Lewis, though. She didn't get on the bus at Dallas. She didn't sit next to a young girl with a baby, either. Driver says he's sure of it. Well, then what's the pitch? Mrs. Lewis got on the bus at Tucson. She had a baby in her arms. a.m. Frank Smith and I continued to interview the bus driver, the same man who had been driving the bus on which Mrs. Lewis and the abandoned baby and his mother supposedly had arrived in Los Angeles the day before. The more we talked to the driver, the more he convinced us that the story we'd gotten from Mrs. Marjorie Lewis was a long way from the truth. He repeated that he was absolutely sure that Mrs. Lewis did not get on the bus at Dallas, that she boarded the bus at Tucson, and at the time she got on, she was holding a baby in her arms. He was just as positive that Mrs. Lewis held the baby in her arms all the way into Los Angeles and that she did not sit next to a young red-haired girl, but an elderly woman. He also told us that none of his passengers on that particular trip fitted the description of Dorothy Miller as given us by Mrs. Lewis. 8.50 a.m. Before the bus driver left, we got his address and a phone number where we could get in touch with him if necessary. 9.05 a.m. Frank and I got in the car, drove to the downtown hotel where Mrs. Lewis was staying. She told us that her husband, Army Captain Walter Lewis, had arrived in from overseas earlier that morning and checked in at the hotel that he was downstairs in the hotel barber shop. That's quite a parade they're having down there. Yes, ma'am. How's the baby? Are they taking care of him? Is he all right? Yes, ma'am. We checked with the hospital. He's doing fine. All right. And the Miller girl, Dorothy Miller, did you find out anything? We haven't been able to locate her. No trace of her at all. That's why we're here, Mrs. Lewis. There are a few things we'd like to have you straighten out for us. Well, I'll be glad to do anything I can to help. I think I already told you everything I know about the girl. We'll be honest with you, Ms. Lewis. We don't think you're telling us the truth. What? I don't understand. We talked to the man who was driving the bus you came in on yesterday. The same bus you say Dorothy Miller and her baby were on. Yes, that's right. Well, the bus driver couldn't remember the Miller girl. Told us none of his passengers even came close to her description. Well, there were quite a few people on the bus. I guess you can't blame him for not remembering it. He remembered you, Mrs. Lewis. You were sitting there at the front of the bus. He doesn't remember anyone with a baby sitting next to you, though. I guess he made a mistake. He can't remember everything. He said you were holding the baby. I don't understand this. 
What is it you're trying to find out? When we talked to you yesterday, you told us that you got on the bus at Dallas. Isn't that right? Yes. What would that have to do with it? Well, the bus driver says you got on in Tucson. He seemed to remember it pretty well. Says when he got on the bus, you were holding a baby in your arm. Oh, that's silly. He's wrong. He must have me confused with somebody else. I don't see how, ma'am. He says you were the only woman on the bus for the baby. What's the point of this, Sergeant? I don't understand any of this. Well, now, frankly, Ms. Lewis, neither do we. I don't know why you're lying to us about this, but apparently you are. You're wrong. I'm not lying. It happened just the way I told you. The girl gave me the baby to hold, and then she disappeared. There's no reason for me to lie about that. We found a receipt for a hospital bill in that valise with the baby's things in it. The receipt was made out to Dorothy Miller. Well, that proves it, doesn't it? She was on the bus with me, and her baby was with her. Check was made with the hospital of Tucson. They remembered the name, Dorothy Miller. She gave birth to a baby boy about seven weeks ago. She wasn't the same girl you described to us. The description wasn't even close. Then it must be a mistake. I guess somebody made a mistake. I can't understand any of this. They sent us back a description of the Dorothy Miller who stayed at the hospital. Fairly tall woman, short brown hair, about 29 or 30. Yes? The description fits you, Mrs. Lewis. Fits almost perfectly. It's wrong. It has to be wrong. The whole thing's a mistake. No, I don't think so, ma'am. Why don't you tell me? What do you think? Tell me, please. Well, there is no Dorothy Miller. There never was. There's no such person. That's what you really think. I invented it. I made it all up. Did you? The baby. What about him? If there's no Dorothy Miller, what about the baby? I don't know. Thank you, I'm all right. I suppose I knew it would happen sometime. I tried not to think about it. Yeah? I knew you'd found out. That's why you asked if my husband was with me, isn't it? You didn't want to embarrass me. We wanted to give you a chance to tell your side of the story. We thought maybe you wanted to keep it from your husband. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll tell him. He'll be back in a few minutes. He can do anything he wants, and I won't blame him. He'll pack his bag and walk out and leave, and I won't blame him. Nobody will blame him. You want to tell us about it? I think you know. It's my baby. My own baby and I couldn't keep him. There wasn't anything else to do. Nothing. My own baby. You made up the whole story about the girl, Dorothy Miller, for leaving the baby with you. Mrs. Lewis? Well, now, you must have had a reason for it, Mrs. Lewis, giving your baby away. You want to tell us about it? Won't make any difference. Done. It's all done. It's my husband I'm thinking about. Walter. I'm going to have to hurt him, and I don't want to hurt him. I don't know how I'm going to tell him. Tell him what, ma'am? I love him, Sergeant. I tried to explain I didn't want to be alone. Having him away all the time, I knew there was going to be trouble. I knew it. I didn't want to be alone, and he didn't understand. He only said I was fooling. Yes, ma'am. He left for overseas in October, almost two years ago. I went down to Wilmington. I saw him leave on the boat. I stood there and watched him go. I wasn't going to see him. Twenty-four months, I wouldn't see him. No children, no family, just a two-room apartment. If he only believed me. If he only would have taken me with him. Yes, ma'am. I, I took it for a year. A whole year. A two-room apartment, being alone. I wrote to Walter twice a week. It didn't do any good. He didn't want me with him a whole year. It got too much. You mean you could have joined him overseas? He didn't want you to. I 
don't know why. I kept writing to him, and he kept putting me off a whole year. Got too much of two-room apartment alone. You can't spend your life that way. I started going out. Having dates. I had to get out. I started going to parties. Different people. I guess I drank too much. I didn't want to be alone. I guess I always drank too much. There was one party. I don't even remember who I went with. I guess I was drinking. I don't know. And I left. I don't even remember who I was with. It didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to happen like this. Are you all right, Mrs. Lewis? Is there something we can get for you? No, I'm all right. I didn't know what to do when I found out. I saw the doctor. He didn't understand it either. I mean, the way I felt. He said the baby would be born in June. I cried. He didn't understand. Yes, ma'am. When the time came, I went to Tucson, Arizona. He had my baby. At least I wasn't alone. I used a different name at the hospital. Dorothy Miller. Maybe it wasn't Walter's baby. But it was mine. It was mine. But at first it wouldn't make any difference. figured on giving up the baby, giving him away, is that it? I can't tell you how many times I worked it out in my mind. Day after day, I almost went crazy with it. Walter, the baby, which was it? I finally decided, Walter. Don't you think it's fair? Don't you? What's well, your decision, ma'am? It's going to have to be up to you. I don't know how to tell him. Won't you help me, please? Help me tell Walter. All right, if you like. Such a terrible thing. When you make a choice. When you have to hurt someone. To have to choose between the two of them. One of them has to be hurt. My husband, you're my baby. Which one? Ten thirty eight AM. At Mrs. Lewis's request, Frank and I stayed on at the hotel room until her husband, Army Captain Walter Lewis, returned. He was a tall man in his late thirties, dark eyes, tan complexion. Mrs. Lewis was waiting in the adjoining room. It wasn't easy, but as best we could, Frank and I briefed the husband on what had happened. His first reaction was fairly normal. He took it pretty hard. We kept on talking to him. After a while, he calmed down. We laid out the whole story for him again. Are you sure it was my wife? Yes, sir. the baby over the police, is that it? She gave the baby up? Yes, sir. She figured it was the only thing she could do. Kind of hard to figure, isn't it? What's the answer? What am I supposed to do? Well, I know it's none of our business, Captain, but I think you might try looking at it from your wife's point of view. What do you mean? Well, it's pretty obvious she's still in love with you. I think she's shown you that. Yeah. Well, she was in a jam. It was a big choice for her to make. She knew she was wrong. She made a mistake. She was ready to pay for it. It was either you or the baby. She knew that. She decided to give up the baby. Where's Marge now? My wife. In the next room. 
I want to see her. Well, maybe if you'd wait just a little while. No, it's all right. I just want to tell her something. Marge? Marge, come out here. I want to talk to you. Can I say, Walter? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There isn't anything else I can say. You don't have to say anything, Marge. You can do what you want. I won't blame you. You've got a right to do anything. I just want to tell you, Walter. I love you, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't blame you. Anything you do, I won't blame you. It's going to be all right. Nothing to cry about here. Everything will be all right. Walter. Take it easy, dear. It was a mistake. I made my share of... It'll all work out. Officer? Yes, sir? I'd like to ask a favor. We got a car downstairs? Yes, sir, we do. I wonder if you'd mind dropping us by the hospital. I'd like to see my son. August 15th, a meeting was held in the district attorney's office, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that meeting. In the interests of justice, it was decided that no criminal complaint be filed against the suspect. to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. The people like things big, and that's the way they build them. Super highways, big parks, supermarkets, and big buildings. Most of the people do big things. Few of them are pretty small. They're my business. I'm a cop. It was Tuesday, January 18th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. My name's Friday. We found a 25-year-old unidentified man hiding in a freight car. In his arms, he held the body of a dead woman. The victim's identity was unknown. The suspect refused to tell us anything. We had to start at the beginning. I checked with the R&I division to see if we could find a record on the man. Gordon, better put it back in your wallet. Come on, Gordon. Put it back. 
that in your wallet. Now look, son, I don't think you're helping yourself much by keeping quiet. There's a lot of explaining to be done here. I'm afraid you're the only one who can do it. Gordon? All right, son, it's just a matter of time. You're going to have to tell somebody sooner or later. Why won't you tell us now? What do you say? Look, son, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't get the reasoning behind all this. We know there's nothing wrong with you. We know you can talk, all right. You talked to the officers in the radio car who brought you in. You know as well as I do you're going to have to explain what's happened. You're going to have to explain that dead body. How do you want to get it over with? Look, Gordon, if you didn't kill the woman, you haven't anything to worry about. And if you did, we're going to find out anyway. Who was the woman, Gordon? Will you tell me that much? What's her name? Did you know her very long? Gordon? What was she to you? Do you want to tell me that? She's a fairly middle-aged woman in her early 50s, I'd say. Is that about right? Was she mother, Gordon? Older sister, maybe. Any relation at all? What's the matter, son? You feeling sick? No? How about a cigarette? Bother you if I smoke? I hope you haven't got the idea that we're trying to trick you in anything, Gordon, here. We've got a dead woman on our hands. We've got to find out why she's dead. Now, what do you say? There's no use looking at the clock, son. We're stuck here till we find out about that woman. That goes for both of us. Homicide Friday. Oh, yeah, Jack. No, no, not right now. Ought to be back in about a half an hour. Right. Yeah, I'll tell him to call you. Right, bye. Okay, here's all we know about it. One of our radio cars, 1A4, answered a call from the night watchman down in the freight yards. He told the officers he'd spotted a man wandering around down near the far end of the train yards near the west gate. The watchman only saw him at a distance, but he said he could make out the man had a woman with him. She must have been either sick or she had too much to drink because the man appeared to be dragging her along with him. Now, the two of them disappeared behind a line of boxcars on the siding. When the watchman went to look for the two people, he couldn't find them. He called the radio car, and when the officers got there, they started searching. They finally found you hiding back in the corner of an empty boxcar. You were holding the dead woman in your arms. There wasn't anything the officers could see that might have caused the woman's death. There were no marks on the body, nothing visible anyway. And when they tried to question you, all you'd tell them was your name and that you didn't want to live. You didn't care what happened to you. Now, that's about the size of it, Gordon. Did I leave anything out? Gordon? Yeah, maybe there is something else. From what we could gather, the dead woman had been doing some drinking before she died. Matter of fact, looked like she was a pretty heavy drinker. Another thing, we know you and the woman got into the train yard down by the west gate. We know that you dragged her body across the freight yards to that boxcar they found you hiding in. The marks from her shoes lead from the sidewalk through the dirt directly to the door of that boxcar. We could see where you dragged your body from the door back to the corner of the car. Now, that's the whole story so far, Gordon. You want to fill in the rest? Who is the dead woman? All right. How about these items we found in your pocket, Gordon? This address book here. Is this the woman's name in here? This handkerchief with a lipstick on it. Were you out with another girl tonight? Were you, son? If you were, it might help us if you tell us who she is. You hear me, son? How about this lady's ring you had in your pocket? name Elizabeth engraved on the inside. Does that tie in at all? Come on, Gordon. Who's it belong to? Homicide, Friday. Oh, yeah, Frank. You got an ident on her? Mm-hmm. H-O-double-F-M-A-N? Yeah. Two N's. Yeah, I got it. You're going right out there now, huh? Okay. Take her down with you, huh? Right? Yeah, let me hear from her. What? No, no, not yet. All right, yeah, fine. That was my partner, Gordon. The officer was in here with you. They took the dead woman's fingerprints. They got her identified, son. Elizabeth Hoffman, age 52 years, music teacher. Last known address, 5473 Sixth Avenue. They're on their way out there now to check it out. Now relax.
box, Gordon. That window doesn't lead anywhere. All right, you want to take another look at this ring? We've got a fair idea that it means something, Gordon. They examined the dead woman's hands. They know she was wearing a ring recently. Her name's Elizabeth Hoffman. Name Elizabeth, engraved on the inside of this ring. Now look, we're going to get the answer sooner or later. How about it? What were you doing with this ring in your pocket? Now let me tell you, young fella. I don't know what's bothering you, but whatever it is, we're going to find it out and get it through your head. You're in a bad spot. If you're not interested in helping yourself, then neither am I. Now the monkey's on your back. You're going to have to help scratch it off. Now get with it. What's it all about? All right, let's have your driver's license. Come on, get it out. Gordon John Miller, 2055 Malcolm Avenue. Hello, information. Do you have a phone listing for 2055 Malcolm Avenue? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm hmm. 32192. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Put the phone down. You ready to tell us? No, I won't tell you. Any way you want it, Gordon. No, you can't call. You can't. I won't let you. All you right, can't. take it easy, will you? They don't know. They can't tell you. Give me the phone. You can't. Sit down. 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 If you won't give us the answers, we'll find somebody who will. The sooner you get it through your head, you're not here on traffic ticket, the better. You're gonna stay in that chair till we get ready to book you. I'm sick of treating you like a baby. They can't tell you. They don't understand. They can't tell you. Is well, this the Miller residence? 2055 Malcolm Avenue? Yes, well, my name's Friday, ma'am. Police Department, Central Homicide. Yes, ma'am, Police Department. Who is this speaking, please? I see. Well, Miss Miller, are you related to a Gordon Miller? Your brother? No, 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 he's not hurt, ma'am. Nothing's wrong with him. Ma'am? Yes, he's here. We're holding him. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to come down here to the city hall. Yes, ma'am, it's important. We'd like to talk to you. Now, as soon as possible. Yeah. Well, you can get in through the Main Street entrance. No, the Main Street, M-A-I-N. On the main floor, yes. Ask for Friday. Sergeant Friday, yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Bye. It's your sister Lillian. She's on her way down, Gordon. It's not going to help. She doesn't know. None of them know. Who's them? You mean your family? You shouldn't have called them. They don't know about it. They can't tell you. Why did you have to call? You know why, Gordon. We gave you plenty of chance to tell us yourself. The answers had to come from somewhere. <laughs> Come on, sit down now. Be quiet. Be quiet. Hey, I got a 390 in here with a knife. What's the story? Yeah, she was chasing some old guy down Fifth Street with this. Where do you live, lady? What's your name? What's your name? You've been drinking. Pretty tough to be out in weather like this, aren't you? What's your address, lady? Oh, you'll never get out of here to tell us. All right, come on. I'm not going to say anything. Well, we got all day, lady. What do you want me to say? What do you want? It's pretty simple, Gordon. Just tell us what happened tonight. She's dead, isn't she? Elizabeth? Yes, that's right. There's nothing else to say. I killed her. Why did you kill her, son? I'm not sure. Really, I'm not. I think I felt sorry for her. I killed her, though. I know that much. You murdered a woman, but you don't know why. Yes. I keep trying to remember. I can't. It doesn't seem real. No marks on the body, Gordon. None we could see anyway. How'd you kill her? I killed her. That's enough, isn't it? I murdered her. Please don't talk anymore. I'm sorry, son. That's not even half the story. You admit you killed the woman. You won't tell us why. You won't tell us how. They wouldn't let her alone. They kept hounding her. Oh, Elizabeth. <laughs> now, come on, son. Snap out of it. That's not going to help any. Come on. Yeah. How long have you known this Elizabeth Hoffman? How well do you know her, son? I've known her for ten years. She was my music teacher. Piano. Brilliant woman. Elizabeth was a real artist. And you've been taking piano lessons from her for ten years? Yes, sir. I started with her when I was fifteen. I was twenty-five last month. I couldn't have had a more brilliant teacher. She was gifted. 
Elizabeth was a prodigy when she was six years old, gave concerts all over Europe. That's your profession now, Gordon, concert pianist? Not exactly. I've had a few recitals. I wasn't ready. Elizabeth believed in me, though. I always used to say I had a great future. She drank quite a bit, didn't she, Gordon? Yeah, she drank. The reason for it, though. The reason for everything. It's that way with a lot of brilliant people. They drink once in a while. Well, she drank more than that, son. She had a reason for it. Who are you to sit in judgment on her? Elizabeth was a brilliant artist, a great woman. Great. One of the finest musicians in the country. A great woman. She was a drunk, a bad drunk. Now, let's face it, son. You know it as well as we do. You're a liar. She wasn't a rotten liar. Six drunk arrests in 14 months. That's what her card reads in the record bureau. Those are the only times we know of. How many can you add to it? She drank. She felt it was the only way out for her. There wasn't any other way. Now, you're talking in circles, Gordon. Now, get it straightened out, will you? You want to know why Elizabeth drank? Go and ask my family. They'll tell you. They'll tell you a lot of things if you want to believe it. What's the matter? Don't you get along well with them? I just want them to leave me alone, that's all. Just let me alone. She must have been a good friend. I knew you wouldn't understand. I was in love with Elizabeth. She was in love with me. We were going to get married. You're 25 years old, Gordon. Is that right? Yes. Elizabeth Hoffman was 52. That's what our records show. What about it? 27 years difference. It's a little unusual, wouldn't you say? What of it? Everything that's great is unusual. It's what makes it great. I loved her. Time didn't make any difference. A few years, what of it? I loved her more than any woman in the world. She meant everything. I didn't care if she drank. I didn't care if she was old. You don't stop being beautiful just because you grow old. Elizabeth was beautiful. The drinking didn't help her much. I don't care about that. I still said she loved me and I loved her. Believe me, please, I loved her. Yes, son, I believe you. Let me ask you this. Yes? All right, you say you respected her. She was talented. You were grateful to her. She was generous. She made sacrifices for you, did everything for you she could. She loved you and you loved her and you were going to marry her. Yes. This fall, on the way to South America. Going to be married, what we always wanted. Elizabeth. We've been so happy. Why did you kill her? Joe. Yeah, Frank. See you in a minute. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Something I think you ought to know. Yeah. John and I checked the boarding house. The Hoffman woman was staying at. Checked her rooms. Clean. Everything in order. Mm-hmm. Miss Miller had the room next to her, so we shook his place down, too. Anything? Well, his bags were packed. Looked like he was ready to leave. Something else. Yeah. The kitchen sink probably with poison. <laughs> January 18th, 11.55 p.m. My partner Frank Smith and I continued questioning the murder suspect, 25-year-old Gordon Miller. While he freely admitted to the murder of his music teacher and fiance, 52-year-old Elizabeth Hoffman, we still were unable to get him to give us a good reason for the murder. 12.20 a.m. The interrogation went on. Remember packing your suitcases before you left the boarding house? Packing? Yes, I think I do. Elizabeth and I talked about going away for a few days, someplace out of town. I think we were going to go tomorrow. They checked both your rooms, Gordon, yours and Elizabeth Hoffman's. They found your bags packed, but there was nothing about her room that indicated that she was going away. Everything was in order. Can you explain that for us? No, I don't know. Maybe she didn't have time. Hadn't gotten around to it. I guess you found the poison, too. Yeah, that's right. I got it two days ago. We thought about it. We even wrote a letter explaining why we'd do it. Yeah. We didn't have the courage, though, neither one of us. We talked about it, decided to forget it. No, I've told you everything. There isn't anything else to say. Friday. Yeah. I don't want to see her. I don't want to see her. Please, keep her out. Keep her away. Go ahead. You the boy's sister? Yes, that's right. I'm Lillian Miller. You Sergeant Friday? That's right. You step over here. Thanks, Lillian. That's my partner, Frank Smith. Miss Miller. Thank you. How are you, Gordon? It's been such a long time. How have you been? Chair, Miss Miller. Oh, thank you. What is it, Gordon? What's the trouble about? Oh, honey, what is it? Won't you even look at me? Get out of here. Let me alone. Get out. Please, Gordon, don't. I'm here to help you, honey. They called midnight. They said you're in trouble. Now, what is it? Let me help you, please. You can't help. She's dead. Now, will you go home? Elizabeth's dead. I killed her. Oh, merciful God, no. Will you take her out, Sergeant? Tell her to go. You don't know what you're saying, honey. Oh, he's not in his right mind, Sergeant. I know he's not. 
Please, Gordon, you have to let us help you. I called Dad just before I left. He's on his way here now. We'll get a lawyer. Don't worry, honey. It'll be all right. Everything will be all right. She's dead. Can you bring her back? Gordon, you couldn't have killed her. You couldn't have. You tramp. No good tramp. Gordon, please. What are you crying for? What right have you got to cry? You have to love somebody to cry for him. You hated Elizabeth. You didn't even know her, but you hated her. You and Dad, both of you. You made a hell out of her life. You made one of mine. Hounding her, torturing her. Why couldn't you let her alone? Why couldn't you let us alone? We only did it for you, Gordon. We thought it was best for you. You fool, you fool. How could you know what's best for me? You of all people. You and your two husbands, your boyfriends, the big life. I know about you, Lillian. I know about you. Say anything you want, Gordon. I don't care. But let me help you, please. Gordon, it doesn't count what I am. Just let me My help My name's you. Miller. Who's in charge here? What do you want to see? I got it, Lopez. I don't want him in here. I, I don't know him. He's not my father. All right, take it easy, Gordon. Gordon, please try and understand. We only want to help you. I'm Henry Miller. Who's in charge here? My name's Friday, Mr. Miller. This is my partner, Frank Smith. What's this thing all about? Why have you got Gordon here? What's the meaning of this? Sir? Those handcuffs on my son. Gordon, who did it? Who put him on you? I did it. It was the only way we could settle him down. You can quite a bit of authority in your hands, aren't you? Get him off him right now. No reason to handcuff him. No, I'm sorry. It can't be done. I said take him off. I have a little influence in this town. I'll see to it. The police commission hears about this. What's my son doing here anyway? It's the Hoffman woman dead. Elizabeth Hoffman. What about her? She's dead. Gordon says he killed her. Dad, we've got to do something. Don't tell him anything, Gordon. Don't say a thing. I'll get a lawyer for you right away. I know what your rights are. Don't tell him anything. Did you know Elizabeth Hoffman, Mr. Miller? I knew her slightly. Can't see what this fuss is all about anyway. Woman wasn't any good to begin with. No good at all. Kept trying to get her hooks into Gordon. I tried to break it up half a dozen times. Imagine 50-year-old woman running around with a kid like Gordon. Bum, that's all. Drunken bum. No good at all. You liar. You loud, ignorant liar. You ought to be glad I'm handcuffed at this chair. I never thought of hitting you before. I'd like to do it now. If there's only one thing I want to tell you, then get out. What's the matter with you? What are you talking about? Don't you know the position you've gotten me in? I know this much. I hate you. I hate every bit of you. You go ahead and call me your son. There's nothing I can do about that. I'll never call you my father. Never in my life. Now get out. Please, Gordon, don't say those things. Try and understand. Get him out of here. Get him out of my sight. Please, Dad, he's not well. Try and understand. I hate you. I hope you never forget it. I hate you. Dad. I'll see you at home, Lillian. It's the maid's night out. Lock the door for you. Go to bed. Please, Dad, we've got to help. Don't leave, Dad. Oh, dear God, dear God. Sergeant. Yeah. I'm tired. All right, Gordon, just a minute. Miss Miller, I wonder if we could step into the next office for a minute. There's something I'd like to ask you. Oh, yes, all right. You'll let me see Gordon again? Yes, ma'am. This way. This Elizabeth Hoffman, Miss Miller. Did you know her at all? Yes, not very well, though. I only met her twice. Last time was about you know, three weeks ago. What was the occasion, Miss Miller? Can you remember? Well, I went to see her at her place. I wanted to talk to her about Gordon. See if I couldn't make her listen to reason. You wanted her to stop seeing your brother? I tried to talk to her. I even offered her money if she'd let Gordon alone. It wasn't any use. She'd been drinking. She wouldn't even listen saying she was going to marry Gordon. Well, what's the big attraction? Would you know, I mean, between your brother and the woman? Well, it's hard to say. Certainly wasn't a good-looking woman. Far from it. Only one way I can figure it out. I think she flattered Gordon. Well, how do you mean? There's only one thing Gordon ever really wanted. He wasn't too interested in women, things like that. All he wanted was to be a musician, a great pianist. It's all he ever wanted. The sad part about it is he'll never make it. And I think down deep he knows that. When he was a kid, Dad sent him to the finest teachers. After about six months, they all said the same thing. Yeah. He'd never make it. Oh, we could play well enough, but he certainly wasn't exceptional. He never improved. Just stayed the same. Then he started taking lessons from Elizabeth. She convinced him he had a great talent. Kept telling him she'd make a great pianist out of him. The last three years, she kept promising to take him on a tour. Europe, South America. Never happened. I think Gordon knew it could never happen. I see. Can you think of any reason at all why he'd want to kill her? Well, there isn't any reason. None at all. Gordon didn't kill her. He couldn't kill anyone. I'm sure of it. Well, I hope you're right, Miss Miller, for your brother's sake. Would you excuse me for a few minutes, please? I'm yes, sorry. Right. You wait here. I'll be right back. All right. 
All set, Joe? Yeah, in a minute. Gordon? We ready to go? I'd like to ask you one more question, son. I'd like to have you tell me the truth. Yeah? What did you have in common with Elizabeth Hoffman? She was twice as old as you are. You gave up a lot for her. She didn't have any money. She was an alcoholic. What was the big attraction, son? Why did I love Elizabeth? Is that what you mean? That's right. You tell me, Sergeant. Why do you love any woman? Why? Because you need them. You need them. You can't be alone. Nobody can be alone. I needed Elizabeth. That's why I loved her. There's only been two women in the world who understood me. One of them was Elizabeth. The other one was my mother. She died when I was 12. Now they're both dead, both of them. Only ones who understood. Yeah. My father didn't understand, he never did. All he knows is business, making money, more money. That's why he hated Elizabeth, he was jealous. She understood me. She knew what I was like. She knew all about me. When I was with Elizabeth, I was safe. I was happy close to her. There wasn't anything to be afraid of. I'd go to her just like my mother. I'd put my head on her shoulder, and she'd put her arms around me. I wasn't frightened anymore was safe. Everything was all right. Like when I was a little kid in the night, I'd call out for my mother. She was always there. She'd put her arms around me and everything was safe. I wasn't afraid. I needed her. It was the same way I needed Elizabeth. Do you understand now? Do you know why I loved her? Yeah, I think I do. Only one question left. Why did you kill her? I don't know. I really don't. Maybe I'll remember. Gordon, are you sure you killed her? She died in my arms. I must have killed her. Tomorrow, maybe. Maybe I'll remember tomorrow. Is Lillian still here, my sister? Yeah, she's waiting outside. Did you hear my father, what he said? I told her to be sure and lock the door? Yeah. Just like my father. They don't have to lock that door. It was locked 13 years ago. How do you mean? It was locked the day my mother died. On January 19th, an autopsy was performed at the county morgue, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that examination. The results of the autopsy showed that Elizabeth Hoffman had suffered from a chronic heart condition aggravated by excessive drinking. Cause of death was listed as myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle.